Well, as many of you know, my name is Jason. This is our, our second arcade <laughs> game. <laughs> so as you know, we have Martin Leakey from Wales. Library and the Flat Earth British Library, and it's just phenomenal. It's, it's, it's a lot. So, Martin and I made a discovery just bouncing ideas off each other, and that's how things work. There's a dynamic between souls when they're exchanging information, and it's almost as if there's a third person, an invisible you know, presence there that's feeding the creativity. We've made a very profound discovery. We're going to show you today is probably the very first time this information has ever come out. And it's about the Great Wall of China. 
And we are going to do the best we can to show you the evidence that the Great Wall of China is not a wall. It had a totally different function. And what we, what we found is profound. I'm, I'm going to lead the dissertation, and then I'm going to stop and allow Martin to show you all the, the basically the graphics, the pictures, everything that we have found. He's going to do the presentation with me. So that's the highlight of today is this. But Max, Max is going to come up here and speak. And the man needs no introduction. I have no idea what he's going to say. I'm a little worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is YouTube, Max. But, um, yeah, I, I have no idea what I'm going to say. That's, that's not That's when you're best, Max. You're never, you're never the lost for words. So the lights will be dimmed to what you saw when you came in when we give the presentation. We will. So other than that, you can take a seat. Watch go. I will leave. I will leave. All right. So much coffee, I get dehydrated. So, you know, I did a, many of you know, I did a very long podcast with Bro Sanchez. It was the first time I didn't have access to a whole other dynamic, a whole community. It's almost all a black community on his channel, and it went really, really well. But uh, some of the questions that I asked, asked me, I realized that I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to take our case in, into any type of cultish uh, flavor, that type of environment. But it seems that that's how it's interpreted when I go to talking about how we alter our personal reality. And uh, because I'm really big on that. Didn't even see you there, man. How you doing? How you doing? The, uh, so I'm on. I want to do a QA so we can reduce things down to its lowest common denominator. We can all be on the same page. We're already doing a fascinating historical presentation today. So I, I would like to lead off with, let's talk about the informed field. Let's talk about the dynamic between the personal and the, and the over field. What exactly is going on, this exchange of information, how we can better move in the direction in our lives that we want to move into by understanding this dynamic, because it's very real. It's, it, it's completely altered my life, and thousands of people who have emailed told me about their personal testimonies. There's an opportunity here. There are two people here. I don't know where they are right now. Raise your hands. You're doing the YouTube deal. There's one right here. Um, She's the pretty one with red hair. Okay. These are the Archaics documentary people. I wasn't referring to you. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, she's back here. So there's two other people here. I think they posted up outside, but they want to do 30 second to 60 second testimonies from anybody who just wants to say, hey man, this is what happened when I found our case, uh, good or bad, and you just want to record it. There they are right here. Yeah. Um, they're doing their own YouTube thing, and if you want to, anytime during any of the breaks or, or whatever, you can step out and they'll record just your little 30 second to 60 second testimony of what's going on. And, uh, I appreciate that. I don't really know what they're going to do with it, but, uh, but I'm cool with it. I'm all right. So let's start with a Q and A on what if there's anybody who hasn't yet really wrapped their mind around what I talk about in my We Immortals playlist. The ability. This is not law of attraction, although many people have, have associated it to. This is this is a totally different dynamic. It is when. It is when the human mind, which isn't even a part of, part of the construct, it is a part of something outside of the construct. Your emotional capacity, this, this cognition that you have, it doesn't come from the brain, it's external. It's outside the construct. It's not a part of your body, your avatar. This flesh is a part of the environment that you're in. That's what makes it so difficult to move forward. But your thoughts are yours, and they don't belong to the construct. Your emotions are evidence of a spiritual capacity that this construct can't even define. It's not even a part of the holography. So do we have any questions about, is there anything that I can answer for you that would bring you closer to understanding this whole phenomenon? How it is, okay, I'll give you my, my life as an example. I get out of prison, I have $27 in my pocket, I start a YouTube channel while I'm doing odd jobs, it ends up turning into a company, and the entire time I'm documenting, showing it on YouTube, telling you exactly how I'm gonna grow, get bigger, how I'm gonna do it, I'm standing here before you today. So in a very short period of time. And I'm, 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 I'm doing very well too. 
So what can, I, what can I do for you? What can I answer for you right now? What is it that you want in life that you think is very, very achievable, but, but you haven't closed the distance between who you are now and the coordinates of what it is you desire? <coughs> yes. Lady. Right here in the second row. Okay, so I'm, I'm on the same page with you as far as all, you know, manifesting and creating and being positive. But then I have this thing in the back of my head goes, well, we have 16 and a half more years. So what am I, you know? What? That's part of the construct. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's like, okay, I'm starting a new business. I'm really excited about it. Everything's fine in place. I'm like, okay, but I only have 16 more years. <laughs> so I, I got to get over that. Yeah, you don't stop thinking that. Because yeah. you don't know if you've got that long. And that's right. just, you know, age is just a number anyway. It's not a real thing, yeah. you know? That's and, and I know, I know you say it. You know, with these devastations, cataclysms only affect certain areas, and mm -hmm. some people aren't affected. But I'm like, well, if it, you know, I'm not affected, but everybody else is. What fun is that going to be? You know, so I, I have a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. With the, you know, projecting into the future, and it's. A, well, just deal with the now because that's all you ever got, mm -hmm. and just go on to the next now, the next now. Set your intent. Don't think of already go beyond that point. Yeah, to the next now and the next now. We just don't give it too much thought. You overthink things. Yeah. Just keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Along them lines. All right. Yeah. Well, we we're going to propose you stupid. Huh? <laughs> you know, I do agree with this sentiment. I will wrap it around something a little more understandable. You've heard me say before if you're firmly set in your mind on a certain picture, you need to do away with all elements of time because if the end is already secure in your mind and every step leading up to that end is already secure as well the problem is is you're attaching you're attaching problems and anxiety to the in between you think that there are things that you have to do to make that end result happen that's not a co-creator relationship you're 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 essentially building in your mind an imaginative construct and you may even use your physical avatar to move forward in that direction which is the most important part because your physical avatar is a part of the environment you inhabit the environment you inhabit will create a feedback loop to mirror the direction it's going but there has to be some architecture that the oversoul that the construct can read that's your imagination that's your intent what you want in life but if your physical avatar doesn't move in that direction the construct does not receive any signals whatsoever because it's going to read that avatar. It's a part. They're one and the same. There's no difference between the construct or the collective holography. Bro. Oh, <laughs> it's Mike. Huh? Tell him not to go to the bathroom. <laughs> 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 Mike, 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 Mike. I sure hope he doesn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true hot mic. I'm really sorry, Mike. I'm so confused. It's not a match. I'm so sorry. I can't help it. Sorry about that, Jason. No, this, 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 this is my public persona, but I'm telling you, we have been recording videos and set up cameras in the house. Oh, yeah. You guys on Arcade.tv are going to see the real us. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Who's that happening? Yeah. Oh. Oh, this we're waiting for this. This is too big, too much to, too much to, too many, too many moving parts. So our case TV should be 24 to 48 hours after this is over today. So, so anyway, back to your, I'll, I'll get to you, man. Back to your question. Um, there is nothing independent of you that's going to impede what you want in life. You're not gonna like hearing it. But every bit of resistance that you come across is self-created, every bit of it. And you can't attach significance to particulars in your life if you have a mental image of exactly the direction you want to go. You understand? If I'm walking through maximum security close custody cell blocks around a bunch of men who have weapons and a lot of them are racist and I'm a minority, white guys are a minority in, in, in maximum security, and I'm telling you, and I, and I, and I walk through these cell blocks, knowing that I'm absolutely immune, knowing that I am more than anything that can happen to me. Listen, 
that informed field affects everybody on that cell block and they read it. It doesn't matter what the male bravado is, it doesn't matter what, what guys' intents are. There is there is a field that you possess and it goes out and it touches everybody. Our fields are all interacting right now. This is why we tend to vibrate on the same frequencies when we come into physical contact. This is why when you come into the vicinity of someone who knows many things that you don't know, you process information better, you absorb the data better. When you're in the presence of that individual, you get those mental ahas, you get it. And then when you go home, you feel a little bit differently. You're no longer vibrating at that frequency. You Now you're having trouble processing what you so easily understood previously in that presence. So this is why I'm so repetitive on YouTube, trying to hammer it in, trying to hammer it in. Because when people watch a video presentation and they think they got it all and they're vibrating on that frequency, there's a, there's a frequency attached to every presentation and you tap into that. And then you're not watching it. Two days go by. Now you go back into a, a more base reality. You're vibrating on a totally lower frequency. You're not feeling that anymore. So you go watch another video. But it's a different one this time. But you haven't quite learned the lessons of, of the previous one. So I'm always doing these videos. Trying, if you've noticed, I have tried to wrap the same concept in different dressings and just from different angles. But it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, I in your situation, the only reason I have identified that your problem is attaching to all the particulars is because you specifically told us that the 16 years. That instantly told me that that's, a, that that's an issue for you, that you think that the future is an abstract that is so far when actually everything you ever wanted in life exists today. The only difference is coordinates. You are not in proximity to that, and it's your fault. It really is. I mean, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just saying it's entirely spiritual. The construct obeys the spirit, but the, but the spirit has to move the actor in the right direction for the construct to read the program. And then, and then the interface is complete. Co-create co relationship is done. You just step back and do something else. Because if you dwell on anything, anxiety will attach. As soon as anxiety attaches, you negate all the energy you previously put. And you, re and you write a new code. Simple as that. It's like a program. You just totally wrote, wrote a new code and omitted everything you've done previously. You got a question? Yes. Um, so, uh, kind of, I want to make a statement to what you're saying that really interesting happened to me. So, first off, I've already spoken to you about one thing I'm trying to manifest, which we can talk about later. But two and a half weeks ago, I was driving down uh, a car, and I've been working on what you've been saying about manifesting my life. That this, and I sit there and I go, it's not real. I can have a higher vibration. I don't worry about it. So, I was driving, and I got hit on my brighter side. <laughs> they hit my car door, and they slid all the way across and it was uh they had they were making a left turn and they hit me and they pushed me to the side and I, there was two witnesses and they ran to my car and they looked at me and they're like, are you okay do you need ambulance i mean this car literally hit my driver's side door and i could barely open the door and i slammed and i was like he they you know they hit my car and everything and then i was like wait a that was a whiplash it's like jason's quiet mm. you know i I was, I should have been hurt. Those two people there were like, they said, no whiplash. I said, nothing. I'm still okay. I still have no, nothing. All I had was made a little bit of a bruising on my knee and I bruised my finger. And I don't even know how that happened. And I just documented the stuff and everything. But I just want to say what you're saying is true. I mean, I, you know, I've been thinking in my head, this is not real. I can manifest, you know, keep my vibration, keep it high. And I saw that car coming, like, at the last minute. It wasn't my fault, you know. She was turning. I don't know if she was on the phone. I don't know how the heck she didn't see me. But I just started swerving. And, and the whole time, I just stay relaxed. This isn't real. And I walked out of it. I walked yeah. out of it where I should have been probably in the hospital. Well, glad you know. But nothing's wrong with me. I just <laughs> want to tell you that it came from what, wow. you know, part of what you're saying. And it just, it's just keeping my vibration high. just realizing I manifest what... Okay. I, believe me, I get it. And then everything going slow, like you're describing, turn this down. That's that hyper lucidity, lucidity that comes in when there's trauma. When, when something that 
charge you to the point where the spirit for a very temporary time overrides the avatar. It happens, it's happened to a lot of us, but it's normally an accident, a traumatic event, extreme emotion, when you're in danger. Uh, and the adrenaline is the byproduct. It's just the opposite of what biologists tell us. These, uh, these hormones are created by the brain. They are created in response to individual thoughts. So your avatar responds according to the thoughts. It's not the other way around. We are taught in biology that it's the brain that comes up with thoughts and then synthesizes hormones and releases the hormones. It's not that's how it is. Brain's function is hormone generation. And it's uh, the actual thoughts are outside. They're in the field. They have nothing to do with the actual avatar. After all this said, then I was shaking a lot. I don't know why I was shaking. Really, it's just a release of hormones. Maybe too much chemical, chemical in your blood. Yeah, in moments of trauma, you have the hyper lucidity. And uh, guys that are like, there's a there's a kickboxer in there somewhere I just talked to earlier. This is guys that get into hand combat with each other. It's the same thing that takes over. You're going to feel that pain for two or three minutes, and then after that, something comes over, and there's an override, and then you feel nothing else, and you just didn't fall through the fight. There's a shock to the system, and that shock pretty much overrides the central nervous system's ability to process pain, to process all these different things. And that hyperemissivity even slows time down because it's the central nervous system that governs our perception of time. Central nervous system governs everything about the avatar and keeps our immortal spirit jacked into this, this body suit. But it's those moments like that. When you have an accident, your death experience, something like that, it's when the spirit overrides the avatar, and that's why you feel, that's why you're so relaxed. Yes. Right when you get seriously hurt, or you're about to get seriously hurt, that extreme relaxation and that objectivity kicks in. That's the spirit doing that. Yes. That's who you really are. Yes. Um, if we get a bit more volume, you can't really hear much in the back. If you go, it's possible, please. I can hold it out. Yeah, maybe. I don't. I don't know what the. Uh, I don't know what the idea behind a clip is. Has that? Hey, have it close to your mouth if you can. How's this? Is it better? Yeah. yeah. It's better back there. Yeah. A little bit. But two. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> I got it down. Yeah. Do I need to speak into it like that? Yeah. yeah. How's that? <laughs> so who are you guys? Ah, that's Sean Hibbler and that's Johnny, that's my friend from Orange County, Hibbler Productions. <laughs> the compression of time as well so can you talk about time in the construct and so with the 16 years is that time going to mean anything as we close in on that that particular point I'm not in, sure. in history I'm not sure the compression well, when of time. you say it's like you're in an accident and you and time slows down i mean time's just a bullshit concept anyway yeah. so um, what what else can you say about that particular subject, I guess? Well, to be pragmatic, we're all subject to time. I mean, we all know there's 365 days a year, and we have to know every, every four years we've got to create a day because the system is entirely imperfect. So the time dilation experience, though, is the only two places I have read in all the material that I've gone through. The only two times that happens is trauma, you know, the avatars are going through something or, or the fear of trauma. And the other one is the alien abduction phenomenon. Those are the only two times I've ever found out. I found that people have reported these time violations. Now, I'm not telling you. I'm not on the stage telling you I believe in aliens. I'm not on the stage telling you that I believe in the alien abduction phenomenon. What I'm saying is that's what thousands of people have reported, this time violation. So, you know my take. My take, my take is, is that... We have, we have all been misled, not only by history, but also misdirection. All activities in the underground. And there's no aliens coming through that atmosphere, coming here, visiting all that. All these UFO reports, that are, these are going through bodies of water. U.S. Navy's documented on, on radar, under, they've even shattered shadow battle groups. 
listen, this, these things are underwater, they're underground, and they come up, they fly around, do whatever, and these alien abducted, these people who have been abducted, they, they've almost been MK ultra by a breakaway civilization that's for some reason harvesting DNA, putting implants in people, but this is the subject matter for really other researchers. I have followed it, but I really don't talk about it with your arcades. But the time dilation phenomenon is very real in both, in both episodes. Alien abduction phenomenon in, in, in tra everyday trauma. Uh, especially, like I did the example I made with the kickboxer here, it's a, uh, or Tai Chi, it's a, uh, it, it's a combat deal. It's just the adrenaline overrides. When the spirit just overrides and you can't feel the pain and you're just taking, you feel the impact. It's a, uh, unless you've experienced it, you really don't know. Unless you've been like her in a car accident or whatever. But uh, I, my motorcycle accident, I totally, I totally experienced it. As a matter of fact, I probably the happiest point of my life was during that little episode when I was walking around talking to people. I had no idea I'd been hurt. I just had a vague idea that I just had an accident. But uh, anyway, yeah, I don't know about time being. I understand your your position. Time is bullshit, but it's bullshit from the perspective of that we live in an artificial construct, and through the central nervous system, we're made to believe time is linear. But the physics shows everything's happening at the exact same time. But we're not going to be able to process it that way. We're, we're linear thinking. And I wouldn't want to anyway. As long as I'm in this avatar, I kind of want things, you know, predictable. Because it would be, be a very unusual world. There's a channel on YouTube called uh, Y-Files. Yeah. Uh, it's a YFI that you asked me to see that. And they just the other day, I have a copy of it. I can anybody. It shows that they, it completely shows this whole mirror structure that has uh, been created and um, I can't remember the name of it, but like I said, I have to. Yes. And, you know, there's other entities in an invisible dimension all around us right now. Well, when they're in that mirror, among many other things you can learn from watching this, they see them. They're basically the watchers. And they're, they're really, I don't think they're benevolent, per se. They all have a strong sense of fear when they first enter this mirror chamber. And you can learn all about that. But one of the key points that has been discovered by science that were amazing to me that, you know, not that I believe in mainstream science at all, but uh, two things was uh, they said time is basically space, that it's really not different. It's not that many across of the fourth dimension. And that it, it's like a river, it goes forward, you know, you're in the now. And it's coming to you in the past, which I always think is weird because that means the past is going into the future. <laughs> but, um, and that you have your perspective, you could be on one side of the bank or the other, and yada yada, it goes into the ocean. But the point that was amazing was they proved that time can uh, speed up, it can stand still, and it can go backwards. So if anybody wants that video, it's a really great way to understand that. And I've studied time for many years. I studied anthropology, and that, that was my main thesis, was, was uh, the mind of time. Yeah, well, these are these are concepts that are covered by Ishad Bintal. I've introduced you guys to his work, uh, Stopping the Wild Pendulum, uh, Brief Tour of Higher Consciousness. This is P.D. Alspinski, all, totally, uh, all, all about the uh, the overlapping of time. But yet, I don't want to. I don't want to detract from the, the the topic right now because we can talk about time space all day long and still be just as confused when we walk out the door. Justin, can you explain how two people in the same room, like me and my wife, can talk and see the our reality individually? It'd be totally different. Absolutely, I can. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, a lot of couples will reach out to me or, or people who are in a relationship <laughs> where one is awakened and vibrating on a much higher frequency and the other one is still attached to the collective. And there's there's no commonality. There's no commonality. And the person that becomes more and more awake actually becomes more and more distanced from the very person that they love. And it's because they are absolutely still trapped in the construct. The, the difference is this. One believes and knows that they are a spirit living in a body, and the other is actually convinced that they are the avatar that they that they, they inhabit. 
huge difference, huge way, a huge difference in, in how information is processed in, in the world around us. And it's uh, becoming awake is one of the worst things for those who are married. I, I'm sorry to give you bad news, but, but with one individual being really awake, this, your cognition is different, you're processing your information different, and by virtue of that, the, the construct has a feedback loop that's going to continually feed you even more information showing how trapped she is in the construct. And this is going to continue going over and over and over until, until the partner begins to see some of the things that you've been saying. You cannot, I've told you guys over and over, you can't teach anybody archaics. You can't. This is a, this is a paradigm shattering uh, Basically, it's a paradigm shattering paradigm. That's, <laughs> all, that's what it is. It's all, there's, all, there's no easy way to do it. There's only two, two different types of spiritual beings in this world. And it's, it's those who have fallen for the, for the construct and actually believe in the paradigm of the collective and those who have woken up and gone their own way. Those who realize that this world is built from within. Everybody else believes the world is built from without. It is that mindset that, that, that's going to create a deeper and deeper barrier. And if there's going to be any healing in any type of dynamic relationship like that, it has to come from the individual who's awake. That person has to be more, more patient, and that person has to live by example, because that person can't teach. Because somebody who is asleep does not respond to information. They respond to things they perceive. It's a huge difference. It's a different way to process information. Those who are asleep actually wake up by watching others who are awake. They do not wake up when you talk to them. You can't knock on doors and give these concepts to anybody. They're not going to respond. They're going to they're gonna be friendly. They're going to give you some coffee. And as soon as that door's shut, some husband's going to look to his wife, and that was a weird SOB there. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. It's done. It's done. It's done. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's... it's it's just there's no there's no easy answer for that because that's a that's a huge wedge to be to be in proximity of somebody a lot all the time who is completely enmeshed with the construct. And what I mean what I mean by the construct is they have accepted a paradigm that's true. Like I did for 40 years, I was Southern Baptist Christian. I accepted all all of its tenets. I, I would argue rapture, I would argue against Muslim, I would argue I would bring that sword out. And I knew the Bible so many times because it was the only book I had in solitary confinement. And I've been in solitary confinement so many times, and the only thing they would give me is Bible and some boxers. So half naked in the cell over 40 times. I, got, I still have all my admin paperwork. I got thrown in the slammer over and over and over. And then I started doing it on purpose because when I wasn't in solitary, I didn't have time to read the Bible. So I started going, I started messing up intentionally getting thrown in thrown in the dungeon and reading up. And if they let me out, if they let me out before I got to the book of Revelation, I would just mess up again so I could go finish it. So, yeah, I was in, I was weird back then. That's awesome. Uh, Jason, uh, happy birthday, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you talked repeatedly about the uh, biggest spiritual tools of uh, intuition, creativity, and empathy. I, uh, so you know, things I, I do to uh, to strengthen those myself. I meditate. I journal like in advance. I scripting, writing my day in advance. Try to get the feeling of the wish fulfilled, kind of similar to Neville Goddard's teachings. Uh, what sort of advice would you give to help create, uh, strengthen those? Spiritual abilities uh, as it relates to manifesting and strengthening your own form field. Um, if you want to learn how to throw hand axes and hand knives at a tree, you need to stand there for a while, close to the tree as possible, until you get that rhythm down. Until you realize it's all in the wrist, so you get that blade in the bark. Anything you do, you're going to start simple. If you're going, if you're going to go to the top of the key to shoot basketballs, trying to get good at getting inside the hoop then you're going to have a problem. You need to get under the hoop and, and get as good as you can from there and then start putting distance between you and the hoop. So you got to start simple. Unless you're just a great soul that was put here by the by the oversoul uh, to do great things, then you're going to be like me and you're going to, and you're going to start real simple because I started simple. I started super simple. 
I even documented on YouTube many little things I did to make the changes in my life that, that I made. But there's no, there, you can't introduce complexity into concepts that you yourself don't understand yet. So I would choose little things that you want in life. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for, I wouldn't go for the gold initially. I would find little things in my life that I know I would like to change, and in the back of my mind, keep the bigger things there. And you'll be surprised in changing the little things. By the time you realize you got all this done, you're already halfway to the other goal. So I will always start small. I would always, always start simple. Very good. If I could ask one more thing. Sure. Uh, so um, the concept of entities attaching, you know, the Native Americans use sage uh, and entity attachments. Back when I used to still drink and drug, you know, I was told that they would latch on in that kind of behavior because um, you're in a lowered state, you know, and what have you. What are your thoughts around that and the best ways to clear that sort of uh, energies from you? Well, you're, talking, you're, talking, you're talking about weakening the central nervous system. If I take in theogens, I actually separate the central nervous system's ability to maintain control over the avatar. So I see, I see, I see things that optically I can't see with my avatar. Now my spirit is beginning to see things. The filters of the central nervous system, when they are weakened by mushrooms, by acid, by narcotics, uh, you like the same same exact exact example of the trauma when the central nervous system is damaged. It impedes its ability to maintain maintain control of the avatar. The central nervous system's duty is to make sure that the avatar stays as a part of the construct. That's what it is. You're, you're housed inside a body that is itself a part of the environment you exist in. This is the thing you have to understand. You are not your body. You are not your avatar. You are something else. In peyote, the Indian walk, the dream walking, all these, all these, uh, what was it? The Native American have the uh, spirit walk for young braves. Yeah, these, these were specifically designed the same thing fasting does for a long period of time. If you fast for a long period of time, the central nervous system weakens. You start seeing things, hearing things. You start processing information from the field instead of from the construct. Because remember, Ishak Mental is very clear. Information is in the field. His scientific, his scientific experimentation shows very clearly there are many things that a human can do in a dark room with no noise and, and no distractions, and you will find real quick when you clear your mind that thoughts are invasive, they're in the field, and you, you're never going to be able to control them. They just keep coming. And this is who you are. You are a spiritual being attached to a field, but... You're also inside an avatar that is itself controlled by the construct. You live in two different worlds at the exact same time. In order to free yourself from the construct world, all those methods are, 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 are the way to do it. All the narcotics, trauma, uh, the entheogens, you know, your mushrooms, all that. That's that's why people go on trips. They are they are actually perceiving more spirit. Their spirit is becoming basically separated from the avatar, and they can see a lot of things. They're not totally free of it, though. This is why so many people have bad trips as well. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about the central nervous system. It's, it's the weakening of the central nervous system is what mushrooms do, which is a filter which allows the spirit within to see things. That you know, people see purple elephants. I've never seen them, but I don't do any of those, any of those things anyway. But people have seen, have seen the ghosts of... of you know, ancestors or people in their family that have passed years before. I've never experienced anything like that. But I've read enough enough to know that drugs and trauma will weaken the central nervous system to the point that the spirit can actually start processing information from the field a whole lot better. Hmm. I want to add to what you were saying about the central nervous system. Uh, let me come around there. You can listen to my mic, Matt. Then. Will that be better? I forgot what video it was. I think it was the one where you were covering the book. We are not um, first, or we. Are, it was the red cover book with the yellow letters, and you talked about um, the central nervous system and how it basically just is your uh, head, your spine, everything else is just connected, and in disrupting that. By doing, by doing meditation, fasting, uh, 
psychedelics, like anything that's just the same thing. Uh, also mantras, dances, or rituals. It's just repeating the same pattern or uh, cycle or anything, just tapping into that same energy, being able to uh, let the soul see pretty much, detaching from the physical avatar, allowing uh, basically the spirit to see. Yeah, I Something mean, like that that you were saying. You know, listen, there's a reason why there's hundreds of thousands of monks that don't do anything every day, all day but meditate. They have found a way by starvation of the senses to actually impede the central nervous system. But you sit Indian style all day long in a room full of candles, you're going to start seeing stuff. <laughs> this, is, this is because the central nervous system, it, it's not designed for long periods, long periods of inactivity. It's not designed for any of that. This is why people often have hallucinations in their hospital beds when they have to lay down for weeks or months at a time. Then, then the psychosis develop, and it's because the central nervous system is, is damaged. And they are actually seeing the things that they think they see, but they're not in the construct, they're in the field. It's totally different. I would add to that too, the world we live in, fluoride, the fluoride stare, the poisons of our food and vaccines. And vaccines and poisons and things can block that as well, right? So I think the point of it is breaking through the, the poisons that are legal, drugs like pharmaceuticals, the, the fluoride in our water and things like that are also designed to block, I think, our, our vision, our empathy, and our intuition. So I'm just adding to that. That's no. a good way. So to clear your energy and to clear your mind is to get rid of some of those things today. Well, I'm on board. I'm on board with all these things being manufactured to damage the avatar. I'm on board with that. But I'm, but I'm also of the belief, not an opinion, but I'm also of the belief that the immortal within can override anything that's intended against the avatar. And I believe that we can heal ourselves because I've done, even scientifically, anybody who's done some deep research on the ability of peptides and the placebo effect, there isn't anything the human body cannot heal. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Question about breaking free from the construct. Um, I'm assuming that that's what you're saying, break free from, when you say break free. So if the construct is constantly having an impact on us and we face challenges on a daily basis of things coming into our universe that are contrary to what we've postulated that we're trying to put out there and make the reality tunnel work for us, what do you recommend we do when something comes across us or or we face it that's uh, contrary to what we're trying to put out there. In other words, bad shit happens to us. How do you get out of that mood or that attitude and get back on track? Do you have a recommendation on that? Good question. It is a good question, but it seems that let me read, let me simplify this as much as possible. Without not giving an F about anything is one of the best attitudes you could ever have. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Don't give a fuck ass. <laughs> no, literally, literally. It's, it is. We should call me that. Listen, true objectivity allows you to deal with anything. I'll give you an example. I got three emails this morning. It's, it's the construct attempting through different, men, through different means of dungeon programming, negative default programming. Hey, I got an email saying three guys are going to show up and they're going to start some shit at this meeting right here. So I emailed them back. I says, don't tell me who they are. I'm going to deal with it when it happens. Look, you, you, you just can't give an F about anything. You just, you just move forward. And I promise you, every situation in your life will be dealt with as soon as you need to know how to deal with it. But if you think you have to anticipate how to deal with each individual minutia in your life, the construct will continually putting new things in your life that you need to make plans to deal with. It's a feedback loop. It will never end for you. You need to wake up in the morning. Don't give a damn. And just do what you want to do. Move forward. And seriously, do not entertain any negativity that comes into your life. You know how many people I have eggs off of arcades? All you got to do is say one dumb thing in my comment section, and you're gone. That's it. That's it. And, and my moderators have adopted that policy as well. That is equal tolerance, period. You got to get that energy away from you. And when you do, you're going to start seeing how powerful you are. And 
people respond to energy. And if you are not physically capable of doing something that the construct throws at you physically, don't be surprised when other personalities are suddenly there helping you and they don't even know who you are. You understand? Yep. Listen, it's attitude yep. actually creates the conditions that you experience. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Woo! Over here. No, I said that he speaks in one time, but he didn't actually matter. I say stupid shit every single day. <laughs> yeah. Every single day. Anybody got any questions? Any more for any more? You haven't got one over there. I'm going to take, take this last question here. Okay. We're going to take a break. I'm going to tell y'all what's back here, whatever, you know, bathroom break, whatever, and we're going to lead off with Martin. Okay. Well, hello, Jason. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, we've been following Martin for years, and we just found out about you, so I think that's kind of the way this yes, works. Yeah. We appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> watching some of your videos and I came up with a question like do you feel the physical world is measurable for instance I was a bricklayer and I would have to take square things make them into something round mm -hmm. and pi is not an actual number right it goes on and on there's a ratio so do you, uh, how do you feel about the physical world being measurable so that's a really good question, and I have a really good answer for that. And the, re and the reason I don't really entertain the globe flat earth model, although we'll sit here and bounce ideas back and forth, and I'll listen to everything Martin has to say, and I agree that we live on a flat plane. I don't agree we live on a flat world. The reason is, is because the construct is almost infinite, and the more we attach significance to it, it will build that significance and create that world for us to explore. It's never ending. If a significant portion of the population starts to believe that there are continents further away, then we're going to start finding maps that are six and 700 years old that show that because the construct builds in the past to mold the future. It's always doing these edits. Every 138 years, it's got new programming edits. It throws it in there. It throws us off, and it tries to deceive us. It tries to give evidence for present beliefs by giving us false evidence from the past. And that's why we discover so many things. If enough people believe that there's other continents, other continents will appear. If people think that there's going to be a day in the future when we can even go to those other continents and find old, new civilizations and all that, then I promise you the construct will build that for us. And then we'll have Colonel Fawcett's coming back, just like in the 1930s, telling us about the Amazonian jungle. So, yes, it's a good question. I believe we live in a field. And because it's a field, there's no end to the things we can build. I have to go back to stories like the Tower of Babel, where non-human personalities had a conversation with themselves in the book of Genesis about humans being so imaginative they'd become a threat that anything they imagined they could do, they would accomplish. And it was for this reason alone that these entities got together and destroyed the Tower of Babel and it turned around scattered all the languages. And to me, you already know my opinion. To create 70 languages in one day off one, off one parent dialect could only be done by changing the programming. It's the only way that could be done. There's, there's no miracle here. It's programming because we live inside some type of technology. This is the construct. We are inside a technology that is absolutely so sophisticated that it can bridge the psyche with the simulation by something as magnificent as just the central nervous system. The central nervous system is that bridge. It, it allows an immortal being to enter the construct and be a part of it. That's what the avatar is. So you, to answer your question about the measuring physicality, it will never happen because the physical world will change its dimensions as we change our beliefs about it. With that being said, how can you explain the non-editing of all the books that you've read? Oh. I can. I can explain that. I've been asked that several times. I just have never heard you respond to that. Let me explain. History has been redacted. It has been modified. And you guys only get from me about 5% of all the material that I've gone through because I've already filtered out things that to me were false. They were wrong. They were misleading. 
but to show you that there is ab absolute gems of truth spread through these old books. I know some of y'all watch my archaics challenge, challenge video where I'm challenging anybody. If you don't think this is a real mathematical formula encoded in all these different texts, then you need to you need to say so in a thesis and I'll publish it. But the number 138, 276, 414, 552, 690, 1242, uh, we can go all the way up. All the numbers divisible by 138, they have been found in all these ancient texts. And I cite the traditions, I cite the texts where all these numbers are found. They're not, they're not numbers that are not related to anything. They're all connected to a concept. And that concept is reset. Like Rashi says, every 1,656 years, the world is destroyed. Then Aristarchus says it was 2,484 years. Every 2,484 years. Over and over and over, we have this series of numbers. But every number I just told you is divisible by 138. So there's gems of truth hidden in all these ancient texts and all these books. These authors were all right. However, they were only right in their geographical area. To Aristarchus in Greece, every 2,484 years, divisible by 138, the area is destroyed. But to Rashi, a thousand years ago, the Middle East was destroyed every 1,656 years. In the book of Genesis, the world was destroyed after 1,656 years. So. I have numerous references pulled from diverse sources, different languages, different continents, different time periods that all have the series of numbers. Therefore, 395.2 years. What? 395.2 years. That, that's, that's dark satellite. It has nothing to do with the Phoenix. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. Okay. So the Phoenix phenomenon, this, this 138 year patterning, I mean, it goes even deeper than what I just told you about the Archaic Challenge, about all these historical texts telling us. That these disasters happened according to these patterns. Even Nostradamus mentioned it 1,242 years, and that's divisible by 138. But it's not that simple. That right there, and enough is a data set that stands alone, it's unchallengeable. Anybody can verify it. But what becomes what compounds the mystery is that the history of the world can easily be seen by anybody. Just follow my chronicle, go, go, go chase the sources. You'll see I made none of it up. Every 138 years, these things that these men describe are are happening. So that's the second data set. But that data, data set requires three published books, 82 videos, and, and it takes a lot a lot to process. But there's a third data set. Many of these destruction scenarios attached to these numbers are all attached to the concept of of northern Egypt, the Great Pyramid, Giza, or the Sphinx. So our third data set is the rectilinear dimensions of the Great Pyramid that were done to the thousands of an inch by Sir Flinders Petrie, that are the measurements accepted today, the only ones I use on my channel. And for those, and I know many of you have watched those videos, those measurements in the pyramid are all divisible by 138. These, these aren't coincidences, these are facts. Even though history, history is redacted and there's an editing process, we have a benefactor. There is something moving inside the construct that empowers those individuals who override it. And they're able to see these things with clarity. Putting all this material together proves that something doesn't want certain things to ever be lost. That's how they were found. But you're absolutely correct. A lot of history has been redacted. That's the whole point of archaics, to show you fact for fiction. So that, that sums up my, my, my presentation right now. So, if you guys for about 20 minutes or so, would like to stretch, meet each other, stretch your legs. Uh, we got stuff back here. We got some merchandise. Bathrooms back here. Water bottle. Bathroom and water bottles are in the back. Okay. I'm on that. Yeah, it's your
Just, it's not there anymore. If you got a pen there, I can see it from you. Thank you. 
But yeah, it can't be. Yeah. Yeah. I have to go through the I know. vibrationally just comes to this place and I see that you know a lot of people like over here and saying that like in their own personal lives there's no one to talk to about this subject <laughs> which we've all suffered with that but it's great when you meet people uh, who see the will view similar and then you've got something to talk to it's a beautiful thing so thank you for uh, being amazing hosts in America I've spoiled rotten since I've been here and I absolutely love the place so um, the Welshman in America is a massive culture shock, I can assure you. <laughs> we only have two lanes of traffic where I come from, just for things to <laughs> That's in the city. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I started out talking about flat earth, but I moved into the subject of, well, I've always under the umbrella of consciousness, understanding or understanding what consciousness is, what we're doing here, the meaning of life. Um, you know, we don't really know where we are, what we are, or when we are, even, really, which gives us a bit of a, um, you know, you know, we need to grasp what this place is. And when we're all coming together and sharing thoughts, like I've been working with Jason, it's been astounding. The stuff has just come out of the ether, the discoveries, it's just like left, left really flabbergasted. So um, I went into the subject of alternative history um, years ago, um, when I... I envisioned, if you like, um, a world that came before us, which some people call Tataria, uh, some people regard as um, a golden era that went just before us. The evidence is the architecture. The architecture has been repeat, repeated um, everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter what cosmopolitan city you are in, so-called Christendom, the same architecture is repeated. So one, one peoples have constructed these, these architectural pieces. But they're more than just architectural pieces. They're what's called living buildings. These things have got special crystallized structure in the stone. They're made on divine principles, Fibonacci, all the rest. These buildings are living. They, they, they react with the consciousness, unlike all of the new buildings we get today, which do nothing to the consciousness. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about resets. This is um, something that me and Jason definitely agree on. And also, even in the time span between it, you know, I was going on roughly around 150 years or so. But it, it does define my reality, you know, this, this sort of field. And understanding or understanding that this place is nothing like what we think, okay? I'm going to propose um, something that feels a little bit weird when you first look at it. And it's a little bit uh, creepy, you could say. But the effort that they would have gone to to fabricate the past... Okay, that looks really creepy. Why do they go to that extent to fabricate the past? Okay, so we're going to look at some aspects of that <laughs> and I'm going to get into it. So I'm going to start here um, with this famous movie that you can see here on screen. Is there any um, darkness going on? 
and screenage. Oh. Excuse me. Just to do with these light shows for mine. Uh. Oh, no, that's not good. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah, yeah it's better. Yeah, you clean that one off too. Yeah, yeah you sure? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, how's yeah. that? Perfect. Yeah. Very much better. Okay, sweet, isn't it? Awesome. <laughs> so, the video or the movie you're looking at here is a really strange movie because it's our best example of this period. And what you're looking at is Market Street um, in San Francisco on um, April the 6th. 1906. Um, there's a narrative behind these two brothers miraculously get together and they make this super fantastic, really high quality video. Okay, of what happens in Market Street? And remember, this is supposed to be what they call the Victorian era. It's not exactly, you know, this is supposed to be, you know, post Wild West. And what you see is these massive cities up and running. Okay, so if I could just play that a second. Okay, give me a second. I do have broadband. So, um, <coughs> that's not actually playing. So, what you see here, right, is on this video, it is being faked. For some reason, you know, they've literally gone to the extent to fabricate history. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, they couldn't do that with a whole main street in a major city, just think that. Cecil B. DeMille used to use up to half a million extras in some of his extravaganzas, like um, Cleopatra, for example. And they used to literally build these cities, these Romanesque cities, for the movie himself. So it's not a giant leap in imagination to think that they might be doing this. So with this San Francisco movie, you can see cars cutting in. You can actually look at the registration plates and find out that this car's going around in circles most of the map. The weird thing about this is you won't find any evidence for cars in any other metropolitan city in the world at this period, 1906. It seems like all the cars in the world are in San Francisco in 1906 for some weird reason. Also, we notice the suicidal nature of the people. You know, they see this guy aimlessly walking along the road, staring at the camera because he knows it's there. Later on, you'll see examples of people like literally really far out of frame, looking down, waiting for the camera to come to them. These people know this is happening. You know, this is set up. There's a little boy later in the back of a wagon. He, he literally, he interacts with the camera because he gives the game away totally, actually. So you can see this car keeps coming, cutting in and out. Later on, you'll see a guy with um, a dummy baby um, who almost gets killed. You know, everyone's got this suicidal nature. It's just absolutely <laughs> ridiculous to think it. Um, another thing this sort of proves is that um, there's a lot of cobble in the old world. And what you're finding is the horse and cat does not work on cobble. The whole thing looks like it's going to just fall apart. <laughs> so I definitely think there was some other technologies going on, especially in the way of getting around. So if you imagine this is a post-reset civilization, if you like, Everyone's dressed in black, everyone has the same clothes, everyone's covered from the sun, there's something in that. The women got long crimson gowns on, a lot of people have umbrellas, every male has a hat, he's protecting his head. Everyone's dressed in exactly the same colour, almost like, um, you know, they're, they're conscript clothes, you know, what they would have, you know, on, on arrival, they would have been given all these clothes. And you'll find the same for everywhere in the world. The Mexican people, they had this uniform with these white clothes and the hat. I mean, China, the coolie hats, their blue uniforms, Russia had a similar uniform. You know, where, who in these rural areas is giving these people these uniforms? These people are allocated these by the state, yeah? So it's the same here, all these people, they're in like state clothes, if you like. There they are waiting for the camera because it's completely, and you know, because they know it's there. So my point is this, okay? The weird thing about it is this. So let me just show you towards the end. This little boy gives the game away. He's at the back of a coach, just before it comes down to the Terminus Ferry Building at the end of Market Street. But see, they, they just keep cutting up. This is, everyone would die if this was a reality. There's six and a half minutes of stomach in, in uh, here. It's like, oh my God, you're gonna die. But then an astounding thing happens, a really, really creepy thing. It's, there's some really weird, I've actually done a video on this shot here. This is when you come up to the Terminus building and there's two really freaky nuns 
standing on the side. I don't even know what they're doing there. They don't even look human. They look vampiric. But anyway, so this is exactly the same point two days later. Two days later, the entire city is apparently destroyed in some sort of earthquake. Um, the witness accounts is they heard booming um, and like loud explosions before the event, which only lasted a number of seconds. The devastation is caused by apparently a firestorm. So what you see in this film is this is like only a few days after that color film and it's exactly the same street. So it's okay, everything's fine. They've got an excellent HD um, Hollywood production type movie. Two days later, everything has disappeared. Everything is gone. So what you find is you get thousands and thousands of people with no baggage, not a care in the world actually, compared, you know, considering they're in an apocalyptic environment and they're all coming from this terminal building, this very terminal. It's terminus. And they're all going in the same direction. They seem to have a predestination. Nobody's bothered about the, you know, nobody's upset. Nobody's bothered about all of the carnage around him. In fact, everyone is really well dressed and well turned up. I'd love to know how this is happening. So I've proposed that these people, this city, and many others, which I'm going to show you shortly, have been reset. And the population has probably been killed. And the rest have been brought in to replace the population, allocated the property. You know, this stuff went on in World War II. This is you know, not an unthought of way of uh, dealing with the takeover in some way. The terminal so, is called Embarcadero. Embarcadero, thank you for that. But funnily enough, the entire city, Maggie Street is you know laid to waste. You get images of the coal building, but weirdly, fire stacks from the roof. You know, it's just how does it stack from the roof when the fire's coming in this way, apparently. So, um, you know, my suggestion is, is this, um, Jason talks about the Phoenix event, okay, which is a, is a plasma related event, okay. So I talk about a technology, an ancient technology, an electromagnetic technology that has been used since the ancient world. And I talk about fasces, okay. You may regard them as an, what, an advanced new weapon, okay. There's something that can turn matter into dust discorporeal matter and just basically turn the Sahara, basically turn a green and lush Sahara into the desert that it is today, because there was a glittering civilization existed in North Africa. And the maps chron chronologize this, okay? And then it disappears, and now there's this anomalous belt of deserts all the way across what was apparently the Fertile Crescent, it tells you right there, it's not now, it's all desert -y. So in the recent past, um, there was a terrible event, okay? Now, what you see here is it's coming up to the uh, town hall. So everything burns, all the buildings burn, but the telegraph poles that are made of wood, they don't burn. The wires, <laughs> they don't burn. <laughs> all of the buildings fall in their footprint, not into the road, as would be the nature of an earthquake falling over buildings, but all the build, all of the roads, builders, bulldozers must have come in, you know, in a day after or something, because all the roads are clear. Everything falls in its footprint, trees are unharmed, and this wood doesn't burn, makes zero sense, unless you're thinking there's something, which I'll show you evidence, evidence of in a minute, did exist, okay? It's a technology that is hit it from above. Something's hit this place from above. I think the same technology was happening Right the way through World War One, I, I think it was right the way through World War Two. Um, it's a, a, a technology with many permeations. There's a good side of it, okay, um, as well, which is um, organ technology, which we'll look at. Organs that pipes put together. It's a similar technology to fasces, which I will explain shortly. So this is a post-apocalyptic picture, you know, of a, of a civilization that literally is supposed to be just picking up the pieces of their city. They only say 6,000 dead. Some of these pictures you can see safes, you know, where you keep money on the floor, almost as if some big bank job went down and they just cleaned the city up. But these people, they had um, up to 100 FEMA camps set up within two days. You know, it sort of stinks that this thing was... You know, they, they knew this event was coming. There's all sorts of narratives being tied in with this place had Black Death, so they had burn it out. I don't think that's a thing, but it is in the narrative. There's loads of reasons. But the major point is, is there's an endless amount of people just turning up. What are these, tourists? 
you know, and they just like in their Sunday dress to go and check out, you know, the city that is completely devastated. Loads of people have, you know, have been um, killed, apparently. Only days after, you know, like we're going to check out all of the death and devastation, shall we, on a Sunday afternoon. Doesn't seem real. So um, the trams kept on running right the way through. They're running on an electric um, underground cable system, and apparently that was completely unaffected. A bit like Hiroshima, World War II. You know, the entire city is supposed to be destroyed by a nuclear bomb or an atom bomb, yet the hospital stayed completely functional through the entire day, and the tram system never stopped. It was up and running the day after. I'm proposing that even there, even on that, we're talking about a similar technology. Because some of these pictures, guys, I'm going to show you now, the only thing you can think of is that it looks like World War II. It looks like that America had a war. If I show you now these images here, I'll just go through a few. So 1870s, 1871, there's the massive event in North America. The Bestigo event is apparently a massive, massive forest fire apparently one of the biggest in history um, and at the same time chicago um is a race and it's, they always give you the same narrative you know molly tipped over um you know milk cat and it's an oil lamp over <laughs> in a city that looks like you know massive massive skyscrapers and filters it makes zero sense okay so this is early on you've got um you can see trams there with uh, you know dragged by horses uh, because apparently the electric tram didn't come in until like 18 late 1870s so they wouldn't have had them there but interesting they got a, a mass of what they call gas meter or gasometer in the background so if this place was on fire i wonder why that didn't go up so again everything falling in its footprint again um <coughs> uh, telegraph poles unaffected again um what you see predominantly if you look at the, the bombing of berlin world war ii 1945 the battle of berlin you will never see a crater same for Dresden. You don't see any craters. These are the biggest bombardments in, in history. You do not see any craters. What you do see is the buildings outside uh, facing still existing, but the inside is completely missing. And they did most of these um, bombardments during nighttime. I'm thinking there was another technology again. Um, you can see that the, the buildings fall in their footprint, but they're left always in this case. You'll see many examples into tiny bricklets. You see, not what fire does, guys. There's some other technology going on here. And as I said, everything just falls in its footprint, just like the Twin Towers yeah. falling yeah. in their footprint. Just what we've exist, you know, what we've seen with um, some of the events that happened in California with Paradise, you know, buildings that are just are completely missing, falling in their footprint, and they've got nice trees and shrubbery all around the house, unaffected. How is that even humanly possible unless something's hit it? From above, there's enough evidence out there on YouTube that this this technology existed. But there you are, 1871, the Great Fire of Chicago. This is not the only city um, that is sort of destroyed at this period. You're going to find that most American cities have had some sort of freak fire where the center is just being burnt out. Boston, <laughs> Philadelphia. This is another narrative we must we must uh, myself and Jason talked about on Paranormies just recently. Show. Uh, where we talked about the American Civil War and what we really think is going on with it, okay? This is apparently, okay, Atlanta, um, excuse me, Richmond, Virginia, okay? Um, what's with the Greco-Romano Greco Temple in the background? You know, when, when is this stuff being built? This looks like the ancient classical world, and this is a big, well-established city. They say they're using them, cannons, to do this destruction, okay? Cannon balls, okay, which... I think there's something else going on. I've seen enough evidence now that they electrified these cannons, okay? So when they say charge, they mean charge, or discharge, they say discharge. Um, there's a reason that guns are put in a battery, yeah? So I think that these were magnetized. If they did use cannonballs, they were coming out with some incredible kinetic energy, which would just splatter everything. But again, that is not worth what we're finding with the MO buildings missing in their footprints, everything's gone, <laughs> tiny bricklets, and everything falling in his footprint. Okay, so organs. I want to talk about organs a bit. Now, what we find after every reset <laughs> is the arrivals, um, and many of you must know about orphan trains by now, surely. You know, there's a, a whole load of people are brought into this <laughs> realm to repopulate it, okay? Where they're from. Jason thinks underground, this could be the case. There's some sort of 
you know, process for repopulating this place um, post reset. They just don't seem to have an issue with, you know, what we do here. Yeah. So they repurposed the churches. They come along after a reset. These churches were never for worship, worship. They were never that. These were healing centers. These were devices where people could go in. They could have a organ play and they would have a specific frequency, four, three, two, or whatever it is. The organs are good for your organs. In fact, it's good for anything that begins with org. Okay. So these are healing centers. Again, these are pipes together and they all give off a frequency because everything in this place is frequency and vibration. And vibration and frequency is a healing technology, which you can tweak. Underground, excuse me for blasting you out, under water, <laughs> cross Atlantic communication cables. These were supposed to be dropped in the Atlantic Ocean to connect Europe with America, um, apparently used by the Great Easter, one of the biggest ships that was ever built by Isengard, is, uh, by Brunel. So what you find, again, it's rods bound together. You see that in the middle, you've got a central core, <laughs> you've got some dots around the outside, and it's bound with a copper band to give it a charge. I think that these things weren't bump, put down by the Great Eastern. I think these are much older technology from what I would regard as Tataria. But the similarity in the size slice would show you that it looks just like a church window or a semantic pattern, coincidentally. Wow. I could just, I'll just reel off a load of these, uh, you know, these cities that are just miraculously, been, you know, vanished off the face of the earth and then they basically turn up again later. This happened twice for Chicago, this happened twice for San Francisco, there was another fire prior to 1906. So, Charleston, American Civil War again, 1861, you notice the roads are clear, you notice everything's just falling in its footprint, it seems to be selected too. Um, in regard to World War II, um, this is the bombing campaign of World War II, Cologne Cathedral. Every single building around it is turned to dust. Cologne Cathedral, miraculously, gets in hand. London's blitz, yeah? Um, everything around St. Paul's Cathedral, completely blitzed. St. Paul's Cathedral, completely in hand. This is selective. This is selective. I would go as far as to say on both sides in it together. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the bombing campaigns were um, between them both. You know, I think they're all on the same table. I think they were all along. So another reset, you can see the architecture here. This is Baltimore, another city. And um, everything is just in small bricks. How is this even humanly possible? Just by a fire, um, a big stone masonry buildings that look like this Tatarian building here. This is the architecture I'm talking about. You'll find this in, anywhere. In, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, Hong Kong, North America, South America, all over Europe, it doesn't matter where you are, this architecture is replicated. The weird thing is, they akin it to being all built around the 1870s to 1900 mark. So all of the world just shit out of nowhere at the same time, there was nothing before. <laughs> Does it make any sense? Well, we were, well, how were we living before? But you can see that this is a really big, well-established world, you know, in what they call the Victorian era. And all of these have suffered terrible, terrible events. All of these cities, the first fire of San Francisco, okay? 2000 buildings destroyed, 1851. And then the buildings are miraculously built then by apparently the 49ers, they say. And then the cities, you know, there again to be only destroyed later in 1906, only they rebuilt the entire city and built the biggest, best exposition that's ever been built, the Pan Pacific Exposition, all in nine years from dust. How is that even humanly possible? That they keep um, destroying the city, then it comes back, then it's destroyed, then it comes back. Columbia, South Carolina, 1865, American Civil War. Yeah. Trees there, buildings completely gutted, it looks like World War II. This is America something they never told you about they put them on these stupid narratives you know the chicago fire a big massive city of stone masonry and granite um, but my mrs o'leary she burnt her all down when she had an oil lamp over <laughs> they got a similar nar similar narrative to boston it's just comical it is comical so there was a great fire of new york and there's no photograph uh, photographs of that because 1835 Photographs apparently come a little bit later, but I really do think camera, cam, photography is quite simple uh, technology. I think they had 
uh, I think they had it all. I think there's nothing new under the sun. Everything you've got now from your from your device to your television to all of it, I think we've had it all in the past. I think it's all been there, it's replicated. Different technologies for different resets for different people every year. Some resets seem to be occupied by giants and cryptids all sharing the realm together in so many depictions of the alchemical period. But this architecture seems to be about as well. And these, these buildings, massive windows, massive doors, second story front doors, and all of the lower bits are all underground. So I asked an architect once, um, why do they feel the need to build um, a lower story um, on a Victorian building? If you get no light in there, it would be damp. And in a country that it rains all the time, we have snow all the time, what's their reason? And put in um, the front door in the, the first story, yeah, where it looks like there's a window of being at some stage. But when we have ice, what what would be their reason? What, what is your reasoning? And he said, oh, I think it was in vogue at the time. So I looked at him like that, and then you realise how absurd that he actually sound, sounded. So, oh, that's nice. So, Charleston, American Civil War, you know, you can see these basements that I'm talking about. You can see these lower windows here, which seem they call basements, but... This is replicated so many places in the world. It makes zero sense, guys, to put these doors up in the air and this lower, so what, um, and this lower story below ground level. So we think there has been many apocalyptic mud floods, volcanic ash, Noah's flood, all of it put together, Phoenix event put together. That you know, Jason's been telling me about you know artifacts miles down in Texas, miles down. You know, all of the dead, the trillions and trillions of people that went before us, they went somewhere and they're down there. Okay, in the mud. So the Great Fire of Lafayette destroyed 500 buildings, 1831. Uh, Medina Fire, Ohio, shoot two blocks, destroyed the, and it seems to be always around the business districts, something in that. Atlanta, Georgia, um, 1864. That must be something to do with General Sherman and his craziness when he's going on an ethnic cleansing binge across the southern states of America on one. So, St. So Louis Fire. Another city, so they got photographs of that. Another city has a massive exposition. Um, you can see the architecture smashed. Yeah, if you look onto the photography of, say, 1890, all these buildings seem to be back again. It's just all very peculiar. Great Fire of Pittsburgh, another massive city gone. And another Great Fire of New York. No actual pictures, even no pictures and photographs existed. No problem in 1845. In Tucker Island, 1846, no photographs, if photographs existed. 1850, photographs existed. Philadelphia, it gets burnt out. Okay. Troy, New York, 1862. And Denver, Colorado, which is a beautiful red, big, red brick, Italian looking city. Um, but apparently, um, it disappeared off the face of the earth, 1860s. So here is Boston. Boston, another city that's destroyed, and you get these sort of anomalous creepy dudes coming in. You see that guy there doing the Masonic symbol. You see this a lot. They have coded these photographs. And it's just, it's a cover story for a greater apocalypse. How can all of America, look at the size of this masonry this kid is sitting on. How did they carry that masonry by horse and cat across muddy roads from wherever and then build these massive structures, get the steel there, get the glass there? all of these materials to build this massive world on horse and cat. Really, do you think this is possible? Because I really don't. Look at the size of these masonry bits. It's the older world. And they're covering up an older world by destroying it. And this building here, that's not conventional fire. That looks like it's been targeted. This thing is melted. That building is scorched. And that's old stone, granite structure, crystalline structure. That is not easy stuff to burn, guys, okay? Um, Chicago fire, this place is massive. And also um, regarding the um, great exposition of Chicago, one of the best fun uh, fairgrounds in any exposition and the exposition itself, one of the best you could ever imagine. Anomalous fire disappears off the face of the earth, all of it. The expositions too, because they make no sense. This divine architecture made with just unbelievable principles of technology and they're completely lost to us today. They never replicate that anymore. They couldn't build one of these old buildings. So these are newspaper curtains from World War II. Now I proposed in my field that the transport of Tataria was the air balloon. I proposed that the narrative for the Hindenburg disaster in 1930 was a psyop. Okay, it proves that if you look into it, I've proved that these are two different movies. 
one of the the graph spree was supposed to have a big swastika on the side but the one that like burns and hit the ground never had one this is two different events two different blooms and it, it is you know oh the humanity conveniently they have all these world correspondents there to cover what they knew was going to happen so that got rid of the idea of blooms in favor of modern air travel when blooms were safe um reasonably quick and you know just a really nice mode of transport quiet but in world war ii they were they were a weapon and what we find is zeppelins bring death and destruction to the very heart of london um i proposed evidence uh, a few years ago that, that in paris they were using fachets to shoot on a zeppelin the zeppelin itself um, has a remarkable resemblance to a fachet also but the evidence is overwhelming now in all these newspaper cuttings that they had some sort of death ray, if you like, coming out of these Zeppelins, this technology, Fashay's technologies that I'm talking about, um, which would attack the old architecture. It's the same with the bombing campaign of World War II. This wasn't a bombing campaign against um, soldiers uh, or, or even civilians, <laughs> really. This was a campaign against architecture. Especially in the case of Dresden, you know, it makes no sense, except that it was one of the greatest architectural pieces in antiquity, and then it gets destroyed. So Calais, First World War, and you can see this beam of light, and it's literally cooking this building down below, this Italian-type building, um, which is the city hall, the Hotel de Ville there. In uh, Paris, there's another one here, Great Yarmouth, or oh, 1850, First World War, some sort of ray coming out of the Zeppelin. So, I'm proposing that they were doing that in these cities. I'm proposing that they were destroying these cities using air balloons and electromagnetic technologies. If you, I'll, I'll look, I'll just show you some of the basics with uh, the fascists. You can, you can uh, find out all about that on my channel. But this technology does exist today. It's in your microwave oven. The, the mag magnetron that is in your microwave oven is the same design as the fascists. There's some examples on YouTube that John Levy actually posted. Some Russian boys um, taking the magnetron out of the microwave oven and they literally turned um, paper clips. It just melted. Okay, just melted. It's a really dangerous technology. So we've got that wrapped up, stick it in a zeppelin. You can make a city disappear in its footprint from above. I think that's what they're doing. I think the evidence is overwhelming anyway by now. <laughs> it will what one. They were shooting many, many zeppelins out of the sky, more than you think. There was a lot of bombs dropped in uh, World, War, World War I um, by zeppelins, but I think it was that technology. And they were anxious to bring them down. So I've also proposed that belfries, that's towers without bells, is because they were landing platforms for balloons. You could literally come up with a balloon and moor on one of these, uh, one of these belfry towers, if you like, um, and just get off and then you're delivered into the city. I've got many, many examples. Uh, they did do it, they did it in LA, they did it with the Empire State Building. They brought the Graf Zeppelin in, and Kadira, and people were delivered directly to the center of New York. Okay. Paradise, it's exactly the same, isn't it? Things falling in their footprint, it's inexplicable really how this tree's you know, not bothered, this tree's not bothered. This is supposed to be a firestorm traveling through a hurricane, hurricane there. Uh, wings apparently but that's not what the photographs show um, and they don't fit the ammo of what they're explaining so there's somebody has drawn a picture or vision of what terrier would it look like and they definitely are thinking in lines mm -hmm. of something halfway between a ship and halfway between a bloom but i think thinking the post reset world i think that the the liquid medium that we find ourselves in which they say is oxygen which is arguable because it's supposed to be mostly nitrogen anyway, so I don't know where they're getting that from, but this liquid medium that we exist in, that literally we can interact with with our emotions, you send ripples out just like you would in water, that's a fact, okay? So I think that there was a lot more um, electromagnetism in the air post reset, and I think that there was a thicker fluidity, um, you know, Jason talks about the vapor canopy, a thicker super air. It may have been even the case that, you know, we could literally leap and float okay like like um what was his name icarus going too close to the sun there's so many accounts of you know the angels got wings flight human beings being able to fly in the past I, i'm just proposing that you know that might have been the case what they call gravity okay but what if there was less electromagnetism and what if this place was lighter and you could just literally leap up um, and take off 
there's enough films like Superman and Matrix to show you that this is what we can cut. I think, I do believe we can fly. I dream about it every night. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a narrative that, um, you know, for the balloons that they say, you know, that these origins were in France and, you know, it's the 1600s. But I've shown evidence of tens of thousands of people being carried on balloons into invasions. These giant hangars that they have for the great expositions were probably hangars originally, excuse me, um, for these giant dirigibles, these giant zeppelins. This is one of the great expositions. Um, an, another narrative which we think of is after a reset, they're brainwashing the pop new population with this is the way the world is, this is the way certain countries behave, this is the certain traditions of the place, this is the items that they use, this is the technology that we got in this realm. This is literally a program in place, you know, it's a bit like Disneyland. But this is the place where we do our black magic. Well, they, they had um, incubators in a lot of them as well, incubator stations in a lot of these. They could have been just, you know, something to do with breeding plants, all I know. But this is um, Four Angels technology. This is um, a technology of electromagnetism, you know, to create a charge in the center dome. This is free. So these expositions were using free energy. And free energy is a thing I've shown. Um, Kirschner books from 1700s showing perpetual motion devices using uh, magnetism and, and motors using magnetism, you know, and the um, Tesla motor. You know, these things are, you know, free energy devices. All you need is magnetic propulsion and attraction to send some, something moving, you know. So um, it's also a technology for the balloons for free energy. These are what they call aerostats. So they go high up. The more higher up you go, and the more electrostatic potential is available in the ether. So if you get right up there with the blue, and they've got their little modules, it catches a charge in the ether, it sends them back down to these stations, these depots, and these giant electric, electric generators, all free energy, all free energy. So there's the way the mechanism works. So they're doing aerostats in the past, apparently, and I've got many examples of aerostat. There's another one. With the sending the balloons up and they get picking up a charge um, and they're charging batteries they're using generators from the blue grabbing the electrostatic charge which is there this is what tesla talked about he said if we could just tease out that potential that is there it's just a case of finding a resonation a key a sound a key um to free energy it's what it's all about that's why they say it's a key you know a key is a key a musical key the key we're looking for is a sound it's a vibration so what's happening with this whole movement, we're all on a similar vibration, we're lifting our vibrations, you know, we're turning into uh, what we're supposed to be, you know. This is what this whole narrative has been, guys, is, you know, just keeping us on a lower vibration experience so we don't wake up to our true, true human potential, because we really are manifestors, we really are Superman and Superwoman, yeah, and we're fantastic beings, it's just they took it all away from us, yeah. only to think it insignificant. But the opposite is true. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, producing rain using x rays, and I've talked about weapon manipulation. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. It's even in the official narratives that they do control the weather. And the end, uh, well, I don't think anything is uh, real, but artificial. This place is artificial, including the, the weather. They can uh, set weather off in a certain place using, as you know, how, but that is a vibrational technology along the lines of fascist technologies. So, there's a vision of these balloons coming in. The fantastical golden era with free energy, no bills, no being gaslit by the government, um, some sort of overstanding between people. I would even suspect until Babylon, which is sure now where the languages have been confused, that everybody must have been talking one language or maybe no language at all. Because as you know, language is spells. And we've been casting spells on one another mm -hmm. and wittingly using the phonetic language that the Phoenicians kindly gave to us to use for them to manifest mm -hmm. um, their world. But we're not doing that anymore. It's not his story, it's our story. So we're taking history back. So I think there's something bigger happening here. My interpretation of it is it's not just now, but this generation that us now that is waking up because if you imagine the only constants of now forget about time that was mentioned earlier so if you're say a soldier on the in the trenches of the first world war okay he exists there right now in that time okay and that's saying for the future your future year whatever you will find out whatever you will 
you know, unveil in this journey later on has happened. And it's sending ripples back to this time. So I think that when we wake up, I think it's not just you, I think all of history wakes up simultaneously right across the board. The whole thing, the whole paradigm changes. And then it's a new day, okay? Where they're gone and we're free. That's the idea. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Continuously ripple of applause. So, um, here's some evidence here of fascist technologies. You know, they admit it in the, um, that, the official narrative. Electrical fascists were used um, to shoot on Zeppelins in the First World War. You can see that. So, they were using electrical fascists. So, you know, they're sort of admitting it. So, transport of the past. Did you know they were using um, air tubes before the steam train? They were using pneumatic trains that would deliver people comfortably and quickly over distance before the steam train actually appeared. So everything seems to be going backwards. You only got to see um, the streets of Britain, you know, my cities in Britain are literally a terrible state, okay? Everyone's gets gaslit to hell. But if you look at a, a video of a hundred years ago of these same cities, everyone's got a smiling face, considering, you know, it's supposed to be back, so bad back there. It's a completely different world. The vibration's completely different. This, the people of now, this is the crossroads of humanity, guys, as we all know. It's make it or break it time. It really is. Um, and I think we all know this in our hearts. And there's something big coming. It's around the corner, okay? And that's us. We're doing that. We're making this happen. It's us that's doing it. We're manifesting it, okay? But it's done through love, so it's going to be fantastic. I wouldn't even give it a second thought. It's meant to be. Excuse me. I just juggled through my photographs when I was rabbiting to myself. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll just scroll through. Anyway, I won't be too long now with the, this narrative, but I'm just going to bring it to a close. I'm just going to show you examples of what I thought was going on in Tataria is, you know, they literally have an air balloon that's somewhere between a boat and they can literally drop you off at your house, which is the reasoning why there's all of these upstairs balustrades um, and upstairs um, wrought ironworks in so much of antiquity. You can see this feature everywhere, you know, <coughs> Barcelona, um, you even got these upper rails in New Orleans, you know? But they can be doubled up as a flood prevention because if the flood waters rise, then you've got the upper <laughs> gantry to moor your boat on, okay? So I think that that's how they were getting around and that would be a beautiful way to be just dropped into your city, no hassle whatsoever. Um, they literally put like thousands and thousands of people on balloons, up to 8,000 on this one balloon, in antiquity. So they, you know, they, they, these like literally invasion forces that have been used by Napoleon with balloon. So they're doing it in Napoleonic for, um, era, but not in the Victorian era, it makes zero sense. I really do think that these massive um, steel and glass things that railway stations are in now, same as everything after um, a, a, a reset, I think they've been repurposed, okay? And they just need to put the glass in again, and they look like the Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace burns down in the 1930s, another great exposition, because apparently glass and steel burns. Okay, okay, uh, whatever. Uh, so here's a beautiful vision of how it would be, all that Nate's uh, raw iron, which is a technology in itself, you know? Um, I have seen examples where people can put in or they have put Solomon's sigils into wrought ironwork faces, look like little demonic faces. So when the subtle ethers roll through, you know, it's giving an icky vibe to that area. So I noticed they've done that with some of these railings. And a lot of the railings that you see here, they removed in World War II. They said it was for um, basically animants uh, to support the war program. So when you research it, you find out that none of it ever made it to the factories. In fact, they were dumping it in the Medway, in the Thames in London. None of this metal they removed. So it was an old technology that they were trying to get rid of. So imagine just a quiet train, electric train, zipping up outside your window, and then you're just into your apartment, and it's going to be a luxury place. It's a better world all over. And then off to your Tatarian hotel on the beach, which is a beautiful, free energy Tatarian building. So Medusa Tech is another way which we call it. Now, the narrative for Medusa is she's a lady, she has serpents in her hair. You can't look at her directly because you will turn to stone. But you can look at her in a reflection, like Theseus did. This is the technology that we're talking about. And in antiquity, they show you the fasces, which you can see just below her, and the Medusa together in a lot of architectural pieces showing there's a connection. 
I think that the serpents represent um, EM. Okay, you see a serpent around, say Noah's staff. You see, uh, excuse me, uh, Moses' staff when he turns his, the staff into serpent. You see the serpent wrap around it in the movie. But there's loads of examples in, in um, alchemical images of a serpent wrapped around the central core. Um, because if you wrap um, something with a wire, for example, a copper wire, and it's a central core, it's made of metal, for example, you would create a charge. So they know all about it. They know all about it. The powers that should not be. Um, the fascists themselves, Mussolini, um, and also prior to them, um, Napoleon, his uh, banner, his insignia for his, um, for his arm, he was a fascist. Um, also, um, Mussolini acquired it, and it was the emblem for the fascists. And we all know they suck. So and this is really, really bad. Okay, so uh, House of Congress, we've got two fasces and they're wrapped around uh, with two laurel leaves. But what you see is they're opposing Tauruses, they're facing one another. And also the same thing with the binding uh, with the laurel leaf, you would see that they're literally telling you that this is. And it's in the most powerful place where all of your, all your shit go down. Okay, so there are some examples that we found in battles of fasces being deployed. These are the smaller ones. They come big, they come smaller. You can see this axe. Now, an official narrative, this is a, a weapon for punishment. The lector carries his, um, his fasces and the axe, which is called a labris. Apparently, in, they chop people's heads off as a punishment. So they do say it's a weapon. That makes no sense if you can't even put your hands around this central column. And, and the weight of it, the whole thing doesn't work with trying to chop someone's head off. But that's what the official narrative is to try and explain what this anomalous object is, even though it's showing you in lots of alchemical images that it's destroying architecture and defining resets. So there it is. So we got some brass uh, pipes together, and then you just bind it with some copper wire that will create a charge. You ramp that up, you get the direct directionalization correct, you got yourself a nasty ass weapon. Okay, there's Mussolini. You can see he's got two people carrying symbolic fasces in front of him. Yeah, this is a part of the whole power structure of them, is the fasces, because they know they know this is a weapon. I, I've even proposed that oh. There you are. I've even proposed that the crown jewels, the Queen's scepter and the Queen's orb, the holy iron grenade, and the crown itself are all a technology from the old holder world. Yeah, they do say this is our sceptered island um, about Britain, and there's loads of evidence of vitrification, so just say it. And that's that underground sea cable. You can see it's the same structure as a fasces, because that is what it is. Okay, sends a vibration. Apparently thousands of miles and uh, over mountain ranges because it's supposed to be this mid-Atlantic mountain ridge. They don't explain how the cables are laid on that. Very interesting to find out. So, church windows, you've got an organ behind them, okay? And the organ is emitting a frequency. They took one frequency out in the 1700s. They said it was the brown notes, it was making people go to poo in church. But there was other... Um, notes which was arousing some women as well so they were like what's going on with it we have to get rid of that note so there's a few notes in antiquity they noticed in church machines that were affecting people okay especially the organ okay so what we find is all of these church windows these rose windows which got lead content in them you know they're a technology the rose glass itself um a set of specific cymatic frequencies okay um, and they're in all of the churches, and the organ music is passing through these, like speakers, and it's going out into the ether, and people are literally charmed by the three, four, three, two, also the bells as well, the bells in synchronicity. This would have been a scintillating world, yeah? Plants would have been bigger, um, animals, everything healthier. Um, I don't even think that, you know, this, is, this sort of technology, I don't even think death was a thing. I'm, re I'm really too, there's no toilets in, Tataria, guys. Yeah, the the Louvre. Um, excuse me, um, Louis the Sixteenth to say, okay, it's got like six thousand rooms or something, but only got one toilet. There's no in all of these massive structures that come out of antiquity. There doesn't seem to be any need for a toilet. So why isn't anyone going to a toilet? Some people have proposed that, that in antiquity that everyone doesn't need to, to eat because they're preferians and they're living at a high state of consciousness. Consciousness, yeah, becoming more ethereal. 
okay? So you're not really needing that food. So maybe they were the people that were inhabiting this place before this, this stupidest reset in history. So, oh, it really is. The last two years or three years have proved that they're a special kind of stupid. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, I'm not being a pleasant, but it was really weird, wasn't it? Yeah. Especially doing as you're told, but because it's how you tell us just do it. Yeah. yeah. Cowards. <laughs> well, what's the worst thing that happened? You're going to get, I've had a snotty nose. I know how that goes down. Don't worry. If I put a mask on, I'm definitely going to have a snotty nose. Uh, anyway, so somatic patterns, 432. Everyone, every one of them has got an individual frequency setting, 432, 555, whatever it is, and they are all set into church windows in antiquity, showing you that these are 100% more, and these things are basically healing machines, if you like, and many other permeations for these as well, because it's going out into the ether. So, um, yeah, this cymatic pattern you're going to see play, played out a lot of times in Flat um, of British studies, you know, this this is how what this place really is, you know, and you can go into the fields of quantum mechanics, talk about that, so the cows come on, you're never going to see it. It's just indistinguishable, okay? A bit like they're light years away. It's just things that just, they make it indistinguishable because you're never ever going to know. They make things counterintuitive, okay? Well, that doesn't make any sense, it's counterintuitive. That's where they want you, okay? When you really know. This this um, awakening, as far as I can make out, it's just a case of remembering. I think we already know all the answers, guys. I think what we're looking for is confirmation from others. So we don't sound so nutty when we're saying it. Okay. <laughs> I think that's what I think we already got it. You know, it's just um, I think Matrix is it seems to be really kind and it's like getting us ready. You know, so we can't just you know give us the whole download in one go because we're putting our brains out. But I think it's getting us ready for something really, really big. I really do. Everyone knows it. They were so a beautiful rose window, beautiful example. With um, you know, imagine the size of these organs. Some of them. There's one in Melbourne. It had to be built by giants. It's absolutely astounding size. So imagine that just belting out. You can feel it inside. You know, this is a, the technology that they were using, guys. This is. If you've been in some cathedrals in Britain, you can still feel it today. You know, it's like literally overwhelms you in some cases. But again, it's the same technology as fascia. It's the flip side of the coin. It's the good side of the coin, okay? The other side of the coin is destruction. But look at these beautiful examples. Of that. And they basically um, found them. You know, this is the whole thing with, um, you know, like when they come into a city and they say they founded the city, they're not lying. They found it. <laughs> okay? Yeah? Freemasonry. Yeah, you're right, it's Freemasonry, because you found it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Shit. Who is the power source for these? Sorry? What was the power source to get them? Eh. Bellows. 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 Yeah, that's the narrative, yeah. But they got giant bellows. I seen him in um in Hereford Cathedral when I went there to see the map of Mundi, the oldest oldest map in existence, and the organ blew my mind. And I just literally went behind a curtain to try and find out what all this was working, and they just had huge columns of bellows. I'm not talking like bellows, I'm talking huge columns that came down and created the sound. You released it with a pedal and then the air came up, filled them. I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, even, even that sim simple sort of technology was quite mind blowing, you know, to see how they, you know, they're supposed to be doing this. This is supposed to be all built by monks with copper chisels, all of this, uh, you know, this Gothic architecture, by the way. Yeah. And then they build fantastic things like this, for example absolutely beautiful but you can see the point the pipes pointing out into you know into the church itself you know and the church itself you know it's made on divine principles they put all sorts of sacred geometry into the building of the church and all of that you know will have an effect on the consciousness the, just you know the bible will tell you the sound and vibration does take architecture down the narrative with jericho what happened? An army, they went round the outskirts of the city, they blew trumpets, they banged drums, they caused, vib caused vibrations, and the walls, they just fell down. Because of vibration, same as what you do with a, an opera singer with a, with a glass. Sound, a cer certain uh, frequency, it can deaggregate, it can cause destruction. They know this, they know this. So, um, I don't know, am I okay for time here at all? You're good. Thank you, Jason. So I'm just going to show you some old maps. Now, what it shows in some of these old maps, these are late 1400s. This is a beautiful color uh, illustrated map, but it shows you there's no snow 
in Israel. This doesn't seem to be any snow. And what it does show you is a green and arid world. Okay, so it seems to be that there's a large land mass above us, and we see this on so many maps. The Mercators, they're supposed to be four continents, it's supposed to be the Hyperborean, there's supposed to be all of this going on. But it's weird how many you know maps show you that they're supposed to be these lands. Were they there? Have they been flooded out? Possibly. So what you see, you can look at Africa, it's all green. Okay, places that are supposed to be desert in the modern day in these maps are um, more seasonal. They have deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves in winter. So this is a, a Nazimba for like a distant butterfly map. Um, so it's looking down North Pole's perspe perspective, but you know, all of this is supposed to be happening. There's no break for where the Bering Straits is, you know, sort of North America is sort of connected to Europe somehow. But we've been following, I, I went live on Jason's channel the other day doing a sort of chronology of maps and they show, you know, Island California, um, a giant lake in the interior of Australia, a giant lake in Oregon. You know, since these maps, there's been, you know, we've been, you know, done, you know, whoever done the photography for them since then. The world has been utterly decimated. So what you see here, this is Bavaria, North Africa, and you see European style glittering palaces. The whole place is green. This is supposed to be Morocco, you know, and Algeria, etc. This is supposed to be a deserty place. And you'll see sort of British style trees, you know, oak trees, etc. You don't see like pan trees. So it's a green and beautiful country, okay? And something really bad happens. Okay, and wiped out that civilization. The population, apparently there's a guy running around being chased by a massive beastie, which sort of, I don't know what that is, um, naked, you always find that, with a blue cap on. So is the way of things in North Africa. But these are Caucasian, and they're occupied in North Africa, and the palaces, they're just like European, um, sort of Gothic-style, beautiful ch uh, church machines, I gather, as well, and buildings in Africa. And these mountain ranges, one of them is called Kong, um, it's no, no longer there. And these trees are not really what you think of for Africa. Nowadays, it's dust, okay? And let me just flick through one or two. Dust, okay? There's a nice little picture <laughs> of a lady in dust. It is dust because they have dust storms. They don't have sandstorms, they have dust storms. That, that, that place got reduced to dust. Okay? And there's a lot of antiquity, a lot of classical architecture, and a, an entire older world that's been blitzed in the Sahara Desert. Okay, weather manipulation since the 1800s, you can find them in plenty of French books and stuff, that they had them on trains, large organized generators, if you like. Or in, you know, they got one, NASA have one of these at the moment, which can create massive clouds and storms. In front of your very eyes, you can see it on YouTube, but they had it in the past. These things that can generate weather, they've been doing it all along. Okay, and that's another narrative I've been talking about. It's this anomaly with these two sons. I just found only two days ago, someone sent me a lot of newspaper cuttings. These, as, as, you know, these um, atmospherical phenomena that are happening um, in 1700s, in the 1800s, where the sun seems to be reflected and seems to be that there's two suns. And um, we've had loads of ideas on my channel of what is going on with that. But, the, you know, I've got an overwhelming amount of evidence that this seems to be happening. Not that I've seen it myself. Antiquity. So in the age of Tataria, people go to the beach and they go fully clothed. No one is taking any clothes off. And um, I can imagine it's being pretty warm. The women, the long crinoline gowns, that's a technology in itself as well, guys. Okay, a lot of this clothing is. And felt, for example, is treated with mercury to give it electromagnetic properties. A lot of this clothing, as I showed on my channel, is a technology. So they all go to the beach, but they all cover up. Why? Why? Is it the law that they can expose themselves on the beach at that time? Or maybe a little bit later? Or can they cope with the sun? Is the sun something that is new to them? Because they're new to this realm and they're new to this sun. Therefore, they are not of this sun. People do burn in this place. So, um, you know, it seems to be uh, an issue with the sun if you get too much of it, almost as if we're not you know, designed for this place. So that's a really early picture of Boston before it was destroyed in its apocalyptic fire from a blue, and it's 1860. So they're taking aerial bird's eye photographs of cities in 1860. I think it's safe to presume that they could do damage from a Zeppelin using a flash exactly the same manner. 
So um, the Book of Wonders also shows um, these crazy atmospheric phenomena, everything from three suns, comets, which I talk about on my channel because I don't think it's what they're saying at all. I think there's something else going on. Again, I think that's an electromagnetic technology because when that comes in, um, there's a reset, there's a change in monarchy. That's some, another marker for a reset. There's always a change in monarchy. That's just happened in Britain, every reset that happens. All of that weirdness that just happened, I can't help just thinking that there was some sort of test to see how the population respond to something that's later on down the line so they can just, you know, see if they can just lock everybody in, you know? It's something along those lines. That, that, that didn't ring true what happened. There's something else definitely, you know, at first I thought it was about the blood. I thought they just want to test everyone and just looking for something in the population, you know? That's what I was thinking was going on with all these tests. But I definitely think what we think, I think there was something else going on. I do think it was, it was like a jade hat. You know, some sort of, you know, get the people ready to simulate that. Anyway, that's my lot for, for now. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being patient. Thank you so much. Wish, wish you to all. Thank you. Hey, y'all see what I've been dealing with for about 30 days? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think they were actors. I think that the whole thing is fabricated. So that's what I was going to ask. I've got my channel. Look at it. Just study it. There's something really off. Okay, and they know yeah, it's coming. No journals. I would think if you were a person coming out of, you know, out of the underworld, coming out, would there be a journal of this? There's no journals. Mind control. They don't know anything. They don't know. Listen, you don't know what's happened yesterday. This place, you just, not what you think. These people have to interpret. They just look into the open trains. They're 30,000 a week, tuning up into city. Nobody knows where they come from. And they're doing incubators. They're just turning they were, up. I was going to ask wait. you, like, you know, they were in the, the world of air. Incubator babies were. Did you yeah. see the water therapy? Yeah. I need to smoke a minute. Oh, sorry. Uh, I said in Barcadero uh, because that means that's where the people in I wanted to show you the link of the world. Yeah, I know. Two fast shades. It's on my channel. I know. And then um, also Washington's uh, with the giant cachets in um, the House of Congress out in the past. And even Coy Tower in San Francisco, places that were modeled after a fire nozzle. No, it's really like that. But you have to read those in the book. And the baby does have a cabbage patch. Yes! My friend Suzanne. And you know they have the cabbage patch baby? That was like
He's been um, monitoring the, the live stream. So he's been in there kind of like doing the moderate thing. So yeah, he's around now. Uh, we did get yeah, the we had uh, another four weeks. Oh, wow. Uh, I'd love to catch up. Oh, for sure. And then uh, other songs for this. I'd love to play it. Cool. Uh, uh, and, and, but I don't know what the what the is on Jason and such a business. Well, so yeah, like uh, if there is going to be a little bit of a, uh, like some off time, like after the event, we usually take a bit of time off. Um, so the best thing to do is that uh, RK138 uh, email. That's the one that I like, is the, the most popular monitor. So, um, I'm trying to do it, yeah, it's so like, okay, you know, just kind of like, uh, people keep short to me, they have really much, like, you know, meet up with the guy who can be on the you know, you know, so, and, uh, you know, definitely want to see that and stuff like that, and, and, I got to take a risk of because we're staying with friends. Oh, okay. But when we left, we didn't know this. Oh, yeah. Well, it was kind of the last one. Mine and stuff. So we flew from Mexico to come here to this house. And there's a lift to open the place. Suits them better to meet up now. And the next four, three, four days, we don't want to play with them. Otherwise, we can come back to the house. Yeah. Before you actually go back to the house. Okay. Is it easy to find accommodation? Oh, it's so close. Yeah, I'm from a small town. Yeah, like, um, so uh, about as far north as you want to go on 45, looking for accommodation would be like, uh, probably spring or the woodlands, maybe the car road, or something like that. Places that are actually not working. But, uh, just so that you, you get a little bit further north of that, it kind of becomes. It's what it does, yeah. <laughs> we look like that, that's 
What's she doing? What is she calling me? Oh, oh thanks, John. She's getting my That's why I'm in there. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> 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 Probably not. Probably not. He's he's kind of he's a little bit weird about stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't know. You know. Be honest. Yeah. 
Basically, somebody just donated about 20 YouTube videos to you guys. So, I started with a little Q&A, and then Martin did his uh, presentation, which was very interesting. And I'm going to tell you now, the man's got 55,000 files full of the stuff he just, he just showed here. It's been blowing my mind. But uh, a year ago, I did a video on YouTube with Max here, and uh, it stayed on it stayed online for a while. But Max has some notoriety, and there seems to be a lot of people in the establishment that do not like this man, and they punish me for it. And, but I'm cool with that because uh, from 17 years old, I do have an extensive criminal history, and Max down his platform and defended me. And he earned my respect forever, forever after that. And he agreed to come and join Martin and I, which Martin hasn't really told you guys, but these guys have been in the truther community. They're, they're the original OGs. These guys have been around forever. Martin has always wanted to meet Max. They've done presentations together. They've been in communication for years. But until <laughs> Martin came to Texas and he's been staying with us, he finally got to meet Max. So, so I thought that was pretty special for Martin. It was a little emotional. I know Martin's a real tough guy. He's not going to admit it to you. But uh, truth be told, I don't even know where Martin is right now. Oh, here he comes. He's coming in the door now. So. So, to give, to, give you a little, to give you a little background how synchronicity works, when you're vibrating on a certain frequency, you're automatically going to be put into situations of other people and situations themselves are on certain frequencies. So, a lady that I do not know, I have no history with, I, uh, I don't have a lot in common with her either, but we get along great. Cheryl Bailey. And she's here and she organized the first meetup on April 5th. Now, this is where it gets kind of unusual. I have produced a video about five months ago called Antiquitech Hidden in the Great Pyramid. And in that video, I showed a 100-year-old photo from an old book showing that it was already known that the Great Pyramid had a different entrance than the one that's promoted by academia today. The pictures you see of the front of the Great Pyramid, that is not the original entrance. I showed the photo in the video, and somebody corrected me and said, hey, well, they didn't correct me, they educated me. They said, hey, you use the word antiquity, did you know? that Martin Leakey was the first one to use that word on YouTube. So, I, I had never seen his videos. I didn't know who he was. But through Campbell in Australia, autodidactic, he had told me to get with Martin. But I got a lot of people telling me to get with different people. I'm just busy. So I didn't think it was ever going to happen. And then I'm talking to Cheryl Bailey one day, and she tells, she tells me that, uh, what would you uh when do you want to talk to Martin? I'm like, well, who are you talking about? 
She said, I'm talking about my boyfriend. So I said, who's your boyfriend? I said, Mark Leakey, Flat Earth British. I'm like, what? So the full circle all the way around. I didn't know any of this when she organized my meetup. I didn't even know. And, and, and it needs to be mentioned as, as well that when Cheryl organized the first meetup in Fort Worth, I had Matt contact her because she had sent us 100% of the proceeds, the money, and it didn't make sense to me. She's, she's the organizer. I believe people should get paid what they're worth. When they make the effort, they should receive the reward. So I thought there was a mistake, and I emailed her. I said, hey, would you, would you uh, uh, send me your PayPal? I need to send you about $2,000 back. Uh, she refused to take that money. She did it 100% pro bono and just put all that together. It really shocked us. Now, I'm not, I'm not into embarrassing people, but when I first started talking about Cheryl Betty, she was over there. <laughs> Look who she is now. She's <laughs> trying to hide. Tactical oh, retreats. Trying to hide. Retreats. <laughs> so, anyway, this is, the, this is just the synchronicity here. I had not met this man yet. I had no idea the affinities we would develop. Like you guys know, I'm not a flat earther. But I have absolutely no problem with the concepts because they do fit in with a simulated context. Anybody who's going to build a simulated world would first have to begin on a flat plane and then build up from that and build down. So I have no problem with it. And I have read Zetetic Astronomy. I have read Eric Dubay's work. I have it in my library. I've read Gleason from the 1890s. I've seen the scientific reports. I have followed. I understand the scientific atomic clock. Uh, research. So I have no problem with it. I'm still not a flat earther, but I'm, I'm on board with the flat plane. I'm on board with the fact that this world can be expanded by human consciousness. The more we build together, the more the world will reciprocate. So there's no issue with me there. And I did this video with Max in Tiquitech. Well, no, excuse me, I did the video about mentioning him in Tiquitech, and I found out he was the one that coined that word, and I wanted to meet him. And he came to Texas. Not for me, he came to Texas for Cheryl. But he's been living with me for 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, uh, a year ago, I had done another video, Reset Cities of the Deep, where Max and I, we discussed the evidence that there is a breakaway civilization. There is something going on below us and they have their own intelligence apparatus they have their own funding and what they do is they spend billions basically getting us to look up and try to answer all the anomalies that we've amassed by thinking these things are coming from space it's all misdirection the alien abduction phenomenon the ufos they all go in and out of caves caverns or bath bodies of water these things are going on underground and if you're base of operations is below the civilization that you're controlling, then of course you're going to want that civilization to believe in a whole false paradigm that these visitors are coming from somewhere else. So I spent, I spent a considerable amount of time when I was sick releasing the Anuma files where I laid out all my evidence in 40 videos that, well, that's really good audio right there. What, what just happened? Something, something just happened. So I laid out my evidence in 40 videos called the Anuma Files showing that the entire Anunnaki scenario promoted by Zechariah Sitchin is a cover story. Getting, getting the general population to believe in these, these aliens and all that stuff, but there's just nothing in the historical record that comports with his interpretation of the facts. What the, what the texts do convey is that people came up from the underworld with the infrastructure intact and they took over people who had lost everything. And they had primitive frames of reference because they had gone through a reset. Reset Cities of the Deep was a really good video. It is still online. You can watch it. Max and I are discussing all these things. It is on his channel, Bitch You, right? It's yeah. still, you still have it, right? <laughs> okay, the one I had on YouTube, I got a strike for it. YouTube take, took it down. But you can still see that video. And that's how I was introduced to Max. 
he, w- he wanted to do a chat with me, and this is what we talked about. So things come full circle. My independent history with Max had nothing to do with Martin, had nothing to do with Cheryl Bailey. And yet here we are all in the same room at the exact same time talking about it in retrospect. That's how it works. No effort was made whatsoever. Things just clicked into place. Clicked into place. And Max, being hard-headed, we offered him this and this and this and this and this and this, and he was still indecisive about coming. But there's something Max likes to do, and as soon as we offered that, he jumped on that plane. <laughs> so I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep this sanitized. Keep this sanitized as much as possible. But I just wanted to give all this background. I wanted to give it some context because introducing Max in the Archaics Forum, in tandem with Martin of Flat Earth British, this is a big deal for me. So I want y'all to, I want you guys to reflect that and welcome Max Eaton. Do I have to hold this up here? Is that better? Is it like is it okay down here? Yeah. It's okay then. This is kind of really short notice for me to be here. Like um they just kind of said, Hey, look, we're doing this thing, come up and say a few words, and suddenly, boy, are you doing a presentation by <laughs> So I don't have anything prepared at all. So we're just gonna talk about shit. <laughs> see where it goes, we can do some QA and just see what happens. The interesting thing about this whole whole thing though is that like this. This reality that we're in, this is a this is a mirror. This whole thing is an emotional mirror. And everything within nature and with everything is always kept within a state of balance. And when you look at the state of human consciousness and what we've kind of become as a society, you get to a point now where it's kind of a cleansing. It's kind of trying to keep things in balance again. You know, and we've been so neglectful of reality and neglectful of our place in reality, we've been so caught up in what Jason would call the construct rather than the, the energy and the, 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 the reality itself. We're caught up in the construct of what we value about the construct and what we believe our place within the construct is. And we reach this state of collective way of spiritual bankruptcy where we have to have this type of a cleansing. Something like this has to happen. You know, the world has been so ugly for so long but we've just allowed it to happen because of our own little bits of personal gain within the construct. But now it's getting to a point where it's just getting uglier and uglier and uglier. So well, how much are you prepared to take before you're prepared to do something about it? And what do you do about it? Well, what, what has happened, I believe, that's led us here is, is a loss of self. We've forgotten what we are. We've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten that there's really a single consciousness here experiencing itself as 7 billion people. Now, what an incredible thing to do to be able to explore this one mind reflectively in each other. We've forgotten all that. It's all become about this construct and its loss of self. So what we're seeing here is a kind of a, a soul purification experiment. And the way to get through it, like I've been hearing people say, what happens when it gets so depressing and it's so this and it's so dark and all this stuff's happening? As, as I've often said, the way to get through this realm and the way to get through this construct is to walk the path of the warrior, which means you've got to be able to face with serenity odds and circumstances that were not included in your calculations and simply do what needs to be done and walk into that chapter of your existence. Because it all comes with a lesson, it all comes with a message to lead you back to what you are. You know, we've given away too much of what it means to be us. As I often said, if you really want to change the world, all you've got to do is the right thing and all that you do. We all know what is right. Imagine if everybody on earth refused to comply with any agreement or legislation or any command or demand or anything which caused them to step outside their moral compass. You know, we don't need to change the world. We don't need to change the system. We need to change what's in here and how we approach everybody we come into contact with. This is how I finish every single radio show that I do, every broadcast I do, with in like catch. I am another yourself. We are reflections of each other. We are reflections of a single consciousness 
that is here to experience itself subjectively. And everything you don't like about me are aspects that you refuse to look at in yourself. Everything you don't like about reality are aspects that you refuse to look at within yourself. And if you're having a hard time with reality, you're getting depressed about things, things just aren't working, and you're getting stressed about it, reality's going to go, so well, really? Have a little bit more. Do you get it yet? <laughs> you know? yep. Do you understand yet? Why do you have a stake in the outcome of it? All you did is come to you to die. All you did was come to you for this breath to find out who and what you are and if you're worth it, if you can pass this exam to get to what's on the other side because that's the main event. This is just the test. And we're reaching a point where collectively as one human expression of a single mind experiencing itself subjectively, a lot of sections of this mentality, a lot of sections of this consciousness are not, not passing the test. So how do you get rid of it? How do you, how do you purify this, this single soul, this single spirit? We give the others the opportunity to kill themselves, to die off, to do what needs to be done, just get out of the picture. If you're getting in the way of, of progression forward towards the divine, towards back what we should be, that return to self, that remembering of who and what we are, well, you need to give it give it the choice to go, eliminate yourself, take the jab. We'll give you everything in the world you want to go and completely fuck your life up as much as you want and have it all. It's your choice. What are you going to do with it, you know? And that's why we're here. That's why we're in this situation. So this is a really big moment in history. It really is. And there's so much stuff coming out as well. With all the stuff that's coming out about the resets, ancient history, how many times I've done this. See, and I think, as Martin said earlier, there's nothing new under the sun. All this technology we're using is old technology. <laughs> I've often spoken about, who's, who's familiar with my Walker Talks and radio show? Many people. I've often talked about scrying mirrors and stuff like this, like these cell phones, these black mirrors. If you look at the stories of witchcrafts and covens and you know, witches and all this sort of stuff, they talk about scrying mirrors, these black mirrors that you look into, which tell you the future, the past, everything you need to know. And they talk about sigils that are used for signing demons. And when you talk, look about electricity, <coughs> ethereal energy, the type of energy that Tesla used, if Tesla isn't even a red herring, which I wonder whether he may have been, simply to cover up the fact that there's all this tech lying around the world that you're not supposed to know about, but it was just gone. He never wrote anything down, so forget about it. You know? Or whether he just still had access to that knowledge, whatever. <clears throat> but there's that type of ethereal energy, and then there's the type of electricity we create, which native tribal people will tell you is a demon. It's, a, it's an uncontrollable force. It's not the, the proper energy that we're made of. This is stuff that's magnetically driven. It's, it's, you know, it's not really what we're supposed to have. So they're saying this is such a demon. When you funnel this particular energy through these certain sigils, you bring other demons into life, and these scrying mirrors come into life, which tell you the future and the past. We sell ourselves to these scrying mirrors, and this becomes our system, and it steals our soul from our body into the mainframe. <coughs> All these legends about this. So when you look at the cell phones, what they really are, which of course is the scrying mirrors, because all the sigils look like cell phone circuitry, all these sigils for signing demons, all this sort of... You look at why would these legends exist? Why would any of these things exist if they hadn't done this before, over and over again? And each time we lose a bit more of what it was to be human, and look at what we did with the last civilization, the stuff that you've seen that Martin's been showing. That was just, just before the last reset. And look at what was probably there before that, the reset before that. And you're going back to these huge civilizations and pyramids and all these things that happened. And how far underground does this even go? All of this stuff. You know, you look at what we've got now, this square stucco. It's getting worse and worse every time, which is why this time is so important. Because I really don't know how many times there will be after this time. I and mean, how much of whatever this realm is that we live in is going to be here after the next reset? You know, I don't know what they're going to be doing to it. Because there's not much of it left. And it's almost like we're on, living in a floor of a mine in an enclosed area. Whatever this world is, it's much, much bigger than what they tell us. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And we're living in, in what is essentially an area that is a mine. And we're distracted by all this stuff. And we're just ripping it to pieces in order to support the system, what we think is real. But ultimately, what we've all forgotten is what we really came here for which is discover ourselves, to discover ourselves and to be all that we can be, to find out what it is that makes us who we are. 
That's what we've lost. That's everything I've done in, in my shows right since the very beginning. Is trying to prevent this happening, this scenario that we can see happening now from unfolding. We've been predicting this since the 9 11 attacks back in 2001. That was the beginning of the end game. Even since before then, we've been predicting this that was going to happen. And what it's really about is people remembering who and what they are to stop this, to see how easily we can actually stop this. You know, if we just knew what we were, knew who we, what we, what, what we are, you know, knew who and what we are, knew the power that we had, stop asking for permission for things. You know, the fact that we've never grown up as a society, the fact that we, we look at our government as parents and we just let them do all this stuff, when it would be so simple to change the world that nobody wants to change themselves. You know, people want freedom, but they don't understand what freedom is. Freedom is self-responsibility, responsibility for everything you are, everything you say, everything you do. Responsibility, I mean, you, you get the rulers that you deserve. You get the rulers because you don't take responsibility. So they take it where they want to take it. Yeah, and we believe in all this authority being real. So we just say yes or no, so three banks will so, And the, the earth goes on the way it is, you know. And we're just trained to be this way because we've forgotten who what we are. So, yeah, interesting situation, huh? How do we get out of it? What's the way through? Voting people in, voting people out. You know, I've been calling for non-compliance and all that sort of stuff for so long. But like I said, I mean, I've really changed the flow of the radio shows and all the stuff that I've done over the last couple of years since this whole COVID pandemic's happened. Because everything we were trying to do before that point was to prevent this from happening. So now it's happening. It's kind of got to go where it's going to go, which is why we have to stop complying with this as, as quickly as we can. We have to really find a way through. Find, and it's not even a matter of, of, of creating alternate communities and doing what we can. We've got to really become each other's friends throughout this community. See, we don't need to build alternate communities. We need to change this one mm. by changing our hearts and changing how we interact with people every day. But what do you do? So many people are NPCs. So I've been saying you've got to find a way of going grey as well. You've got to find a way of finding a way through the cracks coming out the other side of whatever's going to happen because we're really heading for some rough times folks the, the financial system the war in ukraine is systematically bringing these smart places everywhere in uh, in the uk now you need to scan qr codes to get into Aldi, into the supermarkets so you know while we're looking at the past and looking at history and all this sort of stuff which is incredibly fascinating and stuff that we need to know to know how we got here and to see how they've done this time and time again like I'm saying now, this this particular reset that we're in now, coming out of this on the other side, there's, there's going to be very, very little left of, of what was there in the past for us to even discover on the other side of this if a lot of this information isn't preserved, which is why it's so good there's people like Jason doing what he's doing, putting all this stuff together. And thanks for inviting me here too, guys. Like in such short notice and all the way you've done it, Mark and Jason. Thanks for it. Thanks for bringing me up here to speak to everybody. Like I said, I have no idea where I'm going with any of this. I'm just kind of winging it here, folks. But um, all this stuff. All this stuff needs to be preserved. I've even been suggesting people create time captures and things. But I'll tell you another, another interesting thing that I, I think I was discussing with you guys last night mm -hmm. is the fact that how they promoted English right around the world. Like English is the main language now. Everyone writes their books in, everyone writes their information in. And English is a really messed up language. It really is. Like just the spelling and, and the, the way the words are structured together and stuff, and it's backwards to all the other languages. And I've got a friend in, in Mexico who teaches Spanish and English. He says it's far, far harder to teach people English than it is to teach them Spanish. Because all of the words and the vowels, and it's just. And I reckon they've done this so that all these people writing the history of this time are going to leave it all written in English books. And people are going to come in the future and just going to go, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> What does O U G H mean? You know? so, many, like, so many different ways of spelling words and so many different meanings for different words and the same word with different meanings. So just forget it. Nobody's going to understand anything that happened in this time. So, you know, maybe start. Time capsules and, and videos, histograms and pictograms and things like that. Yeah. But uh, we need to we need to be able to preserve this information and get it get it to future generations. It's going to be tr tricky to do that. But I can't see any remedy coming from within this political system either, folks. The only remedy I can see is when this system completely crashes and burns, 
and people get back in touch with themselves again. Now, because whatever your persuasion is, whether you're a vegetarian, whether you're a meat eater, whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, whatever you are, I guarantee you're a trucketarian. Okay, you live off the food trucks. You don't know how to fend for yourself, which has been the most incredible thing that's happened in the last hundred years over our society. This is something I mentioned in my first film. Everybody's lost their life skills. Nobody knows how to actually do anything anymore. Nobody knows how to build a house. Nobody knows, knows how to build a shelter. No one has to just walk into the forest and, and survive the way your parents could, the way your grandparents could. Maybe not your parents, but your grandparents could just go out and, and walk into the jungle, walk into the forest, they build a shelter and survive. We can't do that. We haven't got the life skills we need to do anything. Most people can't even find their way around their own town without a GPS. They don't even know what the streets are called anymore. People just don't know anything anymore. They don't know how to cook, they don't know how to prepare food. They want to make something, it's always a can of this and a packet of that. Oh, okay. What if you have to put the can or the packet? How do you make the ingredient? How do, you, how do you chop the wood? How do you fish? How do you skin the fish? How do you, most people can't even plant a seed. They can't even grow food. You know, so these are the sorts of things you need to get back in touch with because the world's going in a, in, to another reset and there's going to be a lot of suffering. There's going to be a lot of people that don't make it through. I mean, with already what we've seen with this culling, this whole scandemic that they've done, all these injections they've been giving to people, you haven't even seen the beginning of this yet. A lot of people have been dying right around the world from these injections, but you haven't even begun to see it. There's people that are prematurely aging. People's bodies have, have lost the ability to repair themselves, a lot of people who've had this jab. And they're going to start dying of what appear to be unrelated illnesses. So this is going to happen over the next little while. There's even talk of 5G and, and viruses being released and all sorts of payloads in the vaccine. Who knows where it's going to go? And all the money they've been funding linked to weapons companies to send to Ukraine, so Russia can blow up the weapons. <coughs> it's sort of one big scam. <laughs> shredding money in Venezuela, shredding money in Nigeria, putting it in garbage piles, leading everybody into this cashless grid, getting rid of everybody's wealth and the cashless society that they're building. It's not going to matter how much money you've got in the bank, it's all going to turn into the CBDC. And if the CBDC's got a shelf life, it's got an expiry date, well, what do you need $100 million to get back for? It all falls fire within a year. Better off leaving it with us, the government, and we'll give it to you as you need it. Just fill out an application form to access your money. You know? So yeah. this is the way they're going to take it all, folks. So well, when you look at it, the system they're creating, it, it, it's so inhuman that, that it's, it's going to kill its own food source. That's where, that's where they're going to go. That's where they're going to take it. That's what it's all about. So it's up to you. If, if you don't want this to happen, or people have got to rally, you've got to pay attention to matters of state, you've got to rally your community, realise that there's no easy fix for this, there's no political remedy for this, you've just got to be prepared to stand with your community and refuse to comply. Even if it comes down to creating your own barter system, whether you use weed, whether you use fruit, whether you use whatever, but just holding your governments responsible for their actions, you know, and, and forgetting this whole government system. But how are you going to do that? It's got to crash. It's got to crash and burn. And uh, that's going to be ugly. So you know, you've got to be prepared for that. I mean, I don't know. I, I like to come and try to sell all these positive things with these talks. But we're in a really pretty tricky situation. Yeah, yeah. And it's nice to know what's going on. And I'm, I'm fascinated with history in the past. I love the work that these guys do. I really do. And I put a lot of effort into looking at all this stuff when I was uh, just before all the scandemic and everything as well. And I still like to know what's going on with a lot of it. Lot of, I'd like to put a lot of effort back into it. I hope to do some stuff with Jason and Martin while I'm here because uh, I'm going to leave again in a couple of days, go do some other stuff. Then I'm going to come back next week, probably spend a week here with these guys and, and look into some of this history stuff. But again, you know, we've got a clear and present danger. And I think that it, the, the most freaky part about it is how many people actually went along with this whole scam down and wore their masks like people running around in cars with masks on by themselves driving the <laughs> sure. you know, It's like you've been creating these uh, these uh, seat belts for the home couch for these people. So, <laughs> <laughs> they're terrified what's going to tell So uh, all sorts of stuff for these guys, good market for stuff. But um, I mean, this is this shows you. I mean, it's like George Carlin said. Imagine the most stupid people that you know. Imagine the most stupid person that you know. 
then realize that 90% of the world they are more stupid than that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're dealing with, unfortunately, that's what we're dealing with. And these people just put on their masks and they will drag us all on over the cliff. And they're using every single method they can to keep people distracted, keep people divided, while they depopulate, which is what the jabs are all about. It's what the LGBTQ thing is all about. I mean, what, how, how far down the crazy has that gone? A rainbow this, rainbow that, everywhere, transgenderizing your children at school, telling them they don't even have to go and tell their parents about it before they're even old enough to know what sexuality is. It's, it's, it's incredible how, how it's just there in your face and it's right in your face. Well, everyone's still distracted, looking down rabbit holes, pointing the finger and saying, it's the Jews, it's the Jesuits, it's the Freemasons. It's, it was all these people who did all these things. There's a lot of terrible people who've done a lot of terrible things. A lot of history's been hidden. A lot of stuff's been hidden. And like I've said to people so many times, they created this conspiracy culture I started in the 60s with the assassination of JFK and then all these fringe magazines started coming out and created this whole conspiracy culture because that's the best place to hide a real conspiracy, turn everything into a conspiracy, get everybody running in every rabbit hole they can and then call it the truth movement and give everybody different rabbit holes to go down so nobody knows what the truth is and everyone finds stuff that resonates with them and they go, I've got my truth. And I think this, and you would think that, but there's one point there that's wrong, so you're a shell. So this is, <laughs> yeah. and then it's just divide and conquer, divide and conquer, divide and conquer. And the real truth is that nobody knows what the truth is, and that's the truth. But nobody's prepared to admit that because they want their truth. And what the problem is, is that nobody has ever been free enough to know what the actual truth is. All we've got is little bits we can grab and put together. <laughs> And work out that this looks like a feasible picture. And then people will come in there and go, well, what about this detail? What about this detail? Let's argue about the details. And again, the right and conquer away goes again, further and further down the track. And that splinters off into other ones that splinters off. It should be the freedom movement. The freedom to find out what the truth is. And we have an opportunity for that because everything about this system has been laid bare. I mean, if you can't see what's going on now, honestly, who who, who could possibly believe? Anything that's happened in the last three years could really happen. If you wrote this into a movie and tried to publish it in 2018, people would go, bullshit, it's too far fetched now. Not even our publishers, no one would believe it, it's absolutely absurd. And yet, we give it three and a half years, two weeks to flatten the curve, folks. <laughs> Just stay home for two weeks to flatten the curve, they've got virus problems. <laughs> then we have transgenderized children, surveillance cameras, all their drones, surveillance, people dropping off with poison injections, kids cutting their penises off. Unbelievable stuff, you know? Two weeks to flatten the curve. Think of Biden up there, whatever that is, in the mask, different. Yeah, <laughs> it's still falling over the place all the time. Oh my lord, you know? <laughs> You can't make this shit up. You can't swear. You couldn't possibly swear. You couldn't. Yeah. 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 It's a joke. And Ukraine, what's going on in Ukraine? And, and Russia's just, just, just depopulating Ukraine. And they're, they're sending, so we're sending billions of dollars to Ukraine. No, you're not. You're giving billions of dollars to Raytheon, to Lockheed Martin. And they're sending all their old weapon stock over. There's been sitting on the shelf there for 34 years. I don't want any more. All these old bombs, we'll send them all over to Ukraine. I'll put them all in a big weapon stockpile in Russia with a bomb and bang, gone. <laughs> send more over there, you know. So they just send all their old stock over there for Russia to blow up. It's a joke. And then and Zelensky, this, this gay comedian, yeah. now he's the president of Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, <laughs> and beam me up, you know, wake me up when September ends. <laughs> so, it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. People are buying into any of this shit. Even the creep being a good guy. If Pete was a good guy, he would have gone and bombed Davos. They're all there. They're all there. Look, there's all the world leaders. Everyone I'm fighting a war against, all the leaders are in one spot. Gee, what am I going to do now? You know? Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's probably a lot of Trump lovers here. I don't trust Trump. So I don't think Trump is the Trump card. I mean, if Trump hadn't, I mean, if, oh, you prefer Hillary. No, it, it's a puppet show. It doesn't matter. Even with governments, like I've said so many times around the world, you've got to stop thinking of the world as nations and, and governments and countries. 
You've got this one big holding company masquerading as a system of nations and governments and countries, and they all play each other off against each other and tell us we need the government to protect us. Who from? All the other governments. It's all governments. It's just it's like China wants to come and invade the United States. No, it doesn't. China's a country full of people who don't give a shit about the United States. They just want to get on with their lives, same as everybody here. Doesn't give a shit about China. Might like fried rice, but you know. It's a bad idea, you know? Oh no, it's the government. Oh, terrible! You need us to protect you. Fuck off! You know, it's a joke. You need the government to protect you from the other governments. And they all tell you, oh, don't move anywhere else. Here's the best place to be. They're having financial trouble over there. You need us to protect you. It's a scam. It's racketeering. The whole thing's racketeering. It's a multinational, multi-generational holding company, which has created all these. Like they brought in passports after World War One. We didn't have border passports, no border controls, any of that sort of shit. They brought in income tax after World War One, just for three years, just to cover the cost of the war. Yeah. Well, three years to flatten yeah. the curve, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was in 19, 1914 or something, you know? Three years of income tax yeah. here just to cover the cost of the war, which was a big scam to begin with anyway. You know, if we need governments to protect us, and they brought in passports, and they brought in all this border control and all this sort of shit, we should just go and enjoy each other's cultures, and it was all good. No one wanted to invade anybody. This is an idea that governments cooked up so that we believe we needed them to protect us. Now they've done this whole war on terrorism thing and all this shit they've done to lead us to this point now where it's all turning into this whole global system where every single thing will be tracked and traced. And soon you're going to need you know, retinal scans and biometric scans in order to even log online. Your currency is going to be digital. I want to get rid of all cars, electric cars, keep you in your 15 minute zone. Your car won't work if you don't go outside your zone. Your money won't work if you don't go outside your zone. All this sort of stuff, all run by algorithms, leads you into that mainframe. And they do it every time. This is what the scrying mirrors, all this stuff. This is where we're getting back to what I was talking about at the start. This is what all these legends are all about. And when you see these sigils and you see this type of electricity being used, and you see these scrying mirrors in use, you're heading into another reset. This is where they harvest all the data from everybody, harvest everything about who you are, probably even scan you to create your next avatar that they probably pump out in their little foundling homes. Who knows where all these kids came from? Now, when we talk about cloning and DNA and all that sort of stuff, come along with these, these PCR swaps. Do these PCR swaps. I've talked about this before. If you're, no, total tangents here, folks. If your DNA is an antenna that is harvesting your frequency from the field, like I said, there's really only one of us here. It's a single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's a DNA antenna in my body that I experience as Max. Martin's got one in his body that he experiences as Martin. Jason's got one as Jason. But it all comes from the same source. If they come along and they give me a PCR swab, now they sample that DNA. This MIT test, this stuff that I had in my films back in 2008, 2010, showing how they're growing brain cells on circuit boards. So they can now put that DNA on that circuit board. If this DNA in my body is that antenna picking up that frequency from the field, they come along and they give me an mRNA injection. Now they've injected a piece of code into that antenna. They've changed the antenna. Now the antenna in my body is no longer tuned to that frequency in the field. That is now on their little PCR sample on their circuit board. So now my consciousness goes to their circuit board and they send out a new signal tuned to my DNA with that little extra piece of RNA antenna. They interfere with the signal. Now I'm thinking what they want me to think. Now I'm still here, but they can interject stuff into it. They can insert new pieces of thought into the code. I showed on one of my radio shows recently the patents going back to 1974 of mind control through radio frequency. 1974, he's talking about this show. I showed you patents going up as far as 2002 in that report. It's now 2023. What have they done in the last 21 years? You know, they can get in there, they can interfere with the code. So when you think about it, heading towards a reset, it's like Noah's Ark. What would it be? What, are you going to have all two of everything? Like, how big is this fucking art you're talking about? Oh, this has got to be some hell of <coughs> art, you know, so experimental. Well. But um, DNA, so, sample the DNA. You've got the code, you've got the frequency, you've scanned them, you've got everyone on Facebook doing all this retinal shit, you've got 3D avatars of everything. See, see the technology they've got. How difficult would it be to, to scan everybody's consciousness, put it in a mainframe, and then 
Where do all these kids come from and these families when all this stuff happens, when these resets happen? 90,000 families a year are pulling out of some places in like Florence, Italy. And that's just one, one town. There was, there was hundreds of them. You, know? you think about the underground bases that everybody knows is there, deep underground bases. Even given the timeline we've got for our industrial revolution, if things really happen the way they tell us, we develop all this machinery. Where, where in that timeline did they find the time to develop the machinery to dig all these big, huge underground bases? They were already there. Of course they were. They were already there. And I would say that's where the foundlings come from. They do these resets. The civilization gets to a certain point, a certain level of consciousness, whatever. It gets to a certain point where perhaps they're going to rebel, perhaps they're going to fight back. Who knows? Whatever it is that they harvest from us, get to a certain point of, of, of consciousness or depravity or whatever it is, the test, whatever it is, they get to a point where they do one of these resets, but they, they take off as much of that consciousness as they can. They, they keep it in the mainframe, and then they repopulate the world. And I think a lot of what we, we see as these families are very, I mean, it's very likely a lot of us are, are descended from genetically engineered humans. Perhaps something happens in that process over a few generations where we revert back more to a, a natural strain with a soul or whatever. I, mean, I don't know how it works. A lot of it's speculation, but uh, perhaps something like that happens. And I think that's what they do. And I think that's what a lot of the legends of the scrying mirrors and all this stuff is all about. To warn us when we see these things, you're about to go through another reset. You're about to go through another one of these events where they're going to be killing off a lot of you and taking a lot of your, your side. And I think a lot of people, that's why you can't wake them up, because they're already in the mainframe. They're already there. They, they don't know. It's like Westworld. Everyone watch Westworld? They show yeah. them the diagrams. Look, you're a robot. They know I can't see anything wrong here. You know? It's kind of like that. They, you, you'll, <laughs> you'll never get these people to see the truth because it conflicts with their reality too much. And they're probably already void of a soul. As much as you may love them, perhaps you're even a member of your family. You know, you've got to wonder if, if if some people don't even have souls drop in. Perhaps some of them are simply avatars to fill up space. So I think that who, whoever it is that's running this, whoever is doing these research, whatever the force is behind it, whatever you want to call it, this dark benevolent force or whatever, I think half the fun, because I think I've done this a few times, I, did, I destroyed the Hyperborean civilization. They destroyed the Atlantean culture, which I think came after that. I think there are there remnants of the Hyperborean civilization, which escaped the, the, the destruction of that into the Atlantean culture, and we're kind of in the end of the Atlantean age now. I think half the fun for those controllers is kind of playing needle in the haystack. They want to find where all the real souls are. You just go and find them, kill them, but it's, what's the fun in that, you know? So you sort of create a game out of it, you know? And so you do something like you, you, you create the truth movement. You create this big conspiracy culture. And then you create the 9-11 truth movement. Have 9-11. Why did they make 9-11 so obvious? They could have made 9-11 so it actually looked like it was done by six hijackers with Bob. They really could have done it properly, so you really could have believed it. But 9-11 was like, okay, are you awake out there? Like, here's a kick up the ass. If you're not awake yet to the fact that the world's run by criminals, have this. And 9-11 was like a wake-up call. And it created, the, the truth movement really took off after 9-11. It was a fishing exercise. And they wanted to find out who all the awake people were. Where's all the thinkers? Where's all the real minds? Because they're the ones we want. You know, so then they got everyone. They, they corralled them over onto YouTube. They were all this freedom. And then they... Move them all over the beach, you put them on echo chains, you've got tabs on everybody. It was a fishing exercise. The World Wide Web, the internet, international net, the World Wide Web. What are they looking for? What do you do with the net? What do you do with the web? You find the real souls, the ones that aren't NPCs, because they're the only people who are going to join the truth movement. Then you give them all different truths and get them all arguing and fighting amongst each other and get them trade with you once and do all that sort of shit, just time up in bullshit so they can track and trace all of them. Tabs on the wall, blah blah blah. We keep tabs on the real people. That's what I think 9 11, one of the reasons for it. I mean, to fund the war on terror, sure, to start the war on terror, war of terror. But like they made it so obvious, come on, so obvious. If you weren't awake, if we wake you up, you've got to question why. So there's all sorts of plays going on here, folks. And ultimately, 
if through it all, with all the research that you're looking at and all the stuff that you, the answers that you're seeking, you ultimately know it all yourself already. And very often we go down these rabbit holes, we're looking for validation because we don't believe in ourselves. We want, to, we want approval for what we believe, what we think is true from somebody else because we don't trust ourselves. So we go down these rabbit holes and we look for all this stuff to confirm what I already know. So I don't believe in myself. If we just would believe in ourselves and see that beauty in ourselves and see that beauty in others, most people are terrified of themselves. They're terrified of their own power. They're terrified of ever standing up and having their voice heard. They're terrified of actually ever having to take responsibility for their own lives. And sure, there's a lot of extenuating circumstances. People have paid to be alive or kept in this, this shitty little treadmill that they put us on. But, you know, there's, there's so much of this which is, is fiction. And when we want to do things in our lives, we think, I don't like my life, I don't want to be this way, I don't want to do this. Maybe something start thinking, well, I'd like to do that. And then we start thinking of all the reasons why we can't. And we put it where we're our own worst enemy. Yes, you can. You can actually just go and do anything you want to do. You can throw yourself to the wind and you can actually ride it if you throw yourself to it with no stake in the outcome. But what happens? Like I said, walk the path of the warrior. Face infinity without flinching. The knack of being able to face with serenity odds and circumstances that are not included in your calculations and simply see that as the next chapter of your life and move forward in that direction. The way consciousness dictates you should move. That's the way it works. You do that and all unfolds. Like I said, you throw yourself to the wind, you can ride it. No stake in the outcome. You only came here to discover your path and discover you and to be all you can be to the best of your ability and the best of your potential and the fullest of your potential. And everything that's happening in the world today is giving you an opportunity to do that. You know, and you come into this world completely alone, you leave it completely alone. That's what you do with that information while you're here what you take with you, perhaps that final moment of where you make your final stand and what you do in that moment and how you face that is what it's really all about. Because this is just the exam. The real event comes later. You know? And through all the stuff that we do, it's this loss of self and this loss of belief in ourselves and this loss of love for ourselves, which has caused all this to happen. And when you really see the state of the world and see the state of, of, of the zombification of human consciousness, it's no wonder it's, it's, it's got to where it is. And all we've got to do is see it as the opportunity that it's given to us. But again, it's, it's an individual opportunity. I mean, I do what I can because, sure, I, I can see a better way for the human race. I'd love to see the human race wake up and create this paradise we could create because we are certainly capable of it. But that's just, I guess that's just me because I'm an empath because ultimately it's up to each single individual to do it for themselves. It's all up to them. Now, all I can do is offer suggestions. That's all you can ever do. Lead by example and all that you can be and offer suggestion to people. This is why in all my shows and stuff, I go, I hardly ever say this is, this is, and this is, and this is. I just ask questions and I try to encourage other people to ask questions. <laughs> because when you ask questions, the answers come to you because the real truth must be realized. You can never tell someone the truth. They won't believe you. They'll argue with you. They'll have questions. <laughs> So you cause them to ask the right question. Just, just lead them in that direction so it isn't your way. And you can choose to walk through that doorway when you're ready to and ask these questions. And you'll discover incredible things about yourself. And that's really what it's all about. So, you know, as much as I want the world to wake up, if it doesn't, I have no stake in that. I have no stake in the outcome. The only thing that I have a stake in is my own spiritual path through this realm and what I do with that. Whether I've improved this realm by my presence in it whether I've healed someone, made someone's life easier because I'm alive, perhaps helped someone find their way to their path, to their self. That's really what it's about, and that's the best I can do. And that's really all I have to give because, you know, in my cash, I'm another yourself. Ultimately, I'm just a fuck up like everybody else. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. We're all trying to figure it out, you know. But that's half the fun, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, I mean, that's probably about all I want to share with you. And uh, I hope you got something from it. Any questions? Thanks, Cynthia. Good evening, Stuart. I've got out to a couple of special acts and friends, David Hyde. David Hyde. And, and uh, Rishad Bashar has recently passed and tried to. Who? Rashid Batar. Rashid Batar. Yeah, it's a bit of a sad thing that happened to Rashid Batar. 
it's, uh, it's very sad what happened to Rashid. I don't know what, I think they probably did kill him. It, uh, it would seem very strange that he just died the way he did. He was actually saying that he, he expected payloads to be released within the vaccine. That that's what the whole 5G thing was all about. Well, well, payloads, within the jab, there's probably certain payloads that are in there. It could be like little viral loads, like Marburg's, or, or certain things that will happen. Like I said, with the, with the jab, I mean, what the jab has essentially done, by, by putting this piece of mRNA into your DNA code, it stopped your body's ability to repair itself, basically. So this mRNA, this message mRNA, is only going to be producing what ever they tell it to produce, which could be triggered through 5G, through through certain, I mean, 5G is simply fifth generation, could be triggered through millimeter waves, through different applications of like from the 16 to 18 gigahertz frequency of millimeter waves. They could specifically target you, your body, any particular individual, because you can target with millimeter waves, you can target people individually. You can hit, you know, theoretically, you can hit someone with a particular frequency, which could release whatever payload is stored within that vaccine, which is due to be triggered by that frequency or set to be triggered by that frequency. In, in the 1970s, they injected DNA into rats and they were able to switch the genes on and off in the rats by hitting it with directed frequency, which would turn nanotech, turn the nanotech to switch the genes on and off. So if there's nanotech in the vaccines and they can hit you, perhaps it's something that would react to something like Marburg virus, which would cause you to decompose or whatever. You know, any, any sorts of things they can do. That's what Dr. Butai was speculating, that that's what they were going to do, and that's why all these 5G towers went out. That was the first thing they did in lockdown, when they said lock, lock down two weeks to find the curve, for three weeks or however it was. I read they were 24 hours a day putting on these 5G towers. What for? How do you need them to protect us from a virus, really? You know? No, it's just so that they've got this triggering mechanism. So that's, that's what Butai was talking about. But there's also the fact that, that um, um, by even putting this mRNA in there, you've, you've reduced the body's ability to be able to heal itself. Because every cell in your body renews itself every seven years. So this is why, you know, we, if we eat the right food and do the right things, there's no reason why we really should age. It's all part of your belief system. They tell you that you age, so I can age. You know? They tell you every time the sun goes around, on the, moon, the earth goes around the sun, you get another year older. Pope, Pope uh, Gregory said so. <laughs> okay, I better get hold of it, you know. That's the way it works, you know. So, I don't know, it's a belief system. It's like Jason was saying, we project this, we, we, we create what we believe reality to be. If enough people believe the earth is flat and it's in a dome and you can't get out and there's an house for all and you've got to do all these things and these Ten Commandments where you're going to go to hell, that's, that's, where, that's, that's where you'll be. If enough people believe that, you can believe the earth is anything it was. It, it's, it's a single consciousness creating a projection and everybody draws off that energy to create a similar projection, you know? So that, that's how reality works. It can be anything we want it to be. So thanks. Yes, anyway, I'm getting off on the So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on uh, the alternative history and um, Tartaria and why, why do you think it's so important to cover that up? Because it shows the power that we have. It shows what's possible. It shows that this is this is such bullshit. Everything, everything they give us is bullshit. What woke me up? I woke up when I was four years old. When I was, like, my mother took me up into the rainforest, or into the forest, and uh, I said to her, well, "This is incredible. Why can't we come and live here? Why are we living? Why are we living here in town?" And she said, um, "Oh, we can't live here because we don't own the land." I went, "Own the land." What do you mean own the land? She said, we've got to own the land. And I'm going, who owns the land? She said, the government does. And I said, how did they get it? <laughs> <laughs> she said, you'll understand when you get older. And I was shocked. And I was walking around the yard with my teddy bear that afternoon. I had my kid with my best friend. And I'm saying, Teddy, it's all fucked up. It's all fucked up. There's people who think they can own the land. Can you tell God that he's put me on the wrong world? Yeah. He's taken off this world and put me back onto the other world where people don't think they can own the land. Yeah. So when you look at that and, and you see what we have 
And just that attitude. And I was looking at the world from that point on, going, it's a madhouse. I'm living in a madhouse. Everybody's inside. They're all crazy. Um, if we had access to free energy, I mean, imagine if you could just walk in, into the forest anywhere you want and you could just put up a little device and a resonator and you could build yourself a castle and just do it, let, levitate stones and just, just create a kingdom. Well, that's not very good for Joe Biden. How does FEMA going to work with you in that situation? And how, you know, that's why it's so dangerous to them. I mean, we. Even, even when you look at the beauty of the buildings from that, that Tartarian era, if people were actually paying for labour, and you have to get carpenters in there, no, you'd never build buildings like that if you're working by the hour, an hourly rate. You'd just be getting it functional. People used to build that stuff because they love to build, because beauty is actually a function. Beauty is actually a function of a creation. When you're living in a, in a world of beauty, you, your soul is expands and it's expansive. You can create. You can become all that you can be, and if you can become all that you can be, you sure as hell don't need rulers. So that's why they don't want you to uh, know about any of this sort of stuff. Oh no, we're at the pinnacle of our civilization now. This is the best it gets. It's the best we've ever done. Look at the quality of these walls. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> gothic shit. Look at this. Uh, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. We're sending men to the moon, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> so, where do you, you feel like there has, that they've just lost so much, when I say they, the rulers that are not meant to be, that they've just lost so much respect for us now that they've just, they're just throwing all this Biden mask people and all the trannies in, well, they, you know, they, like. They know they can get away with it. But it and it's also anybody in, in here in the truth movement, like, the freedom movement, let's change it to that. But anybody out here, it's also demoralizing for people like us. Oh my God, look what they're doing. They're just they're, they're controlling. That's why they put the symbolism in here. It's put the eye in all the movies and all this. Stuff. Oh my God, they're mass control. They're everywhere. The reason they put all the symbolism in everything everywhere is so you'll keep looking for it. Oh, look at that. I spotted one. I'm not taking any responsibility for my life or doing anything to change. I'm looking for the symbolism. <laughs> That's how the symbolism controls you. People say well, it's a magic spell they use to control you. How? Because you keep freaking looking for it. <laughs> That's how it controls you. You know, in the old days, we go, well, there's a freaking problem here. Let's pick up our guns and go and fix this freaking problem. <laughs> you know? Now, so I'm looking for the new symbolism. I'll get a sign. You know, I can see where the ball oh, is. This going to happen? Yeah, it happens, and you didn't do anything about it. Wouldn't you have maybe done something about it? You know, it's it's, well, it's how they control your folks. So you know, yeah. Um, I want to roll back to what you were saying about the five G and sickness. Have you read that book, uh, *The Universal Rainbow* by Arthur Kurstenberg, where mm -hmm. he goes all the way back to the seventeen hundreds and talks yeah. about the relationship of uh, electricity and right, uh, all the way yeah. up to now? Yeah, yeah. I think the there's a lot of credence to that. It was a really fascinating book. I didn't know how much you knew. It's, it's, it's all the all wrong type of energy that we're immersing ourselves in, you know. All the stuff that they give us like, when radar first. There's always been plagues and pandemics or whatever. There's been great waves of sickness whenever they've introduced new forms of electricity. Even the, the um, alternate current electricity we're using now, Tesla said this is the wrong type of electricity. We should stop using it. So, yeah, I think there's a lot to that. Yeah. Um, so there's people who are awake, and there's people who are trans-vaccinated, and trans <laughs> how are we all going into the friendship? Is it the same reality? Obviously not right now, but will we be in the same realm, or will we be separate? It's, it's hard to say, like, it's really hard to, I mean, I can only speculate on any of that sort of stuff. Um, different timelines and different realms, and I can only speculate, and, and really, I don't have any first-hand knowledge to go on that I can actually give you, which could contribute anything to the question. Um, all I would really do would be muddy the waters with further speculation based on my speculation or other people's speculation. <laughs> it's not when people ask me about aliens and stuff. Now, I've seen UFOs in the sky, who drives them, I don't know. And all I can really do is give you my interpretation of other people's speculation, which doesn't help anything. You know? And people say, well, Max said this, no, I didn't. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, 
I, I wonder about all the timeline stuff, even with the Mandela experiment, the Mandela effect, and all that sort of stuff. Who's heard of the Mandela effect? Lots of stuff changing, and, it, and I've experienced this as well. But well, what was that? Was that, was, that a, a, was that us physically moving timelines, or was that a, 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 an experiment in memory? Did they, did they target certain people with certain computing monitors or with certain mindsets or whatever, and simply replace memories in them? I mean, was that what, the first of what they're doing now with with everything that is possible? Like, well, have you looked at the um, the West Point lecture, Charles Morgan? We was talking about driving people like drones and replacing memories in people. They have one guy sitting in a room operating a typewriter, and the guy in the next room, his hands were, were doing it. They can literally get in and drive people like drones. And this is all totally on the table. This is back in 2018. They can do this. We weren't saying this is an experiment. So you drop the Charles Morgan West Point. It's a brown, brown room. He's got a big blackboard there. And he's, have a look at that. It's mind blowing. 2018. They can literally drive people like human drones. These aren't these kids going and shooting up these high schools, and then they're going, "Well, what was happening? Were they someone driving them? All they got to do is put some nanotech in it, give them a vaccine. Suddenly they're off doing this sort of shit. I mean, this stuff's totally possible. And uh, so, yeah, who, who knows?" Uh, Matt, uh, you mentioned a couple things about uh, walking the path of the warrior, as strength with serenity as a potential <laughs> solution, also uh, getting in touch with our real self. Can you share some more thoughts or suggestions as far as how to overcome this or, or you know, well, it's, it's like I said, the best we can? It's like I said, walking the path of the warrior is being able to face with serenity Odds and circumstances that are not included in your calculation. So something happens. It's not when I had to leave Australia. I just had to leave. But bang, I've got to leave. Shit, I've got to leave all this shit behind. I'm prepping all this shit. I'm just got to do it. I just got to walk into the water. I got onto an aircraft. There was eight people on the plane. Trying to see the aircraft. Coming to Mexico, I didn't even know there was going to be anyone there. Just picking up at the airport. Can't speak the language. Just arrived here. A week after I got here, they shut all my bank accounts down. You know? So you just, okay. Now I'm doing this. It's like even if I if I got arrested and I got taken to jail, God forbid, I'd be going, okay, well, here I am in jail now. This is my opportunity for meditation, you know, reflection. Well, this is the next chapter I'm in now. You know, the, the money the whole system's collapsed. Okay, well, this is the chapter that I'm in now. I've got the life skills so I can pick up this rope with this piece of wood in this town. I've got a forest. I don't have a good shelter, I don't have a fish. This mango's fallen off the trees. I'm good. It's, it's whatever happens, it's simply the next part of the journey. So we have a stake in the outcome of everything we do. We have this plan, I'm going to do this, I'm going to build this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to create this thing, and it's going to lead me to here. And when it doesn't, we fall apart, oh my God, it's all, it's all fucked up. You know? Well, no, you just, you just walk apart. Once you even create a project, you think it's going to lead you to that point. Once you create that project, you, you, you've given something a life of its own. So now it's going to go where it wants to go. If you give it the opportunity to be its own life and to grow and to grow with it, it might take you places that you never dreamed. It might not be end up in the vision that you want to, but it might end up something so much better because you allowed it to take on its own life and you had no stake in the outcome. So you just kind of went with the flow and faced infinity without flinching, a world of infinite possibility. Any second, an infinite number of things could happen in that second. Are you prepared to simply step into that reality and go, well, this is the next chapter now? This is where I'm going. This is part of my path. That's why I'm here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. That's how it works. If you can adopt that approach, like I said, if you throw yourself to the wind, you can ride it. Because you've got no stake in the outcome. That wind could take you anywhere. It will take you places you never even dreamed you could go, and you learn things you ever dreamed you could know because you're open to it. And people say to me, you do all these things, mate. You go around the world and do all this stuff. How do you do it if you don't ever have any plans? They go, well, it's because I have no stake in the outcome when I throw myself to the wind. If I had plans, I never would have done any of this shit because I would have had other plans. <laughs> that's kind of how it works. So and it's not even having faith, it's just knowing. It's just knowing that's how it works. If you know how it works, you don't have to believe it. I believe that if I do this, it's going to win that one. You fucked up. You believe it. Have some more. 
didn't work that way. Yeah, and people say, you know, I'm trying to believe what you say. Why well, are you trying to believe? <laughs> to analyze the sentence. You know, I'm trying to believe what you know. If you know it, you don't need to try and believe it. Why are you trying to convince yourself to believe something that you don't know? This is kind of counterproductive. If you do it, you wouldn't have to try to believe it at all. Belief doesn't, I mean, knowledge doesn't require any belief. Yeah. <laughs> I just know how the universe works, so I don't even think about it. You know, it's all a mirror, it's all an emotional mirror. And, and, and you know, if you, it's like the way prayer works, the true nature of prayer. You know, if, if you're someone looking for your perfect relationship, what would it feel like to be in a relationship with that person who's perfect for you? Just put yourself in that state, they're already in your life. What would it feel like? How would, how would you change? How would you feel inside if that person was there present in your life? And live your life in that space, they're already there. Within a very short time, that person will walk into your life. I'll just walk in. You won't even have to look for them. I'll just walk in. Because you're resonating that it's a mirror. When, you, when you're lonely and you're saying, I need love, you're acknowledging you have no love. You pray for peace. You pray for wealth. You acknowledge you have no love. You have no peace. You have no wealth. It's a negative affirmation. You put yourself in a state where you don't care about money. Money's just this barrier between you and shit. It just, it just, it just forget about it. You know? it's, it's a, money's there to provide scarcity. It provides a barrier between you and the abundance of the earth. If you don't have this stuff, you can't have that fruit that's growing right there on the tree. What the fuck? What? <laughs> just, what? I don't have this thing? I have to step over this little paper thing to get to the fruit. It's, it's you know it's it's a barrier it creates scarcity so you don't the more you, you stress about not having money the harder it's going to be for you to get money the more you stress about not having someone to love the harder it's going to be for you to find someone to love the more you stress about anything the universe is just going to say well, there's some more do you get it yet it's a mirror it's an emotional mirror you know, so you put yourself in the state of prayer has already been answered your entire life is a prayer you're a living walking prayer Every moment of every day, every breath you take is a prayer. There's a conversation going on between you and reality. It's an electro electromagnetic conversation that most people aren't even aware that they're speaking. But yeah, you get it. You get intuition. You know, listen to it. You know, you, you know, you're going to lose your wallet if you keep doing that. And in that day, you lose your wallet. You know, why the fuck didn't I listen? <laughs> you ever have that? Yeah. I'm sure if I keep doing that, I'm going to break that. And you do. It told you. You know, <laughs> but you don't listen because we've got the language you know, and you're speaking your, your heart is speaking there's an electromagnetic generator and it's having a conversation to reality you are creating that re reality by the emotional input you think of your brain your brain is a is, is a quantum instrument that turns possibility into actuality based on the information that it receives from your heart you have a thought in your brain you imbue that thought with emotion that sends neuropeptides to your heart, which projects that reality for you. That's how it works. It's a quantum relationship. But there's a, this electromagnetic conversation going on all the time. So, you know, and having a stake in the outcome, you're in a constant state of fear. You're in your mind all the time. Shit isn't going to be the way I want it. You're in fear of what may happen in the future or in, or in trepidation about what happened in the past, neither would you say now. So you're, you're in fear of the non-existential. We call that insanity. Fear is not existential. It doesn't exist, but I'm terrified of it. It doesn't exist right now. It's all in your mind. It's people lost in, the, in, in their mind. They're, they're too afraid to live. They're too afraid to die. They're too afraid to get on with their lives because of what may happen or what did happen. They're not in the now. Not in the moment. And the moment's the only place they ever actually are, but they're never there. Their mind's never there anyway. Their mind's always somewhere else, away from where they are. So is there any wonder that we're going to the state that we're in? Anyway, I'm going off on weird tangents here. <laughs> yeah. So that's about it, I think, hey? Are we done? Thanks, folks. told me 45 minutes ago, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Specifically asked him, hey, you got an idea what you're going to talk about? 
I'll have a clue until the other don't come out. <laughs> you did a good job. That's good. That's good. Okay. We're going to take another break because you're going to need it. It's <laughs> so, all. I'm going to need it. I need to use a restroom. I told you about Martin and I making a discovery, and I end. That's not hyperbole. We, 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 are, we are on to something. Well, we're going to make this a group effort. Yeah. We're going to present some data, and we're going to let you guys decide what we found. That's because impossible. we're going to first make this assertion. After the break, we're going to come back, and Martin and I pledge that we're about to reveal enough information for you to decide that the Great Pyramid, I'm mean, excuse me, that the Great Wall of China isn't even a wall and it's not even Chinese. This is charged and it just stinks. Yeah, I'm not the box broke. I don't have a safe out of short. And I gotta tell Martin a new uh we sign up. You got more, okay. Oh, I can't believe you got my phone. Yeah. What should I put on it? Two buddy and terror. Uh, couple of things, yeah? Yeah. And what? Terra, T A R A. Always like that, I thought you had something like that. Uh, double flat. Oh, oh no, I always write that. Oily, oily. <laughs> I, I always write double flat. <laughs> this is something I do. Okay, I gotta tell you about new girlfriend job. Okay, so my girlfriend, get ready to get it on. She says, Hey, do you have anything? I said, Hey, I just went to the doctor last week. She's like, Okay. What I didn't tell her was, I got everything. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> I left that little bit out. And I, oh, you forgot, you're in the club now. Head right, of the dog, brother. Oh, head of the dog. <laughs> Like you get another margarita, put that on, you'll feel better. Oh, thank you, my brother. No, I fucking did kill me that margarita. Yeah, I'm going to find the player. Hi, Blair. Hi, Dex. That's all you do. 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 What did you make? I was I I think what you did for costumes. Why you pull that apart? Why you been? Why you has been playing punches? It's not right, yeah, Awesome. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you.
That was awesome, Max. Yeah. Is there a kernel yeah. to discombobulate? Back, no. That was exactly what was needed. Thank you, sir. Oh, oh. Uh, yeah. I charge your microphone. <laughs> Um, Thank <laughs> you. 
Shit. Oh, no. All right. It's what? It's messing my shit up. I'm trying to concentrate on something. I mean, I'll do it in a minute. Okay. Okay. It's just, it's just, I'm yeah. not Yeah, 
Myself right out. I'm oh, yeah. a girl, right? Now, but I'm just trying to be polite. It's like, oh, it's like that was really hard. Just do it. It's outside, guys. It's not easy to get outside. No, it's not. Right. Right, 
in our personal time. <coughs> Martin and I weren't going in this direction. We weren't even interested in the Great Wall of China. One, because there's walls all over the world. And two, there wasn't anything Chinese that he and I had an interest in. But then something started happening. And we started questioning the story that's passed down to us about who actually built that wall. And we come to find out that we're looking at something totally different. We're looking at a narrative that was very carefully constructed and that it actually has no historical value. We are told that in 220 BC, a Chinese emperor set out and burned every single book he could find in the Chinese empire and killed the people who were in possession of all the libraries. We are told a narrative that this same emperor only ruled 10 years. And yet, in that 10 years, he built 1,200 miles of what you see here. This is what the official narrative is. This is what you can Google. This is what you're going to find in almost all the books. So you guys know I collect old books, have an old library, and I pulled this information out of a book from the 1890s. So the narrative was already fixed then, too. The problem is, is what we found out about this structure does not in any way comport with this narrative. So we're going to show you some pictures and explain what you're seeing. We're not going to force an interpretation where it doesn't belong. We're going to let you draw the conclusions. Martin, why don't you show them the maps of the Great Pyramid? Show me the Great Wall. Show. Can we turn the lights off? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. No lights. Okay. Okay. Those lights in the back are a different switch. Not these. Not these. There are 5,000 miles of this construction. I'm not going to call it a wall anymore because that's what they want you to believe that it is. We're going to show you otherwise. There are 5,000 miles of this construction here. In the official narrative, although there's no, it has no historical value and there's nothing that you can look up in any books, you'll never find any archaeological studies the official narrative is, is this great construction going over 5,000 miles was built to keep the nomads out. To, it was built to keep the Tartars out. It was built to keep the Mongols out. Let me know when you get to the end of your maps. Now, here's an old map here from antiquity uh, with the walls that we were running. But they say 5,000 miles, but there's there's a few branch, few bits that branch off, and if you add it all together, they say it's closer to 20,000 miles of the wall. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's insane. Um, I found some evidence also of, um, <coughs> coincidentally, we were going to be mentioning the Silk Road along the way. Um, this is a, another Great Wall of China, only it's not in China, it crosses the Caucasus. <coughs> Um, on the Southern Silk Road route in the Caucasus Mountains. So there's another wall further east as well. And as uh, Jason said, apparently to repel um, the Mongol hordes, which is no evidence what, whatsoever. And the evidence shows that the Mongols, anyway, had an advanced civilization and were nowhere, you know, what they say about, you know, and how to control people, including Genghis Khan. So, Jason? So we need to go back to, to first causes. We need to go back to beginnings. In order to understand the construction we're looking at, Martin, show them the two different types of construction used. Newer, newer materials are built over much more ancient, gigantic blocks. Yeah, I'll show you that now. So um, I found um, an old, really old actually, photographic collection of said uh, 
instead of wall, <laughs> um, and they show you the stones which the thing is actually built on in the first place, which is an older stone. Um, I'll just find that for you a second. Of course, any folder does not. Uh, okay. So. Now, these photos here show you uh, that the thing just ends abruptly um, um, at the sea, at the seaside, basically. I'll show you a better color footage um, a little bit later. And I'll just show you that the stone underneath is far older and there's been many replacements over time. I've counted three different stages of stone. But if you look at this image here, you know, the whole thing looks like it's an older structure. You know, these, you know, these massive stone sides look like they've been hewed or something rather than just a normal, natural, uh, you know, happening, geological happening. I don't think that. I think there's something else going on there. Um, I have got some images of older stone. Just give me a second. Because these files are actually all over the place. Um, I should have done them in a better sequence, but there you go. Uh, there you are, megalithic brickwork. So I found this image here of one of the openings, um, which will show you the structure of the stone is just giant megaliths at the bottom. If you have a look, you can see three stages here. So you've got the large stones at the bottom, then it comes up to red brick, and then there's another sort of course um, above that. So you can see it clearly here. And it's a similar sort of uh, stone which we witness uh, other sites like Belbeck or other sites. So it's big megalithic blocks at the bottom so this was the original structure and then you can see a clear difference in style to a more flat brick flat red brick okay and then you can see there's a lighter course above there that there's been um, later agitations too so but it's in the historical narrative that this thing has been added to but you can see there's literally three ages there and the oldest is megalithic blocks as you can see there okay Okay, Jason? So, in my own presentations all throughout archaics and in my published books, I've gone into great detail showing you the difference between technolithic and heliolithic architecture. And what we're looking at here on the bottom is heliolithic. What I'm referring to is after the collapse of the vapor canopy, new construction methods were needed because the atmospheric pressure had changed, oxygen, everything about that world was over. New construction methods. These heliolithic monuments are found all over the world. I have I have so much material about it. We can't go into it here. But the heliolithic maritime empire built these super constructions all over the world. They're found in Melanesia, Polynesia, all throughout Indonesia. They're found in Southeast Asia. They're found all throughout South South America. <laughs> heliolithic engineering involved the use of blocks that are far bigger than necessary. They go beyond what is utilitarian. What we're looking at here isn't as simple as the narrative that's been conveyed that a Chinese emperor who destroyed all the records and, and literature and history of his people also built this wall to protect against invaders. The problem with this is Heliolithic architecture is way older than 220 BC, far older. The last of the Heliolithic architecture dates to about the 15th century BC. And then all around the entire world, that type of architecture was over, it was finished. So we have millennia between, we have at least a thousand years between what you see on the bottom. And this is not a really good representation. There's other pictures that show these gigantic blocks. Yes, yeah, like Belbeck type stuff. Like Belbeck. Yeah. Oh, there are many. There are there are many ancient ruins around the world that show. We are we understand. They call them Toltec. They call them Zapotec. They call them Mayan pyramids. They call. But in almost in every scenario, we're dealing with constructions that are built over earlier constructions, and this has been shown multiple times. But with this, if a Chinese emperor had any involvement in this construction, then he merely built over a pre-existing structure. We need to figure out what exactly was this and why do they want you to believe that this is a wall, that this is any kind of defensive fortification. So in order, in order to move forward, 
what we need to see. Hold on, this the next file. I don't want to skip files. Yeah, Every, which one of these is important? Yeah. The we need to see exactly what this construction goes through <coughs> because we have found images that it goes through tundras. It goes through very icy and snowy regions, high altitude. Yeah. It goes through deserts. It goes through mountains, hills, and even <coughs> forests. Yes. Grasslands. Well. This construction was put in areas where no army could have ever invaded because it was built on the side of cliffs. This construction is found in areas that no general would even take an army to. It would endanger his men. Extremely mountainous, craggy areas. You have, oh, you do have those pictures, don't you? Yeah, well, higher ground would have made no sense if you've got an army on the higher ground, you just shoot down onto the wall and everyone's going to die. So, you know, that's not a, you know, a feasible defensive strategy. But we picked up on something concerning these castellations you might see here. If you see these, the crannulations, you know, what you get like on castles, etc. Okay, so, Jason? Okay. Can you zoom in? Yeah, sure, of course you can. Before we talk about the crenellations, this is a, this is a real, this is where the narrative begins to unravel. Yeah. Before that, can you show them an image of that wall disappearing into the sea? Yeah, of course I can. Now this is a key, I think. So the whole narrative of why this is supposed to be a defensive position, yet you've got um, this thing running off into the water, where a naval army could just run off. This, is the, this is the very end of the Great Wall of China, yeah. and it disappears <laughs> like a dock at the end of the Yellow Sea. Yeah. You can imagine, just like today, we have stone quays. You can imagine that when this was in use, ships would come up to a very long wooden pier that would have been there in the past. So Martin mentioned Martin, I'll go into detail. Why don't you tell them, tell them what we observed about the battlements? Well, with these, uh, there is an, another example of a great wall, um, actually in Britain, called Hadrian's Wall. Um, and that thing is being, you know, sort of matched, if you like, oh. with the Great Wall of China. Only that thing is built by the apparent Romans, okay? But there are a lot of similarities, if I just show you, that they, even in the official narrative, they'll draw comparisons between Hadrian's Wall, a Roman built wall, um, and the wall that you see there is the Great Wall. But we made some note of these crenellations, and what you find is that they're on both sides of the wall. So if you imagine a army got up on the wall, okay, and they've taken that section of wall, then they, you've just given them a defensive position on the other side of the wall. So that makes zero sense. Those, those so, the Herculean effort in engineering and manpower to have even built a newer construction covering thousands of miles You'll understand more when you take it its dimensions. Nowhere is the Great Wall lower than 20 feet above the ground. And it has crenellations on both sides, which was for archery type warfare. It's very defensible. The problem is, is the Great Wall has it on both sides. And the narrative says one side was Chinese and one side was Mongolian. But if it was Chinese, the Chinese themselves would have never been so idiotic to give their enemy, <laughs> a, their defensive enemy position, yeah. a defensive position. Because if they get overrun on the wall, then the enemy is on the wall using their own architecture against them. This is why Hadrian's Wall, built by the Romans, has crenellations only on one side. Yeah. No one's going to waste manpower or resources, stone, and time to do it for aesthetics, because that's another key element about this whole construction. Almost zero aesthetics. It was straight utilitarian. So 
Well, that's an image of Hadrian's Wall where you can see that the Cranidations are just on the one side because they were opposing the Picts, apparently, which is a more realistic scenario. Um, but that's not what you're finding at all with the Great Wall. This is com something completely different. This is Hadrian's Wall. It's in the north of England. It stretches from coast to coast. Put there by the Emperor Hadrian. There's actually two walls. There's one further south. And the idea is, you know, th this was very similar sort of thing in antiquity to the Great Wall. There was watchtowers um, every so, you know, so often, which we'll get into in a moment. How tall is that wall, the Hadrian? Well, it's not, a lot of it is underground, but it's not very high at the moment. But it, the width is important. You know, this thing was um, it was a road as well, um, so that might you know just bear with us, and that will make sense in a little minute. So the Great Wall at its lowest is twenty feet, but the average height is twenty five feet. But in some sections, it's as high as forty feet. So being at a higher elevation than those on the ground on both sides of this construction was of paramount import to whoever was using this construction. So we have, we have an anomaly, and this is where we really started brainstorming because I asked Martin, Martin's really good with the visuals, really good with pulling up all, documenting all these images from different time periods. So as I'm looking at the pictures that he has, I simply asked him, okay, is this a Chinese unit of measurement here between between this width of this, this path that's on top of this construction? We found out that it's not. But it is a uniform measurement that was known throughout almost the entire ancient world. In our measurements, it's 16 feet wide. And there's only one other civilization that built roads uniformly everywhere at that width. And they built the roads out of stone. And they're known for building roads and highways all over their entire empire and all the provinces. Martin. The Romans. What? Roman roads are 16 feet wide. And the guard towers that you can see there, there's literally 25,000 of them. Oh okay, some of the wow. massive multi-story buildings. So Jason, um, in a moment of genius, asked, um, what's the distance between the guard towers? Jason? It's absolutely uniform. 25,000 towers engineered to perfection. And they're 5,400 feet apart, which is not a Chinese unit of measurement. But it is a Roman unit. It's called Peds. It's a Roman mile. Yeah, it's exactly they're a Roman mile apart. Wow. They're a Roman width and they're a Roman mile apart. Now remember, we're dealing with a construction where whoever's using this is using it and protecting themselves from both sides. So oh, it gets deeper than this. Oh yeah. <laughs> so now that we have now now that now we have a we have something to look into. Yeah. We're, we're dealing with, with Roman Roman arithmetic, Roman uh, deal. So it got us to look into Rome. What is the official narratives of Rome? And in the narrative, we don't find any contact with the Chinese except for a, a rogue legion that went too far one time in the past. And there's not a lot of details about it. But in modern archaeology, they're only reporting what they find. They're not really trying to stick to a narrative. So. We were really astonished to find that uh, Marcus Aurelius in 166 AD had, Ro had Roman delegations going all the, from the Persian Gulf all the way to China. And this is in the historical record, but no one's talking about it. There was Roman contact. So we find out that modern archaeology is now publishing that the first contact between Rome and China is officially 200 BC, 20 years within the time that the official narrative says the Chinese built the wall. So but it's a construction that would have taken a very long period of time. Yeah. And where we're going with this is no different than what happened in the 1800s, because the past is always a predicate for the future. and. Right here in North America, what do we have going on? 
what was going on in North America that absolutely parallels what we're finding here. The Transatlantic Railway, uh, the, the Continental Railway. Union Pacific, all Union of them. Pacific. They used American engineers, American measurements, American scientists, American resources, but it was Chinese coolies that built the entire railway system. Now, what we're proposing here is something very, very similar. So we have some more data to give you so you can make up your own mind. Do you have any more picture files? Yeah. Do you have any more picture files? Yeah. What are they? Um, well, basically, um, these are the interior of the towers. This the towers are what we're discussing now. Yeah, um, and it's showing, it's about basically, we've looked into the materials used in ancient China. We're talking rough stone, we're talking the buildings we made off of like literally paper and wood. And they do, did use stone, but their style of architecture is completely different. It's more ornamental, like Monet's bridge. Um, in no way that we can find that this engineering style is attributed to anything in China. But what we can see is it is attributed to Roman style of architecture. It's the same brick, it's the same arches, the same um, vaulting that you would see in any Roman exhibit or underground place. Maybe. Inside these 25,000 towers yeah. are Roman arches. Roman Roman style brickwork. It's very austere. It's only for utility. It's not to be designer. When you look at Chinese architecture from the period all the way up to the present, you find you find this is a very important fact. You will not find anything but the pagodas that are uniform in China. The towers built in China are built of rough hewn rock. They did not cut and dress their blocks like the Great Wall. The Great Wall is cut in dressed blocks of stone. This is not a Chinese method of construction. The Chinese built cities out of paper and bam bamboo, and they used wood sparingly. They were not stone builders at all. In any period of Chinese history did they use stone for important projects. They only did it for military bar barricades and palaces. And this is a very important fact. But to find that we don't have Chinese style arches all through 25,000 structures that were supposed to be Chinese, that's problematic. But to find Roman measurements with Roman arches and Roman style brickwork is definitely a problem for the official narrative. So you have any more pictures of towers? Yeah, sure. This is the interior of the tower. And you can see the, the, the brickwork, everything is just what we would see. When we look into the Roman world, it's exactly the same, but if it's nothing of China. I think the flagstones are probably later. But these towers themselves, you know, they're really large, aren't they? And they're multi-story, you know? So they, there's more, you know, than just these buildings just being guard towers. They have other uses. Um, we're going to get to that. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to actually be too forward because I know there's going to be a lot of aha moments in here. Yeah. So but the towers are not are not built for military garrisons. So this is a typical uh, Chinese construction. It's about the best you can get it. It's just rough and ready. They just don't give anything too much attention. And as you can see, it's the pagoda style, which is also a technology, but it's nowhere near. There is nothing the same as the Great Wall of China anywhere in China or anywhere in the Antiquity. So this is uh, the typical style. So it's rough, dressed, stone, cobbly sort of stone. And that's about the best you can get it in the Chinese building tradition of all the buildings. Their bridges, although they've got Antiquitech, and they look very, very nice, um, but it's this pagoda style, you know, because of the Antiquitech. But um, this is their style. And it's nothing like what anything is exhibited on the Great Wall. Well, anyway, and this is a, a typical building with what is it, just wood, wooden sides, yeah, and paper. You've seen this, you know, Japan also, earthquakes or what have you, but yeah, they're not built like the bridge. Uh, so, the bridge. This is a, this led us to looking at something else because this construction that goes through all these different types of geographies and territories. Mm -hmm. It often passes over bodies of water in rivers 
So when we looked at, we looked at the pictures together, we couldn't believe we came to the same conclusion at the same time because whoever built this construction, they stuck to an engineering science and they didn't deviate. They used the same methods. They used the same arches everywhere in every bridge. You have the images of the bridge. Yeah, sure. So, no, so they go across a few rivers, the Great Wall does. And basically, it's exhibiting what we've looked at, Roman bridges, and they're the same. I'll show you the equivalent of Chinese bridge, what they're built in, and there is nothing, literally nothing similar to what is going over the rivers and carrying the Great Wall across it. This, to my eyes, you know, I've been looking into this field for many years now, this looks like Roman construction. They are great engineers, yeah? This, they're just not exhibiting, say, great engineering skills in China, Asian Chinese world. But the Romans, that's their speciality. Try to remind us to speak to Mike a little more. Okay. But, uh, okay, so how many images of, of the Great Wall aqueducts and bridges do you have? Have you gone through them all? Uh, the, the, the bridges. Just the, just the supposedly Chinese Great Wall. Have you shown those bridges? Yeah, already? this is it. This is it. Okay, yeah. so moving forward. Yeah. Show them now. Chinese bridges. Okay, brother. Chinese bridges it is. What you're about to see. <laughs> I sure hope you don't have any porn on there. I don't look at porn. Porn is bad. Porn is bad. Porn is bad people's heads. It's all, there's something weird going on. That's like third person there or something. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, you can. No, I, I can't actually see the Chinese bridges. I don't know where to put them. I do apologize. I'm here somewhere. Exactly. Oh, they're in there. Yeah. So, yeah. why why he's looking for them? Yeah. It was it was painfully obvious oh, yeah. when we looked at the Chinese bridges that the Chinese maintain absolutely no uniform building techniques. It seems to be each bridge was the product of the genius who built it. Yeah. It, no two bridges are the same. There's nothing uniform. No, no two bridges are the same. It's all different types of artwork. There's a lot of creative license. There was no. It seems like they didn't have a fixed infrastructure like the Romans would have. A science that goes back centuries, they knew exactly how to build and what to do. The Chinese just did whatever worked, and they did it aesthetically. You can see their culture in their architecture. Yeah. You can see where they had great pride in what they built. They did not build austere structures. They built ones that were highly decorated using the materials that they were familiar with. But no bridges in China look anything like the bridges at the Great Wall. Totally different types of architecture. Yeah. Have you been to all those images? Yeah, man. So, so they Roman. So having found having found these things, we had to do a little little research. I can't stand the internet, but we had to use it. So we were just bouncing ideas off each other and in making discovery after discovery. So, I believe, I don't remember what I asked Martin, but he, but he Googled it and instantly came up with 2,000 years ago. Archaeologists today have widely published that 2,000 years ago, the Romans routinely sent annually tons of gold to China for silk, spices, porcelain, jade, opium, tea, and ivory. The Romans were fixated with all this stuff they couldn't get in the provincial territories and get in the, in the empire. So if we have modern archaeologists comporting that the Romans were sending that much gold east, do you think they would have put it on wagons and just hoped nobody messed with the, with, with the, with the transits? And if they have all this product coming back from the east for the gold, uh, in exchange for the gold, do you think... They would just hope that people would respect their Romans and not mess with those trains and merchants. So, equally so, did we get any big pictures of the artifacts? Ro well, Ro yeah. Roman artifacts in China. Yeah, well, while you're looking at uh, this is a coin of Constantine, and it was found in China. But they've also found lots of dead bodies, which have been proved to be European, um, in China, and also... Uh, Curiously, vice versa as well. So um, in 2016, um, a, a cemetery in London, in Suffolk in London, was dug up, 
and they found a load of dead or skeletons of Chinese people as far as the British arm of the Roman Empire, that far. So we're talking about um, a, an empire that is far bigger, far more outstretched than a current uh, history would let us know, and more, much more. So. so in researching these things, we found out there was an exchange of materials. We have found Roman artifacts and elements of Roman culture in China 2,000 years ago, and we have found a tremendous amount of materials from China that flooded into the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, 200 years after this Chinese emperor supposedly built this construction, and about 180 years after the Romans made first contact with the Chinese. So the building, the building of structures of late provenance over much older and bigger architecture was a trait of the Romans. Uh, show them Petra. Sure. So, Petra, the apparent treasury, the antique world. So, you have, you have a few pictures of Petra, don't you? Sure. There's, there's For those of you who don't know, in the book of Genesis, there's a race called the Serum. And when King Ketolaramor of Edom, he wanted to eradicate the races of the giants. This is what Genesis chapter 14 is. An Edomite king named Ketolaramor summoned his, his lessers, his vassal states. One of those was Amraphel of Babel, which we know of. And in the Jewish literature, his name was Nimrod. In the Sumerian literature, he is Amar Udaak. In the Akkadian, he is Merodach. It's all the same individual. And he joined Keto Laramor in Genesis chapter 14 with the Hittites under their king named Tudor. These, these four kings came together and, uh, well, there was a fourth king, I can't remember his name, but all four of them came together and they fought the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Zuzums, the Zamzumums, and the, uh, where's, did I name five? Anakim, Rephaim, Emum, Zuzums, and Zamzumums, okay. There's five races of giants mentioned in Genesis, but there was two subcultures of giants. They were, they were of partial Nephilim ancestry. These were the Horums and the Serum. Well, the Serum occupied Petra. And the Serum, it said it was a whole civilization of caverns and caves. But by the 2,000 years after they were, they were basically overrun by the Elamites, the Romans came in and built massive fortifications over the older serum case. This is in Jordan, but they built these, these deals, but they didn't just do it there. The Romans completely built over a very ancient temple at a place called Belbek. At a place called Belbek in Lebanon. You have those pictures? Yeah, sure. That. You can see the Heliolithic architecture at the bottom. This parts of the original temple, hundreds of ton blocks. They call it, it's called the Trilithon. It's huge. And there's just no way we can even lift these today. But somebody lifted them, put them in, placed them, and did it with mortar one fiftieth of an inch thick. What they did is magnificent, but it had nothing to do with the Romans. The Romans repurposed an ancient structure. We're only showing Petra and Baalbek, but we can actually show you hundreds of sites in the old world that the Romans built on top of. They completely resurfaced it, built new structures, and the structures we see today are of Roman origin built over more ancient structures, just like Tenochtitlan in Mexico, where pyramids were built on top of pyramids and then, and then resurfaced and built. There's no actually original pyramids. What you're seeing in Mexico are layers of pyramids. And after reset, after reset, they just come back and rebuild. Sometimes it's a whole new culture that comes in and rebuilds. So these are Bell Back. These are late 1800s photographs. These people look like they just found the place. Look at them. This is just <laughs> I, giant architecture. You must be just blowing their minds thinking, who the hell has put this here? You know, we're on some cards back home. You've got like, you know, 50 ton blocks. There's just unreal. But you can definitely see the transition of uh, styles. You can see a little bit of an arch up here from a previous infrastructure of a building that's fallen away. But this place is immense. You know, it's, they've added on, you know, that's a nice old image there showing a different little 
view of it. But it, it exhibits uh, classical architecture that you would attribute to the Roman world, or the Phoenician world, or whatever you want to call it. But they went there and apparently built on an older world, which you can see there. So you've got the pillars there, you can see the columns. They look like they're probably half buried, to my eyes, because of uh, the top heaviness and, you know, they're not even. And Corinthian tops, which is um, known to the Greek world and the Roman world. And also what looks like a viaduct or possibly an aqueduct, or many of them, style of ashes, which is the Romans. So the Romans have come in and built all of this on top in Belpac. So they turn on a couple of sites, yeah, a few good few sites. Repurpose what they find after a recent. So we, we move to a different analysis. We're going to look at this from a different a different perspective. And Martin and I, we we mean absolutely no disrespect to the Chinese, but it's an absolute fact that the Chinese were not known for two things. And one was lithic engineering, the use of stones as the prime, primary materials for construction projects. They weren't known for that. They weren't known for their engineering, and they weren't known for open trade with other countries. If any culture in antiquity has tried to maintain their independence from the rest of the world and maintain an isolationist state, it's China. As a matter of fact, it was in the 1800s where American ships had to threaten the Chinese with cannoning their cities if they didn't open their borders to trade. Because while the Western world was sharing their technology with India, in Japan and in other areas, China wanted to remain almost Neolithic. But we knew here in America, our government did, that somebody else is just going to come over here and take over and take all their resources. So they had to, they had, we had to share our infrastructure, share our defenses and our weapons. But it took us threatening to blow up their cities with cannons for them to understand that you need to get on board with manufacturing and trade before you're left behind because there's sharks in these waters. And this is exactly the lesson we, we, were, we taught the Chinese. Because they're so isolationist, Chinese culture has remained virtually unchanged for 5,000 years. They don't want, they don't want to, to uh, engage with the rest of the world. Trade is not on their list. Engineering has never been their trait, but they're both the chief traits of the Romans. And anybody who has studied Roman culture, you will know, building with stone is their primary building material. And they maintained a trade empire that, that had never been matched until the days of the East India Company of the UK, Great Britain. So looking at it from a totally different perspective, again, we're looking at somebody else having built this construction because it has everything to do with trade. Would you show them the route of the, the Silk Road route? Yeah, sure, I knew that was great. So, what we found is, well, you probably heard about the Silk Road, they sort of use it in the modern day, uh, but this thing goes, it's uh, halfway from Europe, Istanbul, but it goes into the Asian world. Excuse me. Just bring that up. Okay, where is it? So I've got too many pictures playing. Just excuse me a second. Uh, and then it'll come up. Okay. Silk Road. So what we found is the path the Silk Road, if it's just come up, follows the Great Wall of China. It is the Silk Road. It is the Silk Road. That's what we're telling you. So this thing is an international highway. They called it the Imperial Highway in antiquity, as you can see there on the map. But this thing would have been from that coast we just showed you at the end of the wall. Okay. Bear in mind you've got all of these guard posts, supposed, or these large buildings, every Roman mile, okay, on a Roman road, because this thing is a highway, it's a road, okay. And it's taking all of these goods. Opium was really important to the Roman world. They used to use it for surgery. You know, these are the big medical backgrounds, you know, cesarean sections, et cetera. But they did operations and they used opium. So that was important to them. And the Chinese didn't require too much in trade. It seemed to be just glass that they were interested in and gold they were interested in. So um, they brought, they imported silk 
which was very important to the Roman world. But apparently, one of one Roman emperor tried to ban the import of silk because of the value it was destabilizing the whole of the Roman world. So that this is the value of these silks. So there's so many materials that are really important to the entire of the Roman Empire, which is not just people from Rome. This is a multicultural empire. People, you know, the Roman Britons, the Roman Gauls, you know, the Gauls, which are the French and the Germans, etc., which are all part of the Roman world. So there was an international highway of trade going all the way from Britain, because of the Chinese that I told you about earlier in the cemetery in London, all the way to the Pacific coast along the Great Wall of China. Wait for it, wait for it, we're not quite done yet, wait for it, things change. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm going to 25,000 towers, all one mile apart, each one has multiple chambers that can house hundreds of people. We have already seen underground chambers, underground tunnels attached to, attached to the towers. We have, we have battlements on either side, and, the, and it is always 20 feet or higher. And this protected road even went through geographical areas where no protection was necessary because there's no way somebody could have attacked. The Romans were known for their key trait, which is, which is it's phenomenal. Anyone who has read Cicero will understand that the Romans were mastermind administrators, able to use a small amount of men and resources to do tremendous great projects. What we're proposing here is the Amazon of the ancient world. What we're proposing here is that this wasn't just the Silk Road. This was a Roman road that was absolutely there to protect their investment. But it wasn't people just walking down the road with backpacks and little hand wagons to, to go 18 months. It takes 18, 18 months, months to walk the Great Wall. Yeah. It takes 18 months. So you wouldn't be able to carry the food and water for an 18-month journey to walk the Great Wall. So there's definitely something else going on. So they are procuring as they go. 100%. No one was able to take the amount of food and water necessary. 18 months is too far. The Romans were expert administrators. And yet we have 25,000 towers, which is equal to a city full of chambers with baths, with, air, with latrines, with places to sleep. Even today, some of these towers are used for their original purpose. You want to show them the pictures? Yeah, sure. Raise yourselves. <laughs> but not only are they using them as hotels in the modern day, which is what they were doing in the past, I think this Amazon <coughs> conveyor belt, okay, which is what it was, um, had the different buildings for different parts of what they would need. It. So food, drink. In the modern day, you can go there and you can have a nice meal in the Great Wall of China. Or indeed, you can uh, stay there. Excuse me, uh, too many images kind of excuse me very much. All right. Yeah, so you can uh, just, you know, this is what they would have done in the antique world. You wouldn't be able to carry 18 months of water toward the Great Wall of China, but you could go to a tower and pick up your supplies. Um, it, it makes more sense as well that, you know, Jason, that the Romans wouldn't, you know, go the whole 18 months trip. So what would you propose that they did using the towers? If I was a Roman administrator, there is no way I'm going to send some of my people on that road to go retrieve something from China. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have the Chinese move it toward Rome through every single tower. They can sleep, they can eat, they, yeah. local communities provide the water. Some towers are dedicated to food with markets. Some towers are dedicated to sleepovers. Every tower is a Roman mile apart. Therefore, every night, that whole pathway is locked down. They still have to protect against, not armies, <coughs> but they gotta protect against bandits. Because everybody in the ancient world back then knew that a lot of merchandise and gold was moving in that wall. Those towers were designed to lock down. That means they locked them down at night. They were open by day. This is the Amazon of the ancient world. 
tons of cargo can get moved 10, 12, 10, 12 miles a day going toward Rome. The Chinese did build the wall. They did build the structure, but it's all Roman engineering. And this is the exact same thing we find in all the provincial territories of Rome. They use the local Dacians to build cities in Dacia. They, they use the locals of every province to build. But the Roman architecture found throughout the ancient world is Roman engineering. And all it takes is one or two engineers to do a project. The local population are the, are the coolies. They're the ones building it all. Rome had set up not just a trade route, but a way that merchandise would be moved all the way transcontinental and fast and be absolutely safe for bandits and be protected. And the, and the travelers could move down the road, moving the merchandise, hundreds of tons in this tower, halfway or a third of the way. And then groups had their own, had their own areas and sections. We're talking about probably close to 200,000 people involved in this project. They probably lived in these towers and they moved merchandise forward and backward. They probably had, they probably had scribes, administrators, at least one at each tower that logged all cargo going this way, logged all cargo going that way. I'm literally talking about an Amazon type project of moving merchandise in the empire all the way through because the narrative that we're given that the Great Wall was designed to protect against armies, it would never do that. There are places in the wall where it doubles back, it doubles back on itself. Invading armies could have easily taken that wall out, but there wasn't any problem with invading armies. All during that time of history, the Mongols were pastoral people. They were too scattered and too infrequent, and they had no interest in taking on China. They're out there in the mountains of Mongolia, and they're just watching their goats, and they're living their lives. The only thing that they had to protect, protect against were pirates, because there was a lot of gold, gold going back and forth and a lot of merchandise. Everything that we have found about this construction is totally, is totally different from the official narrative that we've been given. This is basically our presentation right here. Wow. It is interesting that uh, Martin brought to my attention that all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then also some of, some of the walls you find uh, crumbling, Jason. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so is the narrative. Yeah. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the yeah, well, I do want to address, I, I, want, to, I want to continue this in this vein. Um, Yeah, the, uh, we're going to go a little deeper on this right now because it seems like a Herculean effort, but it's really not. If you have just Roman, if you just have a deal with another empire, most emperors believe that their own people were expendable. And the Chinese have always been very populous, so we can see a deal between Rome and the Chi Chinese emperor. So the, the narrative says the Chinese emperor burned all the books of Rome and all that. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. We believe that the Western world burned their own libraries to cover up many of the things that they have done. You all know, all you, you know, the Library of Pergamum, the Library of Carthage, the Library, the Library of Alexandria four times, many church libraries. Guys, the Romans destroyed histories. They destroyed narratives and covered their tracks. In today's world, we are told the Chinese built it, and that's a half truth. Just like the Chinese did not build the American railway system, but in, in a way they really did. The Chinese coolies worked their ass off and they built it. It was American engineers. But the deeper aspect of this whole narrative is what we uncovered about opium. We'll tell them about it. Right, this is it's, it's a dependency in the Roman world. So they have to have opium. And I think this narrative of two opium wars in the 1800s it goes way, way back, and it all goes along the Silk Road, and they're going to protect this stuff. You know, they had a war in Afghanistan to protect the opium fields. I don't think there's anything else included in that. When we were researching the trade wares in Rome, and found out that, that they desperately wanted Chinese goods, and they sent hundreds of tons of gold annually 
under it. To China, we understood it. We understood that the Romans invested, invested in this project because they had to protect their interest. But just like wars are waged in the modern times, like our invasion of Afghanistan to secure the poppy fields, and what the British did in China to secure the opium, history repeats itself. Ancient Rome, he's the one that found it, but the research is all out there. A significant portion of the Roman population was addicted to heroin. That the dependency, and they had to have it. Now, they did use it for medicinal purposes. That's it was well. very popular for caesarean sections. Yeah, it's diarrhea, cures, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, we're, the, it, the, I mean, the, it wasn't just the trade, where it's like silk and all, and all the things the Chinese provide in the jade. It, it the literally, it literally, this wall, this, this construction is actually a 5,000 mile long castle. And it was built because the Romans wanted drugs. Oh, you know what? That's a that's a good idea. Um, um that, I didn't know how long that presentation was going to go. Uh, so it really is a good time to do that. If if you want to turn this into a Q and A. You might pull out more information that we forgot to add to this presentation. Yes. So you did it. You were the first to ask. Yeah. Let's do it. Martin, you have a picture I'm very fascinated by. Okay. I'm no, let me get. Excuse me. Just get this mic. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I conclude the anti cathedral computer must be a, a Phoenix predictor because 583 BC, not only did the Phoenix phenomenon occur, and I've widely documented it, but it was absolutely predicted and it made Thales of Miletus famous for doing it. He predicted it two years before it actually happened. So uh, I don't know, I, I don't know how it would be, how it would actually. It's, it's, it's a totally separate deal. I mean, the world is full of mysteries. I think we solved this one, but the Phoenix phenomenon doesn't really, I don't really have any crossover. Uh, I, the Han Dynasty, there was a really bad Phoenix phenomenon episode that they recorded, but the Han Dynasty was after the, the uh, construction started. But I, I absolutely believe that the Heliolithic substrate, the original gigantic megalithic blocks, this was already done in the ancient world. The Romans only replicated what an older civilization done. And in my own books, I call it the, the Heliolithic Maritime Empire because it was a trade empire that I documented. And they were wiped out by Phoenix in 1687 BC. As a matter, aside from the Great Flood, 1687 BC is the most well documented. And it's ancient. It's, we're talking about almost 4,000 years ago. It's the, it's the best documented Phoenix episode ever. And it totally ended all Heliolithic construction. So that's the only connection I see with the Gray Wall is that is that a thousand about a thousand years after the Heliolithic Empire collapsed, somebody the Romans decided to rebuild this structure. Well, even before that, they were still using it as a trade route. But Rome decided, using Chinese labor, they decided we need to build a fortification if we're going to be sending all our gold that way. And when the Romans discovered heroin, it was over with. They went ahead and did it. <laughs> heroin, no, excuse me, opium. Opium. But yeah, uh, yeah, anybody, I mean, any, like I said, we're not trying to push a narrative on you. We're trying to show you that the official narrative doesn't make sense and comport with the facts. So you do your own research, do your own homework, find out what you find. You may find some things that get you emailing me, blowing my mind. But it's all. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Jason, um, I know China hasn't per se been the focus of your research, but as you mentioned, they've held on to their culture. Do you feel like internally they know, or many of their people know, the true history of something like this? And then also, uh, in the same breath, I heard that uh, Putin uh, not too long ago uh, publicly declassified all these records on Tartaria, supposedly. Could you speak to those? Uh, I don't really follow, follow any modern news or anything or what Putin's doing. Um, I'm aware that Putin is really anti-globalist. He's really anti-establishment. And he's a, he's a thorn in their side, just like the Romanovs were until they assassinated all of them. Um, I don't know. Tartaria is, is, is that's, his, that's his theater of research. It's not really mine. What was your initial question? Though? The uh, Chinese, their internal history. Okay, yeah. You feel like they know about this. And um, other things. The Chinese share with the Inca, which were originally called the Aymara people, South America. They share a common <laughs> trait, and that trait is is every few centuries, one of the rulers of the Chinese or of the Inca do the exact same thing, and that is because they fear that. Knowledge of the people, if the people learn something and believe that something in the past was true, they'll make it happen in the future. And because so many references to the Phoenix and, and Typhon, Typhonius, in Chinese it was the Fing. The Fing was to be feared, same as the Phoenix. They destroyed all, all books, all libraries. These purges are very common in ancient China and among the Inca. And in the Inca records, it's specifically mentioned that it's done to stop the very events that people now are have now become aware of. So you ask me, you ask me if they're aware. Yeah, they're probably aware. Yeah, they're probably they're probably aware. Now the Chinese, the Chinese government and Chinese military industrial complex, they know that the Heliolithic architecture found throughout their country is not Chinese. They know this. They know because of the skeletons that have been found in the cities that have been found underneath the Chinese Taklamakan Desert. They're all Caucasian. All. They also know that the Zhong district was never Chinese. 
because when the Chinese went into the area in the ancient text, they found, on the turtle text, they found these pyramids there. This is why the pyramids are not open to the public today. There's no tourism. You can't go to the Chinese pyramids. They're huge. There's a lot of them. But they're covered in trees and grass. And it's now a military zone. But the Chinese recognize they didn't build these. these the, the, and the, the actual Chinese people believe that they were built by the Dragon Kings. And they're absolutely correct. Because the Dragon Kings were during the vapor canopy, and they're no different than the Seven Kings of Sumer. They, they, even the even Chinese chronology perfectly lines up with the 23rd, 22nd, BC, uh, 22nd century BC for the rule of the Dragon Kings. The Dragon Kings dynasty was 646 years. All seven kings of the Dragon Kings ruled for that period. In the Sumerian version, it's 670 years. But so I've gone through that in detail on my channel about the 241,200 shards actually being divisible by 360 because seven men can't live 240,000 years. But when you use when you use the sexagesimal system, which was the only system that the Sumerians knew, it becomes 670 years. So Chinese know that they're living on an ancient land that was not Chinese. So this is why revealing something like this like i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna put martin out there right now he says bro they're gonna kill us <laughs> but because because it's this is this is something that's offensive you understand a lot of people will take offense to this especially the chinese you're going to take one of the seven wonders of the world well, well we build you to take that from us and i get that i get that but I can't unsee what we already saw. I can't unsee it. And anybody who has uh, studied Ro Roman measurement systems and Roman construction methods and all that, and then looks at the Chinese, knows that thing wasn't built by Chinese. Or at least it wasn't designed by Chinese. Was there um, another significant route that went from the end of the Great Wall to Rome? Did you have other pathways? or? Well, when you see when you see it veer off like that, it's normally it's no, it normally goes for a short distance to a metropolitan area like a city. You know I mean, the, uh, the Great Wall has pieces that go in different directions. Unfortunately, due to cataclysms, due to resets, due to change changes in the topography and migrations, we just don't have an accurate assessment of where those communities are are because today they're not there. And in some instances, new cities and communities have, have risen up next to the wall that weren't there back when just the wall went through that area. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. There are 10 cities on the Great Wall, 10 major <laughs> cities in the modern day, uh, in the ancient days, to have to say. Yeah, you can imagine whole communities that were responsible for making sure these two towers had, had plenty of water. These two these towers here had, had uh, uh, were, were made hotel, hotel accommodations and all that because these we're talking about miniature castles now you're looking at the top but these things go down they have basement levels chambers and there's even chambers under parts of the wall attached to the towers these were sleepers every night people went in there and slipped some of the some of the cargo holds had nothing but cargo everything is locked down at night everything i'm pretty sure that they had stringent rules that there is no walking there is no camping on the on the on the on the road there's no walking the road at night i'm pretty sure everything was locked down unless it was some type of dignitary with, with a personal guard going up in the wall at night but uh yeah that's uh, tunnels. tunnels yeah there's tunnels yeah there's all kinds of tunnels in the in the wall this is another this is more evidence that that the wall was not to deter a, exactly. a military invasion because sea, siege warfare, that wall wouldn't stand a chance. Battle rams, if you've got tunnels in inside, you could have had whole two-way traffic. Traffic going this way on the top, traffic going the other way on the bottom. They're still connected by those, those towers even under there. So 25,000 towers would most certainly, certainly house everybody every day who is using that to, to transfer materials. And no, no trips would even, would even, it wouldn't even be long. I mean, you would have Chinamen that are, their entire life, they're responsible for these 12 towers. Their entire life, no, they don't even know what the merchandise is. All they know is it's heavy. And they, they move from tower to tower to tower. And then, I mean, 
the whole system, if you could just imagine ants carrying their burdens, going back and forth. All this is coming, not just from Rome, this is coming, we got item, we got gold and silver coming from Armenia, from, uh, 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 what is that, Mithridates kingdom, Pontus, all the Black Sea area, and all the Roman provinces, Dacia sending their gold, Rome sending their gold, uh, gold's coming out of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and it's all coming this way. And the Chinese are sending all this jade, all this ivory, all this poppy. They're sending all this, all these other materials. But it would be so easy. It would be so easy to make an order and then expect it to come. Because what I imagine are administrators that are so good at what they do that if I'm a Roman, like if I'm a Roman consul or a prelate or a praetorian. If I if I if I'm if I if I'm of a noble equestrian family or something, I can put my order in and probably get my stuff the next day because it's being delivered at all times. It's steady coming. I don't have to wait the whole 18 month walk. It's already here and it's steady coming. This is the type of Roman, this is the type of trade the Romans were engaged in everywhere in the empire. So it's not a stretch of imagination to believe that. They invested in that construction to make it happen with China because China had things that you know, they couldn't get anywhere else. So yeah, gotcha. I'll pay. I'll pay my gold, and it would take one, one or two days, and I would go to a dist distribution center in Rome where this stuff is already in, in flu. It's in flu every day. Yeah. It's coming in, and I'll go pick up all my materials. No waiting. No. This it, is the Amazon of the ancient world. Interestingly, as you can see in the picture, the Chinese had proposed to turn the Great Wall into a highway. In the 1930s, yeah. nothing new under the sun. Nice. Yeah. Hey, don't you have pictures of, of thousands of people on the wall? I just showed you. Oh, you already showed yeah, it. I just showed you. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's just the wall is just just chock a block with people. But that's the story. Yes, lady. Um, do you think there's a relationship between a phoenix phenomenon or one of the deluges that would have pushed all the gold one way and all the supplies, and horses, and silk and opium and whatnot like they had it from burned out castles but somehow why was there so much gold over there for them to pay for all these things that they wanted and why was there such a conglomerate of all those things in well well the chinese didn't need anything rome provided martin and i went into great depth about this yes. in our own private research we yeah. found the chinese wanted nothing from the outside world okay. nothing so the only thing of value that the romans could send them is gold and gold isn't near as rare as you think. I mean, even when the Spanish conquistadors, Pizarro and those of them took over the Inca cities and, and what they found was gold was everywhere. Gold wasn't even valuable to the Inca like it was to the Spanish conquistadors. Whole gardens were made, tulips and flowers, uh, uh, artificial bananas, all this stuff. The, the Spanish were amazed. They, whole people had gardens of gold and uh, the sheets in the temples and government buildings, the wallpaper, was, was beaten gold. Yeah, gold isn't near as rare as you think. Even today, there's gold all over the world. The problem is, is the military industrial complex all around the world buys most of it up and they need it because they have to EMP EMP proof all their hardware. Gold is a is an awesome conductor. So in the event that any enemy tries to use EMP weapons, it's only gold circuitry that's going to continue to work. So gold's everywhere. Yeah. You know, shout out to Benjamin Mulford. Who's that? <laughs> he said, this is just a little clip of an idea that you might want to check into that he claimed years ago. He's, his name's Benjamin Tolfer. He's an exopolitics um, guy who's awake and has been spreading as much as he can in relation to outside the, you know, the military, you might say, but to the world of people in their levels of awakeness. And he said that the 9 11. Part of what the big deal was, you know, the World Trade Center was right there, and that we had come to an agreement that had come to its time of pay back gold to China, and uh, they got out of it by bombing the World Trade Center, among the, all the other spiritual things that I know about that happening. But, um, you know, so there's that connection to the him claiming, and I can't tell you who he is right now. I don't, I don't, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of going off topic with this. Yeah, okay. I don't, yeah, so just to see if the gold. Yeah, I don't know anything about the World Trade Center other than planes didn't drop those buildings. 
That's all I know. In the back. Come again? Opium was was known as Pharaoh back like during Deadwood, and they referred to the Chinese as Celestials. Uh, the Chinese referred to themselves as Celestials, right? Okay, is that where that came from? Yes, the Celestial, the Celestial Empire, that was a whole Chinese tradition, and right? What about the opium? Being called Pharaoh. Being called Pharaoh? Pharaoh. As in, as in the ruler of Egypt? They just used that word. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Chastain. Yeah. You know, Chastain. That is interesting, but I don't, I don't know anything about it. It's beyond my kids. You mentioned the uh, the massive Heliolithic stones. Mm -hmm. That Were you saying that the Romans built on top of that? And well, if, if so, well, which, do you have any idea which culture originally built those? Okay. The, Heli the Heliolithic architecture is found everywhere in all, almost all 5,000 miles of the great of the uh, great wall this great wall the heliolithic blocks we can't carry them today the chinese built with a little handheld brick that you can put in this is a roman brick so brick and mortar mm. underneath the heliolithic we really don't know who they were now i've done several videos where i explained that there was a race a culture of people that the rest of the world called the amuru that the amuru actually were the ruling dynasty even though the Hittites and the Amorite cultures were at war and were sworn enemies, they all they always traded their traded their sons and daughters. The rulers of the Hittites were blood related to the rulers of the Amorites. Same thing with northern Egypt. I'm not talking about southern Egypt. Southern Egypt was Kemet, Kemetia. Those were not a Caucasian people. But northern Egypt was 100% Caucasian. The Amuru were Caucasian. Their images are shown all throughout the Near East. Where people take offense is that we now live in a very liberal academic culture that basically refuses to admit that there was a Caucasian infrastructure building race that was building cities called the Heliolithic Maritime Empire. Other nations called them children of the sun. The reason they called them the children of the sun is because there's no record they existed anywhere until the collapse of the vapor canopy. When the, when the vapor canopy collapsed, the sun calendars all began. And then the Sumerians invented a new god, Utu Shamash, the sun. And the Egyptians invented a Horus, the son of the sun. So we have a whole new biosphere. The, the death of an old world, the antediluvian world, and the introduction of a new race that came from the deep. This is what it says. Now, a lot like Zechariah said you, and a lot of the translated words like, like Apsu, they think it refers to deep space. And this is what Zechariah Sitchin promotes all the time. Anytime he sees the word Apsu, he promotes deep space that came from the source. That is not the conception of the ancients. They came from the underworld. These Caucasians came up after a cataclysm and they had their infrastructure intact. They had weapons and armor, uh, excellent administrators. And very, very quickly, they became the ruling dynasties over the entire Near East, Middle East, Africa, all the Mediterranean area. They were all exchanging their sons and daughters, but they would not marry in with the local populations. And the maritime Heliolithic Empire they were the super builders after the collapse of the vapor canopy that built all these giant structures. So what we are proposing is that before the Romans did what they did and built a fortification, that's not, that's not a wall. That's a fortification. It just happens to be 5,000 miles long. That fortification has a precedent. There was another culture in ancient times that used that as a road and a conveyance but theirs was megalithic. But repeated Phoenix cataclysms had destroyed all that to the point the Romans had to come and build back over it. But yes, it's a, the Heliolithic Maritime Empire is a major topic on my channel, spread throughout many of my videos and mentioned in my books. They're very real. It don't, I'm not, I don't speculate where they came from, but they're 100% a white race that had been hiding in the underworld. And they were recognized as that by the people who survived on the surface. But the people on the, who survived on the surface did not have their infrastructure. The collapse of the vapor canopy 
pretty much reset everybody. And the only people that were around were the survivors. And those survivors formed colonies that built that built that built the Hittite kingdom, and then the Amorite kingdom, and then Egypt, and then Nassos, Minoan Cree, and Elam, Mohenjo-Daro, all these different ancient civilizations that we know of. The history that we're kind of familiar with in textbooks began after the collapse of the vapor canopy because the vapor canopy world is still not acknowledged by science, but it's the world that answers for all the mysteries of, of, of the technologically advanced civilizations that lived at that time. And that, the lower parts of that wall was built by an advanced civilization after the collapse of that canopy. Hmm. Makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? This was great. What I've learned is, you know, the movement of, of cargo, it's all about shipping. So I'm curious, how did they track the movement of all that cargo? Were there postal, let's say post offices, the way the post office controls movement today, including military movement? Was there a post office at that time? Have you seen anything in your research how they stamped and received I'm gonna, I'm gonna, two things. One, you need to ask Russell J. Gold, because I know you know him. Yeah. Two, we don't we don't have the historical records. This is why this presentation. Well, oh, listen, follow me here. We don't have the historical the historical records uh, about this being built by the Romans, but we don't have any records. The Romans built Jordan, the Petra, Baalbek. You understand? We have Roman architecture that is admitted to admitted to be Roman all over the Mediterranean. Deal. But we don't have the actual records. And the main tradition attached to the origin of the Great Wall is that its builder destroyed all records of his culture in his deal. So we have a problem, we have a problem here. We have, we have a real problem. But if anything is true somewhere, it's probably true somewhere else. So abiding by that tenet, I have to inform you. The Sumerian tablets, the oldest tablets, in the, you know, the oldest written tablets in the world. You know, Zechariah Sitchin and many others have done a great job of informing people of their contents. But I'm telling you now, everything Sitchin ever wrote or everything you've ever heard about the Sumerian tablets only covers about 10% of their content. Because any, like Samuel Noah Kramer, Maureen Gallery Kovacs, the original translators of the Sumerian, it's so boring. <laughs> because everything in Sumerian is shipping manifests. <laughs> everything. Anybody can Google that. The, the majority of all Sumerian and Akkadian texts are ledgers, ship manifests, cargo lists. It's boring as hell. The uh, uh, titles and deeds of land, all in cuneiform. Sometimes it is Sumerian logograms. You don't hear that from the sensationalist. You're not going to hear that from Sitchin or his follower, his disciple, uh, Billy Carson. <laughs> You're not going to hear that from them, but 90% of all the cuneiform that we've ever found, we've got half a million tablets from about 17 or 18 different libraries, from Ugrit, Rashamra, from, uh, from Amarna. Uh, you already know about Nimrud and Nineveh, um, of, course, of course Babylon, uh, Ur, Ur and Amu, these are all different cities, and tablets have been found in all of them. Uh, they've even found they've even found uh, cuneiform tablets now in Mycenae, and some of the names are, are Proto-Greek, and they are actual names from Homer's Odyssey. So, listen, we're dealing we're dealing we're dealing with a truth here. If it's true in ancient Sumer that they were already recording meticulous records of cargo, and they were measuring them in shards, you understand the importance here, because. Billy Carson and, and Zechariah Sitchin got everybody believing a shar equals a year. But I've got old books that explain that shar is just a unit of measurement. It does not mean year. It is, a, it, it is a unit of measurement. It's almost like a turning, and it's connected to the year, which is a star. So therefore, a shar is the turning of a star, but it's also related to the gar. And this is Samuel Noah Kramer, a sumer sumerologist that was showing that ship manifests, the cargo was shows the weight of the crates. The weight was in shards. So uh, we can totally do away with the whole chronology of Zechariah's decision. It, it, it doesn't even work. 
Uh, those hundreds of thousands of years are actually hundreds of thousands of days, which reduces all these historical events to just years apart. It is that simple. Well, I'm, yes, so I'm telling you about the Sumerian and Akkadian cuneiform manifest because they're very meticulously detailed, they're very boring, but if it's true in ancient Sumer 4,000 years ago, then I'm pretty sure the Romans had an even better system because they did not write on clay, on clay and then burn it in an oven. That's the only reason we have those records preserved. And because of destructions that happened in 1849 BC that leveled almost every Near Eastern city, all those libraries became underground. And no one dug them out. They built over them. And that's the reason why we have half a million cuneiform texts because survivors don't excavate the destruction. They fill it in with more rubble, they fill it in with dirt, then they surface it with asphalt, they build a new, they build a new city. And this is why we discover all these things. So I believe the Romans probably kept meticulous records on paper, on vellum, and those things don't last. I have, book, I have a lot of books. He's been in my library. I have some very, very old books, and I'm telling you now, they don't last. After three, four hundred years, those pages are deteriorating. The ink is bleeding out. Uh, they just mold and, and and bookworms just take over. There's no way to stop it. I mean, I don't have the technology to stop it. I got one here, Jason. All right. Okay, I have an idea. I know that you said you think that the original building of the wall was after the collapse of the vapor canopy. But what if? It was built during the time of the vapor canopy, and those tunnels were actually a fortress to keep you safe from the big animals Whoa. that lived at that time. <laughs> and, that, and that then, you know, they repurposed it and built on top of it afterwards, because if those are giant, enormous blocks, we don't know the technology that they used for that. But if they were big, giant beings and had advanced technology, I'm just throwing it out there that maybe that was how they protected themselves like using the tunnels and the tunnels came first and then they built the road on top of it it's just we talked about this yeah we did we, did. <laughs> we talked about vapor canopy but i have I, I can agree with your scenario to a limited extent that and what i mean is is it's it's prob it's, it's possible the reason i'm going to say it's improbable is because nowhere in the great wall do we find circular features where it comes all the way back and closes the loop if you're going to if you're going to build a construction to protect against <coughs> megafauna, giant lizards and reptiles, you're going to protect against these these giant insects. Yeah, that was a problem too during the vapor canopy. Then yeah, you would uh you would build a different type of construction, not one that's so wide open and linear because these giant creatures would be on each side. You know, I would I would expect that they would build more in loops so there would be safety inside. Because you still got you still got to have some place to move around. This this is exactly what it looks like. We've been conditioned to think that it was the Great Wall to protect against the Mongols, because that's what we've been told, and we had no reason to think otherwise. But it is exactly how it looks. It's not a wall. It is a road, and it is a road that is elevated very high just to protect against any type of banditry on either side, Mongol or Chinese. Therefore, therefore, whoever initiated this construction had to fight against both just to maintain their deal. I'm pretty sure they probably wouldn't fight it, but there was one, I'm glad you asked that question because you just triggered my mind. There is a fact that Martin and I found that we forgot to mention. In this entire presentation, that's why Q and A are Q and A are great. That's really good. Okay, this is heavy. this is heavy. You got to process this. You have a five thousand mile long fortification. It's built for to be a defensive position on both sides. But uh, there's not one single documented historical battle for which this thing was ever used against the Mongols or the Tartars. Which would tend to indicate big animals or something like that. Third party. Yeah. Aliens. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, the narrative, the narrative is that it is a wall 
to protect yeah. against the Mongols and the Tartars. The problem is, in the entire vast historical record that we can tap into, there's not a single record where the Chinese were ever at war with anybody and the wall was employed in the battles or in the defenses. Never. So it kind of kind of kind of collapses the whole narrative. Oh. <laughs> so, any other questions? Um, I, I just I still can't really understand why the world has worked so hard to maintain this version of events. Is it to basically protect China's pride? Or to hide Greeks' cheeky smack habit. I mean, the Chinese don't want to actually admit that the Romans built that wall. But, but who's still at it? Like, because it's it, the the lie is still at work and still being perpetuated. I'm going. I'm going to let me ask for this. Okay, if you're trying to elicit a response, a certain response, I, I can understand. If you genuinely don't know. What you're proposing for me to answer, it is very difficult. I don't know what your level of awareness is, but I'm going to tell you right now that there's a war going on. And that war is against the Caucasian race. And it's been going on for 150 to 200 years. And there is a culture in this world that hates white people. And they use every other race against them. They create devices. They do all these things. These people rewrite history. They have rewritten religious records. They have put things out that are, they've put narratives out and they have funded them. And there's more I could tell you, but I can't say it on YouTube. But this war ensures that every act of Caucasian genius will be suppressed and be attributed to others. This race here hates basically all white people. And the story is in the Bible, and it's there for everybody to see. But it, too, is like the Great Wall. You were told this was a Chinese wall built to protect the Chinese from the Mongols. You were told it was a wall, but it's actually a road. Same thing in the Old Testament. You've been told certain things in the Old Testament narrative when certain things in that narrative are absolutely true, but the participants aren't who you think they are. It's redacted history. And we're, when we're moving into material that, that I can only talk about on rkx.tv. Exactly what you're saying. I'm trying to fit. I'm trying to fit it into this presentation. Yeah, but that's nope. what I'm saying. That they could use the silk from China and the things that came from China to trade with these people and to actually take their food and their resources. Okay, trade with what people? People in the northern, in the north of uh, Europe, northern European. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to have to admit sometimes I just can't follow. Yeah. But I'm just saying it's the possibility. Well, uh, let me tell you, let me tell you, this is a really sensitive topic for many reasons. First of all, the Chinese have found ancient Sanskrit documents in their own country. They tried to suppress it, different scientists releasing material, now we have it. You can read David Hatcher Childress, read all about it. 
These are, these are Sanskrit Aryan documents that have been found in China. When the Chinese excavate old civilizations in China, they don't find Chinese skeletons. In the Chinese Taklin Mackin Desert, they have found nothing but hundreds of Caucasian skeletons and infrastructure, all kinds of uh, uh, just it's things they don't want to find. All right. This is also the same thing with Japan. The Ainu occupied Japan before the Japanese did. And the Japan, though, readily admit that there was a white race there. Now, this is a sensitive topic because we're, we're, we are led by a, a very liberal academic, acad basically, scholarship has been hijacked. Instead of reporting the truth, they report things that are politically correct. And in, in, in reporting the finds that are politically correct, they try to, uh, they, ba they basically try to attribute everything by geography. And what I mean is, is if we can show that a certain native people have been here for a long time, then everything in that area it was built by those same native people. Because scholarship is against diffusionism. In the 1800s, researchers were all about diffusionism, showing how different cultures went to other nations and built all kinds of great things, and then after a cataclysm or a reset, they went back to their homeland. All right, diffusionism shows that travel was widespread. And way before Columbus discovered America, thousands of years before, the Phoenicians were already had shipping guilds over here that were moving merchandise. And this is why Libyan, Phoenician, Ara Aramaic, ancient Israelite, uh, Big Omri, and then uh, also uh, uh, Carthaginian artifacts have been found all over Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. This, this trade was widespread. But our modern scholarship will say that's an insult to Native Americans to attribute these structures that are found here in North America to anything, to anything that is a non-North you know, North American Indian uh, provenance. So, uh, these are things I will talk about on arcades.tv, and I just on YouTube you can't because uh, the world the world is literally owned and run by the very people who have presented the world to you that you don't even know. Yeah, the, the, it's a uh, it, it, the the deception really runs deep, but the whole story is told in the Old Testament. It's one of the greatest. It's one of the greatest narratives ever. The story is all laid out for you to see. And the participants are there. The Old Testament absolutely explains why our world is the way it is today. Because there was two contracts and these people signed one of them. The rest of the world's under the other contract. We'll go through that on arcades.tv. Mm -hmm. <laughs> President, we had uh, China uh, started the Belt and Road Initiative, working with all the BRICS countries, and this time China has a goal with the rare earths and the manufacturing, and so um, maybe it was a turn. Yeah, oh. Not for not for China, I'm saying against. Listen, dude, I, I don't, don't want to get I don't want to get into geopolitics, uh, modern time stuff. I don't want to really move too far. And so uh, the media, the media is always going to give you a false version of events. The media needs you to believe in boogeymen. You know what I mean? I'm going to tell you now, the Chinese will never invade America. The Chinese are not even fit to invade America. Geographically, we're too far removed. They would never even be able to get that many soldiers over here. It's just, and nor do they have the finances. China, China right now is, is hurting because the one-child policy was implemented for a little too long, and now they know they're about to have a generational gap. And very soon, there is going to be there are about 17 to 18 elderly people for every individual in China that's age one through 30. They're, they got problems. They got problems. So we so. can send them some of our illegal shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, not going to entertain that. <laughs> yeah, I have a video about it on my channel. Yeah, the Orlin the Dutch, Dutch, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, well, like listen, that. listen, the reason the, the, the reason academia doesn't acknowledge that text is the exact reason why they don't acknowledge the book of Jasher. It's the reason they don't acknowledge the Colburn Bible, because the version of events put out by academia 
isn't true, isn't true. The oral end is an original document passed from families, and it's one that just never got purged. The Colburn Bible tells the true story of the Exodus event, not the one that was redacted by these people, where they inserted themselves into a narrative they don't belong, into a culture, and into several books of the Bible for which they didn't write. Another culture, another culture wrote those books. They just put their own names on it. So this is like I say, you're gonna get me in trouble. And I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna avoid these topics in here. Chat the back. Uh, but what you see is at the end of the wall, suggests that they were ships. Oh that, that, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we 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 kind of we kind of breezed over there. Where you where you at, Martin? You up? You up? <laughs> so, so show, yeah. show the picture of, of the Great Wall going into the Yellow Sea. Yeah. Okay, listen, we're still on board with the wall being used for maritime purposes. Yeah, hundreds of tons of cargo a day could have made it to the end of the wall, and ships would have been waiting right there to take it to ports all over the world. Yeah. This is another reason why we understand that the Great Wall was a road. It is the actual Silk Road of ancient times, the famous trade route. Now, this whole Great Wall, Great Wall discovery and road that Martin and I brainstormed, also answers another mystery from centuries ago. Because there's been a battle among historians if Marco Polo's testimony was made up and it wasn't true. A lot of people think he and his uncle were liars, and they never really made it to China. They had made it to ports nearby where they learned about Chinese things, but the things they described weren't really Chinese. But what makes the Marco Polo narrative pretty much collapse <laughs> is that he and his uncle claimed to have gone to China by the Silk Road, but there's not one mention of the Great Wall anywhere. <laughs> and this is only 400 years ago. So... Uh, these discoveries here kind of kind of make you wonder if the whole Marco Polo narrative was just made up. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Phoenician, Venetian after all. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is inexplicable. This this doesn't make sense outside the context of having a long wooden pier come out here for for ships to dock. The same way that we do it today. We build we build wooden piers on quays. It's got to be attached to solid rock. Mm. <laughs> or, or on, or on like, like seawalls. But this right here would make sense to me for shipping. This is just one part of the wall. But there's, just, I mean, a picture is a thousand words. I, I don't have to sit here and talk about this all day. It's obvious that this was for shipping guilds. This, this was for the transit. Like I said, it's the Amazon of the ancient world. So much material is being moved. I truly believe in Rome, I could order something in the next day, have it delivered to me. If you've got merchandise in flu, the amount of time to move it from China all the way across a fortified route, it, it may be stopped at 70 different towers. It doesn't matter because it's not going to go tower to tower. Merchandise is going to be moved. A man can, a man can walk 30 miles in a day. And if you've got if you've got 50 Chinamen in a pack and they're all carrying something on their back and right here they got a harness to carry it, they're going to move a lot of stuff. When you have these 50 man groups in the thousands at the wall at the same time, they'll never be in each other's way ever. Going forward and backwards, filling up ships. They're, so that's a good question. That is a good question. This this right here. That right there is for ships. Yep. There's no doubt. There is absolutely no doubt. So I want to do something. I have been hogging this stage too long. And uh, I would like to dignify my guest, Max Egan, if he would like to come up here and do a QA and himself. We can do it with all you guys. We can all do one together. Okay, I'll have to go with that too. Go ahead, Martin, go get up here. I'm here. Yeah. You don't want to get just me. Right? You're all alone. I'm we, can, we can just sit around and if anyone wants to talk to us, we can talk about it. Yeah. Nice and friendly lunch. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, anyone got any questions? Okay. Yeah. Question to some babies? Okay. Now that we're talking about China, we're wondering about the, the, all the Chinese statues that are frozen. Terracotta Army. So do you think that's a, a thing from capitalism or something? Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's a thing it's attributed to the Emperor Qing, is the first Emperor of China? And they, so they don't need, like, you know, exposed like a small percentage of this, but you know, it, there's a lot of questions. They've had a lot of the eminence removed. You, you know, I've proposed before, did they have more going on? It's weird how every single one's got a different face, to, you know, to replicate yeah. the soldier there. But why you would build a terracotta army, you know, this is like, you know, Egyptian thinking, is it? It's probably for the afterlife, you know? Did these things an animate and come to life? I don't know. But it is a really highly freaky thing. What's going on? I could possibly, you know, outside to be buried in for the afterlife, you know, the yeah, chin. So, so. Yeah. I, I, Jason, this question is for you. I heard you say you heard in one of your videos that uh, there has been multiple incarnations of Inky. Correct me if I'm remembering this wrong, but I could swear I heard you say just in passing that one of his incarnations was as Jesus. Could you speak to that? Please? I don't believe I've ever said that. No? No. Okay. Maybe. No, or, somebody could you speak might, to his different somebody incarnations? Might, somebody though? might have said that, and I, I agreed that it was possible. It was okay. possible. Because I have way too many presentations basically explaining that the story of Jesus is actually the story of Apollonius of Tyana. Apollonius of Tyana was a miracle worker, and he was literally feared for his mouth. Absolute wisdom. I'm telling you, everything he spoke. He was a, he was a, he was a stranger to, to the area, but... The actual, the actual things Jesus said are the things that Apollonius said. This is where the story came from. And when the church built this entire narrative, it, uh, it created two, two figures in the New Testament based off this one individual, Apollonius of Tyana. And Paul. Yes, Apollonius is actually the Greek Paul. It means Paul in Greek. So it's also, it's also the root in Apollo. So, uh, I know I know a lot of my Christian brothers and sisters don't want to hear it, but they but the facts are out. And I have painstakingly documented my sources for everybody to see on my dark scriptures playlist to understand how this magnificent story was born from not only Apollonius of Tyana's life, who's a real person, born in 2 BC, but also from a very spiritual document called the Gospel of Marcion. And how these two were put together, and this is how we got the book of, of Mark, and how Matthew and Luke were based off this book of Mark. They are larger versions of the abbreviated Mark text. And how a fourth gospel was added from the Gnostics. This is why the gospel of John doesn't read anything like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And showing exactly how these accretions occurred until the church was satisfied in 325 A.D. In the, in the Council of Nicaea, they, they ratified basically what the New Testament was after a long discussion about the origin of the Revelation text. So the church invented a myth that in 96 AD, John of Patmos uh, received the Revelation. But the true source, the true source of the, that apocalyptic text is Serenthus, who had collected all the Sibylline oracles that the Roman Senate had used to con consult. The Sibylline Oracles, uh, I have a video all about the history of the Sibylline Oracles and how most of them were lost, and how Tarkin the Proud actually bought the last book, and the Senate preserved it. But the Book of Revelation is of ancient provenance. And I'm not talking about the first couple of chapters, which were obviously written by the church and added to a more ancient text. But the book of Revelation actually has symbols and concepts, iconography that are not identifiable anywhere in the Bible except the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis symbols are, are, are basically only identifiable in one document from the ancient world, and that is the Babylonian Enema Elish, which is the seven, seven stages of creation, which, which the Jewish scribes, reading all that, turned into the first chapter of Genesis, the seven days of creation. But the seven days of creation of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is identical to what the Babylonians wrote in the NMLish text. So the, uh, 
the identity of Jesus, it's a real stumbling block for people to see this material, that, I, that I, all this material that I've documented, but I'm not the only one. I name in the, in the dark scriptures, I name all the books you need, you need to check out and, and research. Don't, don't accept my word for it, but man to man, I'm going to tell you right now that the oversoul does not require that the shedding of blood or anybody to be murdered in the old Bronze Age style of human sacrifice in order to save a population. This is Bronze Age belief that if a disaster is coming, just like Andromeda and Perseus, when the Kraken showed up, the only way to save the city of Argos was to take the daughter of the king, Andromeda, chain her to a rock and give her to the and give her to the storm. This was done in ancient times. They would take a member of the community and sacrifice them because it's called the doctrine of substitution. So any, everything that people were guilty of would be, would be transferred to the scapegoat. Yes, that person would suffer, suffer a sacrificial death. The church took this bloody belief system and tried to turn it into something holy. And they presented it because the Gospel of Marcion has everything Jesus ever said, all his parables, but there's no there's no supernatural occurrences. The Gospel of Marcion is pure spiritual food, but there's no crucifixion, there's no gruesome death, there's no trial, there's no virgin birth, and there's no sun darkening and all that. The Gospel of Marcion was hijacked, and it became the Gospel of the Catholic Church, the Roman Church. They invented all this. But true spiritual beings don't require the death of another avatar for their salvation. It is a ridiculous concept. But it's one that's so well ingrained in us because we've been programmed to believe that BS. And it's just not true. I can't wait to tell my church about it. <laughs> oh, this gentleman took just two seconds. We'll uh, a Phoenix event question. Uh, 17 years, uh, right? 2040 is the Phoenix event. May, May 15, 16. Uh, now, my understanding from listening to your information is that uh, errands may not be affected or that people are going to be moving to Europe from North America. Uh, I'm just kind of curious what type of things can be expected from an errands point of view and also from maybe just a general populist point of view at 2040, May 15, 16. Okay, well, first, <clears throat> we can remove the Phoenix phenomenon, its chronology. We can, we can set all that aside. A true spiritual being is going to know what they need to do when they need to do it. Any preparation is only anxiety is only anxiety based, and anxiety based preparation only brings the thing that is feared into your existence. If you are to do extensive preparations for a, a negative event, then all the situations attached to that negative event will become part of your reality. This is why I opened up this presentation today. And part of my French, but you really have to not give a F about anything, and then the construct will reciprocate. You understand? It's attitude that gets you to vibrate on a different frequency. And this is what puts you out of harm's way and sets on the ball rolling to get you somewhere else. If you're worried about any future event, you thus become a participant. It's as simple as that. Knowing about events objectively, but not having any emotional investment is very important to be aware. But if you're worried about something, I promise you, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer it. It's just the way it, it's just the way it is. You, it doesn't matter if it's the Phoenix phenomenon. It doesn't matter if it's the Nemesis X object. It doesn't matter. My new video is about the dark satellite. It doesn't matter about the return of the dark side. It doesn't matter about the random earthquake. It doesn't matter about a military strike. None of these things matter. It doesn't matter if you're on a train and 90% of the people on that train die. Your informed field governs over your welfare. But if your informed field is vibrating in a fear-based mode, then you're going to suffer what the construct is causing everybody else to suffer. Well, we have many, many stories and incidences of the lone survivor or the couple or the couple that makes it to shore when everybody else on the ship drowned. You understand? These are inexplicable stories. We call them miraculous, but they're not. Those people were vibrating on a different frequency, and they were rewarded for that. Yeah, so I mean, we can remove all the dressing. 
no matter what is negative in your life or, or you perceive to occur in the future, any focus on the negative, remember this is a stage. This is, this is the whole, all the world's a stage. When you immediately become one of the actors on that stage, when you fear that event. So, like I was saying about no stake in the ass I'm for facing infinity without flinching. You know, like if you throw yourself at the wind, you can ride it. It's just the next part of the journey, whatever happens. And if, if there is going to be a cataclysm, people say to me, if there's going to be some whatever, well, there's going to be some big cataclysm, what am I supposed to do? Build a shelter in the backyard? <laughs> exactly. Like if you're supposed to get through something, then you'll be in the right place at the right time to get through it. And it's how you approach that that happens. Okay, we got one over back here. Ladies. Yeah, I just have a quick question on how does this comport with the going gray that you spoke about as far as getting through the reset? Well, going, going gray is just, like I said, being able to prepare for any situation. If it gets to a point where it's all tracked and traced and there's all this digital stuff, you just got to become as unnoticeable as you can. Just fit in and just find a way through to the other side. That's what I mean about going gray. Don't attract attention to yourself. Just get through. Find what works and get through to the other side. I was afraid that's what you meant. <laughs> yeah, so, and to, and to follow up with that just a little bit, so then does that mean, like, not to share our light? And then how does that raise the frequency? No, no, you share your light. You share your light. It's just how you share your light. You know? <laughs> just how you do it. Yeah, I'm a, can I address this too? Can I, hey, can I address this too? Okay. I would, I would, I would like to add, <laughs> listen, I'm, I'm not scared of the future. Yeah. Don't really give a damn, you know, whatever happens. I enjoy the present. I enjoy my life right now. But I have a whole bunch of camping gear, weapons, survival gear. I have, I have everything you can think of. I got all of it in case the need comes for that big black man out there to bug out. I have it all, but, I, but there's no fear in this. I've got the weapons. I also have a huge food pantry where I've stacked up all kinds of things. But my attitude is that I probably won't need it, and I just bought all this stuff for somebody else who's going to end up needing it because I'm going to be in a better place. Listen, you can prepare all, all, all you can prepare all the time. The emotional investment is what you got to watch out for. Yeah. You've got, you've got to pay attention to yourself. If you're buying things and stacking up things out of fear, then I promise you, you're going to need them. But if you're doing it objectively and then moving on with your life and doing other things, you have those things if an emergency happens. And you just might have those things so someone else can enjoy them too. Yeah, that's exactly the way to think about it. Exactly. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Um, have you guys... Oh. Have you seen that the Arc de Triomphe and the other one in New York City are magnetic? Original well, yeah, magnets? Yeah, it looks like an upside down horseshoe. Yeah, but they were magnets. I didn't know if you would. Well, yeah, well, I talked about that years ago. But there's no evidence to actually support it. There's no, you know, I've looked for evidence that they remove any metal from it, the Arc de Triomphe, you know, or, or the Arch Constantine. I can't find it. There was metal removed from the Colosseum in the late 1700s, apparently hundreds of tons of it. So at some stage, the Colosseum would have been full with metal. Which I proposed was some sort of water technology yeah. for magnetizing the water that would have been in there when it was a water tank and not for gladiatorial purposes. <laughs> what I nah. So, um, next on your lovely. I'll do it back to you now, right? Okay. Um, I know that you guys have kids, but Jason, yeah. if you had a kid that was like teenager years, how would you even try to explain something like this? I mean, kids are so brainwashed by school it was hard for me to get my daughter to even believe she didn't have to wear a mask and to try to tell her something like or prepare her for something like this you know because we're not gonna be around forever but our kids will be around hopefully. rescue them keep them away from school yeah. Yeah. close the television down keep them away from games all of that negative intense stuff you know when they got any chance for the future that's the only way to go to the television and you're that program, and it's only coming from the mainstream anyway, which is what she's brainwashed by. You know, a lot of people got the same problem with their family members. It's just yeah. like, you know, they're so dense, we love them to bits. But it's just, well, yeah. But I, I definitely would think that you should, you know, it's, it's, it's your daughter still, she's only that age, you've got to say something just yet. Yeah, I would definitely make sure I would get, I, I wouldn't kick, I would give shit at this stage, who's kicking and screaming. You know what you tell you, I'm going to sledgehammer it up, let them suffer. This is tough luck because later on she's going to thank you for it. Okay. Thank 
Okay. Like so, something. Well, that's just brainwashing. Just make it aware that they're telling you know that they are that this is a control mechanism and that it, it is to brainwash. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add to it too. Cool. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna tell you that you've asked me a very difficult question. You yeah. have. When it taps into something that is so simple and is very hard to grasp, it's so simple that it's hard to grasp. It's hard to take in, and that is the oversoul knows its own. And everybody is going to be called when they're ready to be called, and you can't force it. And it's hard because we love, we have loved ones, and we want them to see one. But let me tell you something: you can't tell them the truth. You have to show them. On my channel, I'm always saying that. And guys, look, I'm going to show you some things. I can't tell you about it. You just got to see it for yourself. And I show them the arithmetic, how these, all these patterns and cycles and epicycles all fit together. And I explain to you, this is a construct. There's no way these historical events unfolded this way, but here's all the source materials. This is what happened. I do this all the time on my channel. But you have to see it that way, that the oversoul knows its own. And it's going to call them when they're ready to be called. Because if they're not ready right now, they're basically the prodigal son. And the prodigal son story always has a happy ending every time. Okay, let me. Do you have a question? Yeah? Yes, I have a question about the arts uh, acting, writing, singing, dancing, painting. I feel like they do play a role in this whole journey. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about, like how art or the act of creating, besides just creating your life and manifesting your life, but I find that every time I see adults or children engage in some creative act, something happens, opens, the doors open, you know, like with the teenager. I can, I can answer that. I'd love to. There are two types of art. The art that is aesthetic, that people can enjoy, that has value, that people can appreciate according to their values, and there's the art that is actually disguised ritual. And this is what you see in Hollywood, in commercials, and in, in radio. This is what you hear in radio. Yes, much of, much of the incantations and rituals used against the public is actually masked in art. Olympic uh, concerts, all these things like all these things like this. What you're talking, really talking about aesthetics, the, the, the appreciation of beauty. You know, and I agree. I believe it's spiritual. I believe I, I believe that aesthetics itself, an appreciation for for uh, art of human origin and art in nature, is entirely spiritual. I just wanted to say how that that is exactly my experience. I escaped from Hollywood, and I see that art and artists have been used always to get you know messages across. And I always feel like why we can also use art you know, to, to share without hitting people over the head, you know, without telling them, you have to believe this, but just to share our creations, I guess. I don't know, I keep looking for a way to integrate my passion, which is, you know, all the, all the arts into this movement, whatever this is, the truthers or whatever. Uh, but I always feel like there's a, there's a vitality and a humanity that comes in in, in art itself, as opposed to just sharing information. And you are, you're an artist, the way you tell stories. You're a storyteller artist. So I don't know, I'm just putting this out to anybody here who is an artist to recognize that there's great um, gifts that we have to offer. And you know, you're not doing anything wrong. And to add to that, in the comment, in the chat on YouTube right now, somebody just said the women are asking the most fascinating questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, with the arts, you know, if, if we weren't giving them all of our energy, yeah, we would have more time to do things that we wanted to, so that would be embrace what your consciousness likes, if it is art or, you know, whatever, dance and stuff, whatever it is, that's what we should be embracing instead of giving all our energy away to the system. We have to close. Yes, we do. We're at time up, guys. I want to thank everybody so much for coming up to 7 o'clock. Fantastic day! Wow! Look! Look! Yes. Troopers! Yes. Yes. There we go! Yay! Photo up! Yay! Everybody loved y'all! Look at them go! Thank you so much!
There we go. <laughs> I have Martin so the Come on. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. How are you? Wait, <laughs> Hey guys, just so you know, I did. I got one announcement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, just so you know, Soul Lugman has has organized Eric's events. Uh, I'm wearing the T-shirt, so are some others. I just want to let you know, it's it's actually an online meetup. And it's going to have like 12 different speakers on there. It's going to be all presented online. September what? Okay. September 22nd and September 23rd, Aaron Fest is going to involve a lot of speakers. And it's and it's going to be this right here, but it's basically online. Justin, Justin, stop touring. 